everybody, and welcome to the deepest dive on God of War Ragnarok Part 3, the grand finale. Min-Max is a place about games, friends are getting better, and don't be confused or alarmed, but this is truly the best, most thorough discussion about God of War Ragnarok on the internet. My name is Ben Hansen. I'm joined by Jill Grote from the Indian Former. Fun. Welcome, joined by Serial Vasquez, the YouTube essayist. Hello. And then Kyle Bossman, the YouTube... Comedian. <laughs> I don't know. No, also, no. Also, also, what do you call Please it? Please be more condescending. What do you call it? What do you call it? <laughs> Little uh, cool, good, funny, shorter videos. What do you call that, Kyle? It's tough. I don't. I wouldn't know what to call it either. Okay, delayed input. It's very good. Check it out on YouTube, everybody. There's links below for all this fun stuff. Uh, this is the grand finale of our huge community game club, all about God of War Ragnarok. In this discussion, we're covering everything in the game, from basically when you get the spear, more or less. Uh, so I guess spoilers right there, sorry. Uh, up through the ending of the game, post-game, everything else in the game. So if you have not finished the game and you don't want spoilers, please leave now or forever hold your peace because we are going to be diving in deep. Uh, thank you to everybody who has played along with us for the deepest dive. Uh, people who went to patreon.com slash minmax with two ends. Again, there's links below for all this fun stuff. Who went there and supported us at any tier whatsoever. They were submitting comments along the way, playing with us. And people who supported minmax on Patreon at the $5 tier unlocked the podcast version of this whole discussion. And you can still do that by going to patreon.com slash minmax with two ends. Or, you know what? If you enjoyed this discussion, you said, hey, I appreciate that this is happening. You could jump in even at that two dollar tier as a token of your appreciation we would certainly appreciate the support and it's nice to know that people out there uh, want more of this thorough game club format so we appreciate everybody for joining us along this big ride um okay we had hundreds and hundreds of comments over on patreon submitted over there in the comment section on patreon about the final third of god of war ragnarok uh, and it's time to play of course most common comment most common comment. What did the most amount of people write in about for the final third of God of Ragnarok? Jill, you have a light in your eyes that's implying you know exactly what the most common comment is. The, the most common comment is going to be something like, you guys were so wrong. <laughs> Everyone oh. on the panel is Everyone dumb. writes in. Okay, interesting. Like you guys just absolutely did not get it correct. You um, suck at video games. You shouldn't mm -hmm. even do the third part. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, we had very, very few of those. That's for the YouTube comments, not for the Patreon comments. Yeah, it's a yeah, different yeah. field okay. entirely. Yeah. Serial, what do you think is the most common comment? Uh, I think the most common comment is going to be something to the effect of, did you know that O.G. Simpson starred in The Naked <laughs> Gun 33 and a third three months before the White Bronco chase, during which he was actually heard saying, uh, death can have me when it earns me. I actually, we had several people say that that quote is from O.J. Simpson <laughs> directly, um, but it wasn't the most common comment. Although Nick Olson did write in saying, hey, I just wanted to report that after watching through Naked Gun for the first time, Ben's reference from last week does indeed make sense. That doesn't say it's good, <laughs> but at least it makes a vague amount of sense. I uh, wish they wouldn't enable you like that. That makes me so upset. Welcome to the Patreon lifestyle. I don't know, people are saying I'm good. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, you think the video, the, the view count would increase or decrease if you wrote in deepest dive on God of War slash O.J. Simpson? <laughs> That's a great question. Is O.J. Simpson in the thumbnail? I mean, whatever you, whatever you want. I think okay. whatever you, I think you should want to raise the number of clicks, right? So do you think, do you think you would want to do that? I think it would increase it. Kyle, what do you think? <laughs> most common comment. I know the most common comments yeah. are about uh hypothesizing where the franchise goes forward interesting now there are about three or four of those oh, wow. not as many as you okay. think uh most common comment i was surprised with this for a while it was like hey did you know you can find the real tier and, and we'll talk about all this stuff um then for a while people were like this crater i can't wrap my mind around this crater but slowly creeping up the most comment slowly became people talking about sindri and sindri's turn specifically uh, that really made an impact. Huh? It really hit a lot of people. I think it's kind okay. of the, the juiciest thing to unpack in this section, which was surprising. But it's like, you know what? It is it is maybe the boldest thing this game does in the final third, I think. And so it, I think it, it struck a chord for that reason. So we'll unpack all this fun stuff. Uh, full disclosure, all this uh, fun stuff as well is uh, my code is provided by Sony. 
Um, Sony tried to keep everybody else from getting a code, uh, just for the full disclosure system here, but they fought through it. They, they succeeded. somehow found a copy. Yeah, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> um, all right, final third of God of Ragnarok. Man, where do you, where do you start, Kyle? Uh, where, where do you go from here, man? Uh, so my, my big picture overall thought yes. when I was just like driving around today with thinking about this game is how impressed I am that God of War as a franchise has so many interesting characters now as opposed yes. to one, two games ago. That is a very good point. And thinking about the future, we're excited to be like, I want to see Throod age. I want to see Anger Boda age. Yep. There's all these lingering characters. What does that afford them? What does that afford them? What does that afford them? I mean, like, does that just mean future games will have more cameos? Or are you more excited about the idea of, like, what if we're playing through it in some DLC or something like that? That's what, that's what is so interesting. Go, okay, like, coming in, I don't know if we really talked about this, but I feel like uh, they said that this is the end of the Norse mythology for us. Right. So I think that's why I was expecting everything to end so badly. But obviously, there's, there's a future for all of these characters. Yeah, yeah. And then, I, so yeah, when you say, well, how, what does that afford them? It's I mean, I, we could play DLC. We could play three different games from the same characters and love them each. Yeah, it's it's pretty exciting. And we technically can stay in this area. Yeah, I think um, as this section was going on, um, and especially once I unlocked the, the crater area in Vanaheim, it's like, there's too much to do here. We're going to have some real post-game content. Therefore, Kaya, or, yeah, Kratos isn't dying. Um, and then, I don't want to point fingers at anybody but then like one kyle hilliard dear friend of the show in a slack channel he's like by the way uh post game remember to go check out this spot here pointing us towards like the real tier in the prison type of thing and it's not his fault but there was a part of me that's like well if there's for sure a post game which i didn't know until i saw that then it's like now i know that kratos isn't going down and now i feel kind of embarrassed for i think how dark I, I I was rooting for Kratos to go down. I thought it'd be a more interesting ending, and it yeah. wasn't as quite as dark as Kyle thought, where he thought that everybody was just going to slit their does. throats together, and then it was going to fade <laughs> to black, and that was going to be the end of God of War Ragnarok. Yeah, uh, Jill, what would you think about the the final third here? Yeah, I, I, interested in what you said earlier. Like the Sindri thing is really the boldest choice in the third act. Um, I really would have loved to have seen Kratos die. Not that I don't love Kratos. Kratos is lovely, but um, I, I don't know what they're going to do with him in the future. Yeah. So I guess I can be optimistic about that because obviously with what we saw, like he's going on to become a god that people love and worship. And so he has to like, has he done enough in this game? I don't think so. So his next adventure has to be building that up. I guess the like worship of Kratos. Yeah. And just kind of getting his groove back i guess i feel like so much in this age game. of mythology-esque uh oh. symbol that replays kratos oh don't tempt me god i was like they're, they're re-releasing age of mythology and it's like at this point just call it like god of war wars <laughs> just rename it completely because i feel like i haven't brought it up but age of mythology is one of my favorite games of all time and so much oh. stuff in this game in particular like has just brought me back to that like the reason i call jotunheim jotunheims because i've been calling that map jotunheim since 2003 or whatever the hell with that game and iron her jar like all that stuff is in that game so if you enjoy mythology you enjoy you got a war please check out age of mythology especially if you enjoy rts games because there's some good satisfying stuff that's right mythology. don't forget about it um Kai, uh, Suriel, what'd you think? Final big chunk. Yeah, I'm kind of uh, on, on like the subject of like what is bold for this game. I feel yeah. like I'm torn on like, I think this entry stuff is like super interesting, but I almost feel like I'm, I'm torn on whether or not killing Kratos is bold or not, because on some level you see it as like, a well, we can't kill our main character. Yeah. But I think because everyone's expectation, well, not everyone's, but like there was a big expectation that there was going to be a very definitive end of the world or that like there was going to be like a major downturn, I think, with it, with the name being Ragnarok. I think it's kind of interesting that they went this direction. And I think like the more I think about it, the more I think it's appropriate for this story to end the way it did versus like, oh, you know, this is Kratos' big finale, so he has to go. Because I think there, you know, like there's the kind of common... Um, complaint that like I think death can be kind of cheap if you say like well this character's story ended by them dying right um, but I think that there is something more interesting in like keeping Kratos alive which I think speaks to his arc in this game um, but I think I, I think I side with the idea that 
the way they went, as much as it kind of fits into the like, oh, now we can have a post game. Now we can continue Kratos' story. Yeah. I think that's that it becomes very convenient. But in the context of the story, I think it's more interesting for Kratos to actually live. Because he has a chance to do what? Because it, I feel like the the arc of his character is that like, you know, I'm ready to die of like, right. oh, yeah. And, and in a way, it is kind of like giving up on like, well, I have a child. I'm going to you know make sure that they they get out. But like, I'm done. It's over. It's like it's over for me. I, I, I've i lost my wife. I, I'm going to raise my child and I'm going to go in peace. And then like I am done living. Right. And I think the game kind of says like there's no, really no point in giving up on life at any point and saying like, hey, you should you should build something of your out of your life while you can. And like, you know, part of it is like opening up to people and trying to expand your world, your horizons as a person for as long as possible and not just say like, I'm done. It's over. Like I'm, I'm disconnecting yeah. from the world. It's over. Uh, and I think that is his biggest like character growth. So it feels more appropriate for Kratos to say like, I'm going to continue living for as long as I can versus like, yeah, this is, I'm going to have my noble death and that's going to be the end for me. Right. Yeah. It is an interesting, weird spot of like, okay, if he kind of builds up that general leader vibe again, he can kind of have his, confidence back in this new era moving forward because i feel like so much of this game first game was him learning to love and so much of this game is him just being a big old softy <laughs> but then realizing like you know what maybe i can live for kratos again but where that path leads in the future i mean it's like would he start a new family with freya I feel like this game doesn't want to pick a lane there. Maybe they want to see how the reception is and kind of leave it in an ambiguous way of, you know, when they sensually pass the Mimir head back and forth to each other at the end there. It's like, okay, there's there's a little something there. Not quite enough to be a slam dunk, but do you think they'd go in that direction, Kyle, of that him and Freya would start a family? How is it? Hold on. How is it yeah. sensual? <clears throat> Go back. We Look all knew off the a bobbling the head. A bobbling yeah. human head. There, there are sparks flying with that head transition. <laughs> if you go back and look at that scene, it's not just like, here you go, here's a head. Like, they're looking out over the world, and, like, their hands, like, kind of graze they're over lingering. each other. Yep. Oh, yeah. it's it's hot. It's one of the hottest scenes I've ever seen in a video game. That's I would his even, best friend. That's his best friend. I don't know how friend, they cut though. it in. I, I guess well, you could read so that sexy, as, though. like romantic but it's almost like the it's almost like this weird idea of like them both coming to realize that like oh yeah retirement might be interesting versus like the end right because there are both people who have lost their uh, like well who have lost children and have been like in this position of like i am after this one thing and after that's over after yeah. i've gotten my revenge i'm done right and then like them kind of looking out into the world and saying like oh there's 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 hope for me yet or like there's there's there is hope in the world uh and that that's they're both kind of almost ping-ponging that hope back and forth between each other by saying like yeah maybe maybe we can make something out of this and i don't know that it's like now we're now we're husband and like retired husband and wife right and then like we sent our kids off to college and now we're gonna go like you know gallivant all over the world you know uh, doing various tasks in uh now that we no longer have to have our revenge um but I don't know that I would explicitly read it as like them falling in love with each other. I don't think it's that far. I, I think it is the developers talked. I imagine they had that conversation of like, what state are they in? Is this going to be a thing? Are they a couple? Is the internet going to ship them? And they're like, let's let's wait and see. We've got years and years and years to figure that out. And we could go either direction. Because I think, I think the world would be happy to see them kiss. And I think a larger percentage of the world, though, is kind of happy with that kind of professional friends relationship that they have. Just lethal friends <laughs> however you want to phrase that i uh, mean a plutonic french of like them not necessarily having to be romantic that's what it is yeah, yeah. Uh, i would love for them to remain platonic but like they're both retiring and they don't have a lot else to do mm -mm. it's so... it's like you hear about those old folks homes it's just bone city yeah. there they're just all over the place that's right nick from atlanta writes in on patreon they say i love freya and Kratos' relationship in the game especially the conversation before the initial credits he glances down at mimir slightly but when he asks would you join me it's a question for her and their eyes are locked she recognizes this and gives a small smile we'll see to it together nick says i'm telling you now they're gonna have a kid by the time the next game rolls around i i don't think another kid can be doable for kratos how many generations of children can he really have i mean i want to see it i want to see what like just a, I guess it would just be the full blown god kid. No, no half god coming out at this point. That'd be that'd be interesting to see, and maybe be like somebody else from Earth mythology we hadn't factored in yet, or something like that. But I don't think it's gonna happen. I also, I mean, I I would even, I don't know that I need another God of War game after this because it feels like mm. this these characters. I feel like they're 
it feels like they did a really good job of closing everyone's arc in that like yeah i mean the, it'd be nice to like hear all these ways that it could continue but i feel like they do a pretty decent job of saying of having this be an end point for the franchise if if they want it to be i all i'm all, i don't know which what would be my like best outcome for like another god of war game i feel the opposite though mm-hmm. i feel like yeah. this is this is a setup for like five different arcs mm-hmm. like you think loki's arc is concluded I feel like you could see it like in the way that like, yeah, the people's stories don't necessarily end. Uh, but like, I feel like I think if we never got another God of War game, I would be OK with it. But we are hmm. totally getting one. I can't imagine right. we don't. Yeah. So um, listening to a bunch of interviews with Eric Williams, did a bunch of kind of spoiler cast discussions with, let's see, kind of funny and IGN and GameSpot. Um, but wh- he said that. There were three things that when uh, Corey handed him the reins to be director for this game, there were three things that he demanded happen. One of them was Ragnarok has to happen, which seems to make sense. And one of them was Brock has to die. And the reasoning for that was, well, because he's the family dog and he has to die for the big uh, dramatic twist here. And then the third thing that Corey stressed needed to happen for this game was that Atreus needs to leave by himself at the end, which is a really odd beat to get that important of a role of like one of the three key things but that leads me to believe that maybe whatever Corey's working on now as director within uh santa monica or some other project within santa monica is going to be atreus in the future and they kind of wanted to get the ball rolling on that i mean that makes sense to me yeah but, i can yeah, see I that i don't know if he's working on that because he kind of seems like he stepped away pretty publicly but um well, I think there's definitely a Loki story coming up. There's no way we're not going to get a you are now playing as Loki. Loki's doing stuff. I don't know what Kratos is going to be doing just besides setting up being a god and being nice to people. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you say, uh, Corey uh, Barlog, the original game director for well, God of War 2 and then God of War 2018, that he kind of stepped away. I'm really confused by this. And maybe this is just reading the tea leaves and whatnot, but it is interesting that, like, the first big message we had about this game, and one of the first ones was them coming out in a Sony state of play and Corey Barlog being like, I'm stepping back. I'm handing the reins of game director over to Eric Williams. Please take it and run with it. It's all yours, baby. Um, and his title there for Corey was studio creative director. I was like, okay, that seems pretty hands-off. And in interviews, Eric has kind of made it seem like, yeah, Corey would check in every once in a while, but overall, he was pretty hands-off. But then it's interesting, like, the game opened, and I think it's, like, one of, if not the first credit you see, just as creative director, Corey, Corey Barlog. Barlog. Yeah, mm-hmm. I was like, that's yeah. really interesting. It's To put the creative director in there, not studio creative director, but very specifically creative director for this game, which that varies for creative director to director and game director, like, how that shakes up and shifts out for every different studio in the world and it's all over the place but this struck me as more prominent than i would have thought based on that early messaging well it's so it's kind of in like tv right if you direct a pilot of a tv series yeah it's basically you're you're like credited by, for yeah series yeah you know what i mean and like mm-hmm. he kind of does this obviously uses so much of his work from god of war 2018 that like it kind of makes sense creative director as a title so i do i do wonder what his input was but yeah i find that interesting yeah and i wonder mm-hmm. yeah did he veer more away from the project as time went on or was he kind of brought in towards the end to start buttoning up some things like, i don't know i'd love to talk to him to figure it out um, but i do feel like the hints he's dropped along with what jill's saying i think like he's not doing anything god of war themed at all right now mm-hmm. really i he had yeah. a tweet and i know this is playstation's worst nightmare but he had a tweet a while ago that was just ambiguous about something uh, something along the lines of just <laughs> this is this is why the internet's a dangerous place. But he tweeted something like, "Deepest dive." Uh, yeah, you're right. He, he tweeted something like, "I love working in the God of War universe." Something ambiguous like that, and that was maybe a year and a half ago, two years ago, or something. So even then, it was like, "Okay, is this going to be some spinoff like title that technically is in the same universe, but allows him the flexibility to strike it on some new ground and try something new?" That seems likely, and maybe that could be an open world Atreus game or whatever the hell he would want to do, you know? I think more uh, kind of direct tweets from him have been kind of hints at like sci-fi or space or whatever that project is. So I'm very interested to see whatever that, well, there is whatever is happening there. Well, there was that project that was um, canceled that led to, Oh, did it get canceled? Yeah. Well, it was the PS4 game. Like after Ascension, they were working on a sci-fi game. Um, And then that got canceled. More recently than that. Oh, really? There were rumors about him? 
Yeah, he was tweeting stuff that kind of made me think like, oh, he's doing something. Hmm. Interesting. We'll find out. Um, but Alan, oh, cool. I got a I got a trailer pitch. Yeah. Hit me. All right. So there's a long line at Starbucks. Oh, yeah. I'm ready. Okay? Yeah. There's a long line at Starbucks. Right. <laughs> and um, these two people are just chatting it up. And this one guy seems really interesting. And they say, what's the name for the order? And he turns to the camera and he says, Loki. <laughs> I love it. I mean, it's like, oh, he's in modern day. I do like that. I do he like that. He steps out and he's in space. Hon- Dude, honestly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I meant to try to find out the Starbucks is in space. That's <laughs> I'm so yeah. You three yeah. thought you had to then. Game. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, I think uh, during the rapid fire interview we did while well, visiting the studio years ago, uh, Joe Juba asked Corey in that rapid fire interview, like, would we ever see a modern day God of War where money is our God? And I think Corey said, stay tuned. So, I mean, it's all right there, baby. Uh, but Those Alan- are really good, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Game Informer is still doing interview. them. Those are so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. They're still doing them. It's fun to see. Um, Alan Dellinger writes in and says, At this point, narratively, I really feel like I want Kratos to have peace. I'm assuming the studio will find some excuse for Kratos to battle some other pantheon of gods. I don't think they can do that with Kratos. I don't think they can send him to another pantheon to eventually have it built up to him killing. You think Kyle is going there? I think kind of one of the lessons of this game is that, like, hey, sometimes... Sometimes violence is necessary. Kratos, you're too valuable as a general. Hmm. Yeah, that, that is a difficult needle to thread because yeah. it's also simple for the like. It's also easy for them to like. It'd be difficult to them for them to contextualize that without it being a bit of a regression of like, uh, or or like a how's the same happened to the same guy thrice kind of thing of like I'm back yeah. to like killing gods again after having grown as a person. I guess like for them to find another justification for like him you know going in and killing a bunch of like i don't know shinto gods or something uh i think would be would be weird i, almost <laughs> I feel just like, don't like, like if, these ones yeah like i almost feel like atreus is a more fitting person to do that because he's already yep. across pantheon god basically right so at this point it would if if there is another threat like loki wants to you know separate himself from his father and like kind of be his own person and i feel like hey exploring another pantheon where something just happens to happen where he has to kill a bunch of gods feels like the mo- like the the easiest way to transition into a new pantheon i think i think it's going to be who knows if it's going to be like an atreus game it's it's set up beautifully for that but also i could see like the starting of the next series of games or the next game just be some message gets carried back to freya and best bud kratos as they're living in their little cabin together and the message is loki's in trouble And then they go out on the journey to try and find what's wrong with Loki. And he's probably kidnapped by some other pantheon. And then that's kind of the motivator to at least interact with other gods. I don't know if it's as simple as going Mm -hmm. up and and killing all of them. But that seems logical to me. Is like, all right, you want a MacGuffin in your game. How about rescuing Loki? He's discovered something wild. And now he's been kidnapped. Something like that seems likely. Uh, Kelton Knighton says, I can't wait to see Atreus' journey of going to different pantheons in search of the missing giants. Um, so that is that is what he is up to. And there's a lot of hints about, like, I think the giants are overseas. Um, and Kratos even says, like, if you want to go sailing, make sure you have a destination in mind. But wink, wink, <laughs> I think you're going to do some sailing in the future, Atreus. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I need to go back, I think, and scrub through those clips again. But Jill, did you, do you remember any details or any other hints of, like, where the giants might be, just the fact that they're alive somewhere is all we really know, yeah. right? Like, I need to go back and scrub through that one scene where they see the, uh, the kind of ending. Uh, was it their mom's shrine? Yeah. I think it was. Well, it was, um, well no, it's Loki's shrine specifically, but the, uh, she okay. destroyed it so that they wouldn't know their fate was the idea. But I do know from the first game, the Tear Shrine had four different, and one was... Uh, the Greek pantheon, which I don't think we're going back there. No. Um, That'd be cool. One was, I think, Shinto. Uh, we had a Celtic symbol, and then we had the Norse mythology. So, uh, like, Ireland across the sea is not that far. Right. I'd be super down for a Celtic mythology romp. If it's the first uh, place But that might yeah. just be, like, me wishful thinking, because that's what I want. But, uh... Yeah, you know, it could it, be Japan. Like, people would freak out about that. Yeah, I know Egypt is, you know, they were oh, thinking yeah, about Egypt going to, to Egypt for, for this 
trilogy or this series, this era, um, and decided to go for Norse stuff instead. But the fact that they're emphasizing sailing and how he wants to sail and the giant sailed away, is it too simplistic to actually think like geographically? It might be a, it might be a little, I feel like that line is more about like, it's going to be somewhere far away versus right. like sailing will be a key component of the story. Well, like, not, you know, not even be, that. It'll, it'll, but I think or that the, idea of like a major role, right? Like that, that the sailing has to be thematically tied versus like it just being a distant thing. Yeah, I think it's more so than like, OK, well, they it'd be a little sailing, but they could kind of walk to Egypt, I guess, if they really wanted to here. Whereas like, is that implying that this would be something like going to the Americas or someplace that you conceivably couldn't walk to in this era? But again, that's that's really in the weeds. Um, although Michael uh, Barubi writes in and says, did any of you find the artifacts from distant lands? It gave some interesting insight into where the series might go next. Mamir mentions that he would really like to explore the Mayan culture if given the chance. I hope they go this route instead of the popular choice of Egypt. Egypt's recently gotten some love with Moon Knight and Assassin's Creed Origins, but I can't think of any major franchise that has explored Mesoamerican myths. I mean, yeah. I'm not to, well, it was in the trailers. It's like Wakanda Forever recently did this. Yeah. Uh, where that was part of that storyline. But yeah, I, I think there have been scant few games that explore that part of the world, like even that even that entire continent's, uh, our entire continent's uh, history. So that that would be super interesting to see. Yeah. Um, would you think they'd be so bold? As, I mean, they put in that Mayan, was it like, I think it was a piece of pottery or something in the game that um, Mamir is talking about in this game, but it's like, that's, that's too direct of a line almost for me. When that was in the game, it's like, okay, well, it can't be. They just... It's probably coming from, from a sincere place of the developers being like, yeah, it'd be really cool to explore that. I don't know if we want to bank a decade of our lives on it, but it'd be cool. I mean, you you, you're looking at a decade of your life for whatever, right? So it's like yeah. a matter of like, what, what, do, what does the studio want to do most? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any possibility of like continent hopping? Like pantheon hopping. Yeah. If it is just like the the multiverse of different yes. pantheons where it's like Loki somehow you figures out the mask and then yep. like uses that as a way to like, oh, I need to save the world from some threat that is threatening all of the pantheons, right? right. And I, I think that, that. that that would fit a little bit more fitting for like if they were call it to call it like God of War Loki or Loki colon God of War or something like that. That's a, it's an interesting idea because like twenty eighteen God of War, right? Yeah. You were you barely meet anyone important. And then in its sequel, you expect this to be like a trilogy because of how restrained God of War 2018 is. You know, it's yeah. like you barely met anyone. Like there's so much there's so much left to explore. And then Ragnarok's just like, here's everybody. And so if we're following this crazy pattern, yeah, I could see where like they feel like they have to just really bombard us with everything in the next few games or whatever. Yeah, I could see it. And I feel like, you know, culturally is leading that way. You get a bunch of great trailers from it of teasing like and now i'm here too and i'm here too it feels about right but maybe it's like we could not be more seeped in kind of the multiverse storytelling at this point so maybe things will cool off five years from now i'd uh, appreciate something more scaled back but i can see it yeah 100 you went straight to marketing right just yeah. the idea that we need more and more and more is the scary idea god speaking of scary ideas and marketing um mm -hmm. sony's huge you never know what's really going on in that company but i thought it was interesting that um Eric Williams in some of the spoiler cast was talking about like early meetings that he had at the very start of the game with like PR and marketing within Sony. And this is the stuff that I really love, like diving into this weeds. Yeah, but, that's crazy. Um, but did you hear those spoiler casts by chance, Kyle? No. Okay, great. So great. Then I can just lie. No. But what he says is he's talked about like how some of the early questions that PR is asking him was just like, if you had to sum up the game you want to make in three films, how would you summarize it? Just so we have like some ballpark of where to start for messaging this thing. And, um, oh gosh, let me see if I can find, uh, he only Star mentioned- Star Wars, Starship Troopers. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, no, he mentioned uh, only one, but it was a big inspiration for uh, Odin, which was Bronx Tale. But the day of like this kid being torn between, you know, two different kind of father figures and kind of doing cool jobs on the side and stuff. Uh, but he said that Bronx Tale was like a key messaging for early on. So PR had to be like, OK, Bronx Tale for Odin storyline. Got it. But I just love the idea of Sony PR and marketing sitting down with these developers that early just to try and get some ballpark. And maybe that's a new practice of the what I hate. The idea of is the way to communicate with the PR people is to talk to them about movies. Yep. As no. opposed to video games. Video games. Yeah. 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 It makes sense. They're more likely to be like, all right, have you finished Symphony of the Night? Okay, no. Have you ever seen Bronx Tale? Maybe there's slightly <laughs> higher odds for Bronx Tale. Although I, I've never seen Bronx Tale. I feel bad. I need to go back and watch it now. 
Um, but Roel writes in and says, Originally, Santa Monica was leaning towards making a trilogy until at the start of Ragnarok's development, they decided to wrap it all up in a single game instead. Talking about this in an interview, Eric Williams, the game's director, stated that in terms of story, nothing was scaled back, only readjusted and reconfigured for pacing. Knowing that, what do you think that a trilogy might have looked like? At what point in this story might the cut between the two games have happened, do you think, if this would have been a trilogy for the Norse myths? I feel like the the murder of Heimdall, I think, is a pretty good cutoff point where, right. Heim, like, I mean, and then you don't call, I mean, you call the last one Ragnarok, and then yep. there's like, this would be the in-between game where it's like, okay, well, like, we've killed Heimdall, that's the, that's the kind of like the last thing that needed to happen for, like, the prophecy to come true or whatever, and then, like, maybe the second game starts, or the third game starts with, like, hey, we should go recruit a couple more people like Surtur. I think it'd be yeah. exactly that. Yeah, I think it's Kratos being like, now it's time for war. Credits. And then the third game is all recruiting the different realms, I think would be the dividing line. I was afraid that's where we were going uh, as soon as they're like, yeah, we need to get all these people involved. And there are seven gates or nine gates and seven of them we need to go through. I'm like, oh, no, I have to go through seven more worlds and I have to get this all done. Um, So, yeah, I think that's probably where they would have expanded. Would that have been fun to anyone? Yeah, Yeah, I think 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 this is the right call. Would have been a yeah. little bit too Triforce questy of like I'm sure like I don't think they would have you know devoted the the amount of time that they would have needed for like those things for like going and recruiting those things to be as impactful of like let's get these people on our side and I think the game is already like fairly large so I I, I think that that at that point then you split it up into a, that becomes its own whole game basically mm-hmm. yeah uh, should we start walking through this section chronologically it, roughly yeah. uh, okay so this section really starts with going back to Sindri's house um, and then there's a nice moment with Mimir speaking for the audience I think of just Kratos just like walking off to his room and Mimir being like hey what's what's our plan are we just gonna walk blindly into Ragnarok or what exactly is going on here and then there's a good shot of Kratos just like looking at Mimir and then just closing the door without saying anything and then he takes off all of his chains and all that fun stuff um, and then goes like to he sleep. doesn't look he doesn't look? Right. He doesn't look at Mimir, you mean? Right, 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 right. He just closes it's, 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 it. It's a, he stops. He stops as though he would look around, mm. I think is what was kind of cool about that. He does not even turn around to answer his question. Ah, gotcha. There we go. Yeah. Um, and then he goes down to sleep, and then we get another uh, dream sequence, because they, they can't get enough of these, of bringing us back to, to Faye. And this is where you kind of see Atreus as a little baby boy in the boat, and she's stunned by like, oh, the big god of war, you're too scared to even interact with your son. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I'm not scared. I really liked that because I wondered, because um, when he was going to sleep, he just sort of like tosses the blades, doesn't care a single bit about them. But when it comes time to get rid of the axe, he like picks it up and he sort of like looks at it oh, and puts it down. I'm like, is he kind of summoning Faye? Like, is that what he's really trying to do? Is like, I need some guidance. Please come to me sort of thing before he sits down and he's just sort of relieved to see her there. Well, yeah, I, I, I think you're right. Even like, I think before the second dream sequence where we see Faye right before the Ragnarok battle in this section as well, like he's looking at the bag of ashes. It's like he needs his little charm as he falls asleep to kind of launch him into the, the Faye dreams. Mm-hmm. And I really like the ambiguity of is it her with some sort of magic coming in and like guiding him or is it his mind really needs guidance and guidance to him is his wife and that's where he goes to like it's this real ambiguous sort of uh back and forth for yeah him. like in the same way that atreus has that section where he's like i'm gonna pretend to be kratos and talk to myself in what i think my father would say right There's mm-hmm. almost a similar like mirroring of i'm gonna basically have this fantasy where i have where i talk to myself when and one character is like what i think my wife would say well i, I feel like that ambiguity was very there for the first vision where she actually touched his head and was like, we've got a lot of work, to, we got a lot of work to do, whatever she says for the for final thing. But I feel yeah. like it kind of trailed off for the later dream sequences. I was kind of expecting more of that direct discussion, but it feels like it was more clearly visions of the past. Yeah, where he's remembering things, which I think actually is interesting because they 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 touch on the idea that like you know she, her advice to him was open your heart, and then he kind of actively rejected that and told his son to close your heart to to like you know whatever happened to you uh and so like that that almost is like a 
interesting like way to get across like yeah your wife was basically telling you what you need to be doing this whole time and you didn't see that and then like hit this was just him remembering like yeah this entire time my wife was telling me to like live on without her because like he thought like the worst thing that could happen is for you to be gone i don't want to think about a world without you and so like her she's telling him like you have you have to think about that at some point because i am not you yeah like, i'm not a god so like i'm at some point i you will be living in a world without me so you have to and you have to get accustomed to that like it can't be the end of your world because you have a son right? right and so like i think that's a that's kind of like one way to kind of have him grow almost like after her uh his wife is dead yeah uh spencer routine writes in says my favorite part of the game thus far has to be the second dream sequence with Faye, and it's lead up with kratos undressing before going to sleep in the flashback Faye and kratos drift down a river while Faye attempts to persuade kratos to hold his newborn son kratos is borderline ignoring the child terrified his existence in life may lead to the death of his family a second time this character thread is continually hinted at throughout the final section of the game kratos is hell-bent on ensuring atreus' survival or atreus survives this ordeal no matter what and I guess that's kind of kicking it off for this whole chunk. That's so funny that that's somebody's favorite part. Yeah. Yeah. And I, okay, it, I watch a scene like that. Yeah. And I'm like, what new information is being re- revealed here? And yeah. it's nothing. I'm kind of with you. It, except for yeah. just reinforcing Kratos is really protective of Atreus. Whenever you're confused about characters' motivations, just remember that all he wants to do is protect Atreus. So therefore, that's why sure. Ragnarok has to happen. Well, right. yeah. So, like, I think that scene is less about like let's reveal a new inf- like bit of information, but it's like it, it's less about like it's a less about character growth and more about character revelation of like here is this thing that this person was holding, and it, that that kind of personifies Kratos a little bit more, right? It's not about like here's some new information. It's more about like this is more information on who Kratos was and the idea that like he was actively pushing back on what her what his wife was telling them and that their relationship wasn't as idyllic as like Atreus may have been led to believe of like oh yeah you and my mom were like uh were in love or whatever and it was really nice and then she passed away and now I have to deal with you by yourself like the idea that there was some friction between them I think is like an interesting wrinkle to their dynamic I think and I think that this scene uh kind of exemplifies what this God of War Ragnarok and 2018 are sort of doing and go where the the new series has sort of been going where the characters are being fleshed out. The story is really important. So even though we're not moving plot along or learning anything new, we are diving deeper mm. into the just the psyche uh, what's going on inside everybody's head and sort of instead of Kratos just being the the one note I'm a protective dad um you kind of see what's happening with him internally yeah and you and you kind of need that that to be part of his arc of like him having of it just not being about like oh it's going to be about the end of the world and about Atreus be maturing it's about like what does it mean for a father to like you know, uh, like who, a father who has had, who is like the end of his last relationship with the family was pretty traumatic. And like, what does it look like for him to now, pe- like he's never had to let go of someone because they've always been taken away from him. And what does it look, what is like the end of your relationship with some, well, not the end, but like, you know, what is parting yeah. from another person peaceably look like? Because it's all he's ever known is like, this person is ripped away from me. How do I let go of someone? Right. And I, and like, you know, like, it's almost why he seems so accepting of death is because like, well, it, it's almost like easier for me to just die than to like deal with the idea of me continuing on without, you know, with, without people who are important to me. Yeah. To defend Kyle from this brutal onslaught of an attack, though, I, 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 I get that idea of like, we, we know that already. We know Kratos is protective. We've seen that throughout the previous 20 hours of the game. And I feel like this entire final chunk, there's definitely a lot of new stuff in there, but... It was starting to starting to feel it drag a little bit every once in a while, like on conversation number 14 of like, so do you think you can really defy your fate? It's like, I, I got that. I yeah. think it's an interesting notion. I've been thinking about it for 30 hours at this point. I'm ready to I'm ready to move on to the next thing. And by God, it, they do. I, I, it does feel like a scene where we have to put this somewhere. Yeah. And then like it just happens to be a, like a point where you're kind of like, I this like this this rock has already started rolling down this hill like it, it it felt maybe a little bit of a weird pacing thing but yeah i totally i totally see why like now i have, now i have to kind of put up with this intermission right of of like having to hear some character moments but i already feel like i have that information so yeah i i totally see why it feels maybe a little bit uh, emphasized yeah the um okay then it is the transition 
maybe the oddest transition between Kratos and Atreus. It's it's pushing it. The wall, the wall punch. That's Just right. Punching yeah. the wall, and then it shifts over to Atreus and Throod and his best bud Link from Breath of the Wilds. There, the Asgardian boy from Midgar, which is confusing in a thousand different ways. Um, AJ Locasio is that voice and. And who's, uh, performance. Who is that? He's, he's a guy who used to work at Game Trailers back when we worked there, and now he does a ton of voice work. He's oh, a cool guy. really? Oh, is he the guy that did Marty McFly, too? Yeah. Oh, and he did, like, Han Solo and whatnot, right? Yeah. Oh, God, that's amazing. Well, hey, look at that. You know that the guy? Three, the three characters in fiction. <laughs> uh, Marty McFly, <laughs> Han Solo, and this kid. And Gizmo in the, ne- in the Netflix series. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, yeah, yeah. And so it's kind of driving in that message of... He's a little awkward around Throod, and it's like, oh, does he have a crush on her, or is it just being around gods or whatever? But then she has that line of like, huh, as a guardian boys can be so weird after he runs off and whatnot. He's definitely he, crushing on her. Yeah. He yeah. has a surprising amount of prominence in the story. Like, I did yes. not expect him to ever come back, <laughs> same, same. even after that first scene. It no, is- I knew that it, there was going to be some sort of heartstring pulling going on with him as soon as that, they were like, here's just some random kid. You don't need to, like, know too much about him. You just need to know that they're best buds now. It's just weird that he gets to hang around, the like, the rest of Asgard almost by Dane of like, well, this one kid who we're all like not super sure on and kind of just comes <laughs> in back and forth and could be the thing that leads to our destruction. Yeah, you, you, you're cool with him. So you're allowed into like to, you know, converse with the rest of the gods. Yeah, I think he solves a couple problems in the story of for Atreus, it seems like he's most excited. And the thing that he's excited to talk to Kratos about is like, I met people my own age visiting Asgard. No wonder I like going back there so many times. So giving him some more friends that are roughly his age to interact with, like that's powerful. And then also just having somebody be the symbol of the conflict at the end with Ragnarok of like, oh, uh, Odin brought all these people in front of the wall. Now they're all going to die. You know, it's a little bit, what is it? Age of Ultron or... Justice League, uh, one of those uh, Joss Whedon films, but I feel like in the middle of the climactic superhero battle, they keep cutting to like one family in the house, like, oh, it's scary. It's like, it's, he's kind of like, they need to yeah. connect and ground it some way. And I guess he's the symbol for that, you know? Uh, but then this entire section is them going to hell, uh, where Throod joins Loki and they get to go to hell to look for the other final piece of the mask. Um, and it's fun just to like wreck fools in hell. I don't know if it was just uh, the difficulty I was playing on or what, but I felt like I was just going through these hell walkers and it was a very satisfying feeling of like, okay, like we did this in the last You don't game. have to think about it. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Just destroy them. Yeah. It's a, is this the this is the first time or maybe the only time you're, you're like partnered with Throod? Uh, is this the first or second time? Uh, it's the first time, yeah, because it's like her big Because she says, don't mess yeah. this up for me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Very important mission. Which I, I definitely did a, like a fist pump when like, I, I realized that what was about to happen of like, oh, it's going to be Loki and Thrude this time. I mean, with like Heimdall kind of like helicopter parenting, I guess, a little bit. Well, I was really confused. Real yeah, because he like he came in with them. But then he's like, I'm on a secret mission for Odin. I'll see you guys later. And then, you know, he's a, a dick and he's toying with them later on and whatnot towards the end of that section. But he says later on that like, oh, I got your secret item for you, Odin, mm-hmm. on that mission. Did I miss what that was? Was that it's the, the moon? moon thing for Vanaheim? Oh, the the hands, the little thing. Wait, so he got that in hell? Yeah. To capture the moon from Vanaheim. Okay. Yeah, no, they brought it to Vanaheim, didn't they? To okay. like hide it. Okay, and that explains why he's in Vanaheim. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I completely missed those dots, but that that totally makes sense to track it that it's way. A, yeah. I, I, okay, so a major complaint that I have yeah. that'll be a, a running thread throughout this thing is that Odin's plans turned out to be dumb AF. <laughs> yeah, okay. Like, I, I, I thought Odin, like, last week, we talked about how, I like, Odin I was so impressed by. I was like, man, he's got his fingers and everything. He's all, all on top of everything. Right. And it turns out he's, like, kind of, like, stupid. His, well, he never had a cool plan. Well, I mean, he had the ultimate twist, which I guess we can get to, but just the all of the little pieces to build up to, I just want to look in this hole. You're waiting for a greater epiphany of like, he's pulling all the strings. I thought, I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So obviously like he was letting Ragnarok happen, but then he's like, oh no, Ragnarok's happening. Thor, you didn't, g- I'm skipping way ahead, but yeah, I'm like, yeah. this, this, lead, this is leading up to my main disappointment with this game is how disappointing Odin is as a villain. Mm. But like, yeah, that's what that's what Heimdall is doing right there. He's just getting the hands so that they can take them to Vanaheim so that you can watch the sun and the moon change. Right, right. Okay, that seems all right. 
Uh, he's he's got something going he on there. The, he wanted the moon to stay, like captured. He didn't want it to like or hurt Vanaheim. Yeah. Yeah. He wanted it to to stay captured in Vanaheim. And I think the problem with Odin, which I think ties in well to his character, is like most people who are like that kind of who think they're that intelligent and who are manipulative overestimate their abilities. So I think he just assumed that he was way smarter than everyone and no one would ever catch on to anything and met his match and didn't expect it. But yeah, it doesn't make for like the coolest villain character. It would be cooler if he was like, haha, I really did have all of this on top of like I was five steps ahead of everybody at the whole time. And uh, but yeah, he really doesn't seem to be doing that much. It seemed like he had some sort of plan to divert Ragnarok uh, yeah. that we you, you, didn't really get into. You could almost see it as like, well, if I peek into this hole, I'll have all the answers. So I'll know right. how to stop Ragnarok. Right. Okay. So, but right. That's not, that's not necessary. I don't think that's, I would be curious to see if they ever make that connection explicit, but mm -hmm. it definitely seems like, I think maybe the, the thread that you're supposed to leave him with is that like, he is so obsessed with answers, which is the yes. thing that Loki wants at the beginning of the game. I'm like, I just want, I just want to explore the world so I can look for answers. And he's supposed to be like the dark parallel to that of like, you can become too obsessed with answers, but I don't know that that thread like ends super satisfactorily of like, yeah, it's really, you know, wrong for you to always just seek answers, which is a, which maybe I'm not digging deep enough, but like, it seems like a weird thread that's kind of not super well explored, but it, yeah. it, do not it, question it, your existence. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and it's like, is Odin interested in stopping Ragnarok or is he just interested in not dying until he has an answer for where he's going to go in the afterlife? It seems like that's number one concern more than I need to stop Ragnarok technically. Yeah, yeah. it seems like that, that gets to be a nice, like, convenient part of my plan. And he almost feels like, oh, I've set things up in such a way that, like, yeah, you guys are never going to stop at. Like, I think when 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 they kill when you kill like, Heimdall, he, he seems like legitimately like surprise i feel like he almost knows like there's that part where he's like loki would you happen to know anything about what might have happened to oh, he knows exactly yeah uh, yeah it's, but, but like he does seem legitimately surprised that it happens it's like oh okay maybe now i actually have to figure something out and like my mastermind planned and like it almost relied on like yeah i know i know unstoppable no one's ever gonna kill him yeah the yeah. number one complaint about odin is uh walking into his den especially in this section i feel like there's a couple sections in this chunk here where the game really restricts you and kind of locks you down so you're on this path so you have to walk straight to odin in his little cave but they put like a shiny thing off to your left that you clearly want to run over and go pick up because it's what the game has trained you to do just throwing treasures everywhere mm -hmm. left and right but every once in a while it'll lock you into kind of like this cinematic mode even in an area you're used to walking around and this section that drove me insane of like all right just don't resist it you can stop walking but you can't even turn and i feel mm -hmm. like this and also like the the bar fight with thor is really where i felt like i was playing a game in a straight jacket like you've trained me to run around and fight and now you just really want me to do the cinematic version of it and it's just not quite feel uncomfortable uh but we're in hell everybody uh running around with through i think it's in this section where uh she has that line where she's like oh another puzzle well there's always a solution there's always a way around yeah. which i feel like also kratos like, is mirroring later on we did talk a little bit about breaking the fourth wall i feel like there was a little bit of weird lamp shading here where it's like it stops being a like uh, haha you guys don't like this is kind of old school gameplay and it starts going into like nobody's enjoying this you're n you're the player you the player are not enjoying doing another gate opening right. thing and we're gonna laugh at that but instead of actually fixing what we know you might not be enjoying and i'm like yeah. i don't think like at first i was really cool with the fourth wall thing and i'm like oh that's kind of clever because you know and it wasn't overstaying its welcome here it really starts to push on me and like mm -hmm. rub me the wrong way of just like yeah i really don't want to do another gate puzzle could you just let me through please i hear you um, it's not quite as bad as like i think like naughty dog in like the uncharted 4 era had a lot of that of like the characters would literally say well another wave of enemies oh my god these guys again it's like yeah you're in control take them out of the game um but i feel like there were yeah maybe two lines in this game of like another one of these puzzles where it mirrored it but it, it wasn't quite as draining as maybe i was bracing for but i totally hear you especially like the second time you're visiting hell here 
is it second, maybe third? Um, we are with Kratos, and then it's like, okay, another one of these puzzles, really? Okay, let's freeze the thing and then chain it up that way, but you're slowing us down. Uh, let's see, uh, this entire chunk. Oh, one tiny specific thing that bothered me with Throod. I like her as a character, but every time we're like slow walking behind her as well, seeing her swords kind of like jank around <laughs> on her butt, especially like going upstairs where it's just kind of like has this awkward clipping thing. You spend so much time just like slowly walking behind her and just like those swords and the weird clipping animation drove me bananas. Other than that, uh, she's perfect as a character. You know what's so funny is uh, I was thinking about some of the comments we have during these talks. Yeah. And then wh while I was watching how many hundreds of names I saw in the credits, you know what I mean? <laughs> right, so it's right, like, right. It's like they work so hard on one sequence of hell. You know what I mean? Yep, like they oh were God. so, there's like hundreds of people involved. And then we're like, man, it was so awkward with the way that they held that mug, wasn't it? And it's like, <laughs> that's what they're commenting on? Like, I, I worked, I worked for a whole thing. day yeah. on that mug. That was a day yeah. of my life. They're talking about the hand holding the mug. You know what I mean? So it's it's really funny, but like, that's just human, right? It's those little yeah. things that do stand out right. to you. I do feel the, like the other reaction to that is like, I told them, I, I told them I needed three more days to fix that mug and they wouldn't they, they told me to move on i know like, i know yeah, i was yeah. sort of like trust me, trust me players i know about the mug i tried to fix it they wouldn't let me i love the head cannon that i came up with for that uh another gate puzzle mm. thing for me was like the the person actually developing it didn't like it but someone up above was like oh we need to have one more puzzle so they put it in just to like <laughs> back talk i like so that. I, to think about that kind of oversight right i feel like you could slip some things through like that i i feel like that just comes down to probably play testing and realizing because i think they probably lock in like all the big narrative scenes and then they save like a pass of vo and writing for like okay how's the player feeling in this how can we have the characters do a little quip and banter that'll kind of mirror how they're feeling and it's like that's probably one of those that came a little bit later of like people are kind of annoyed by how many puzzles there are we're not going to gut this entire section that'll be a mess let's yeah. just slip in one quick vo line while we're in the recording booth and then line it up and hopefully people will like the characters more but i totally hear you kai i totally worry about that as well of you know there's so much to celebrate in this game that just only focusing on the little things that might annoy you slightly. It's like, hopefully, the deepest dive were given this game the credit it deserves and the attention it deserves and the discussion it deserves. But naturally, those things are going to pop up. So yeah, it yeah, can't yeah, just be human. It, it can't be five hours of us no. just gushing. That's no, gross. Yeah, that would be that would be a little overboard. But like, we did we have talked about it before. Just the production value on this game yeah. is mind boggling. So mm. every place we go to is it's gorgeous and. Uh, totally different than other places we've gone to hell is no different in that respect it is just utterly kind of creepy and like i don't really want to be there i'm not a big fan of cold and i feel cold when i'm going through it you know so like there is a lot to love in this section even though it's kind of off-putting yeah the uh let's see we had a uh, one a question from a patreon supporter who was wondering a very specific thing tommy uh carver chaplin asks why did the mask lead atreus to garm this is a really fun question yeah mm -hmm. what do you think it like is? it's what i'm most shocked by really also okay so that odin was dumb but also that there's absolutely no resolution to that mask which will continue in future in the future of the series um it I feel like I feel like that mask is like tied to Loki's like intense, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's like Captain Jack Sparrow's compass. It points to whatever you want. <laughs> That's perfect. And, yeah. Like they they all die. They all die in Ragnarok if Garm doesn't turn into um, Fenrir. Fenrir. You know, they would all just blow up and die. So like Garm getting unleashed was so essential to victory in Ragnarok. Right. It's, it's, it's actually so funny because you brought up the mask last time and I'm thinking yeah. like, is this, is this the idea is that this mask is Loki's mask and it's like actually yeah. trying to help him and like, instead of like for as much as Odin may think it's mysterious, maybe the reason he can read the mask and is like, you know, guided by the mask for most of this section, most of the sections that you play as him is that like, it just being like, we'll give you this one, but it doesn't necessarily make a ton of sense. Yeah. For why it right. would lead him to Garm anyway, but Unless like it, it made sense know. to me that it led to Garm, but then when Loki did the oh, I mistranslated. Right. It doesn't say cold. It says first, and then for there to be actually something there didn't make sense to me. Yeah, I'm like maybe the other piece was in Garm, 
<laughs> but why would there suddenly be why why is the mask backing him up when he's trying to do this lame like pull the wool over Odin's eyes thing? Or maybe the mask was just making the best of like, okay, he accidentally went to hell. What can I point him to in hell that might eventually be helpful? Or I mean, do you think it's something of Fay or some larger entity is putting fate into the mask and guiding Atreus where he needs to go? I feel like there's maybe just like an explanation we miss because I, I don't think I wouldn't go that far in, into saying like the mask is some sort of ulterior intent now that I think about it. But I feel like I feel like there is an answer to this that we just did not necessarily grok or was not conveyed super well. Yeah. And uh, now we might never know. Um, <laughs> but uh, this whole section, Garm gets free. Um, and then I love that scene where Heimdall is just like, they get back to Asgard and Heimdall just goes up to Odin to immediately tell him exactly what happens. And he's like, I'm not going to start telling him until you leave the room, Atreus. I don't care how long you're standing next to this desk. You need to leave this room. And then the second you leave, uh, then I'm sure he gushes and just uh, or details everything that happened and how you messed up. And God, does Atre- I think it's Heimdall in that section. He has some good lines too about like, your stupidity pains me type of messaging as he's screaming them over and over again about why Garm's free. And then Odin comes into Atreus' room and has that whole sequence where he's like, well, I heard it from Heimdall, but I'd like to hear from you exactly what happened. And even with this terrifying giant wolf that's been imprisoned for who knows how long now that it's free, I love that Odin is still backing up Atreus. So he's still like, okay, well, you know, uh, that's not ideal, but if you want to go home, okay, that's fine. I'll just need my sword back and I'll need my mask back. And then I meant it when I said you're not a prisoner. So have fun. You'll be back. See ya. Cross out the word backing up and say manipulating. That's probably he a fair point. He's still manipulating Loki. Mm-hmm. Right. I could, like, even see, I could even see like if we want to conspirate, uh, uh, you know, have, you know, conspiracies about the mask. I could almost see like it being like a deliberate mislead on Odin's part to send him there to say like, Oh, that's going to cause problems and you're going to be, you're going to feel bad about what you did. And you're going to be like, I'm going to, I'm going to do everything that I'm supposed to do. But with the implication that it's like, you're going to feel so bad that you're going to come back or like it's, it'll cost some like descent within you and, and your group that it'll, it'll like basically draw you closer to me for me to be this forgiving of, of something that I basically tricked you into doing. I like that, but that would assume that Odin has some control over the mask, which it seems like, yeah, it seems like that's the one thing that he doesn't understand, you know, but I like that. Um, and then I love that section where they're reunited. Um, it's very sweet. Uh, the big hug between Kratos and uh, Treyas. See, they got back together, Kyle. It all works out okay. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, I could not believe it. Yeah, there's yeah. a couple big reunited scenes. I started rooting for Kyle's interpretation. I wanted him to be like evil Loki and then Kratos and Loki go head to head and Kratos dies. And and then everybody, cr- yeah, everybody cries. Um, but uh, yeah, I love that line when you get back and then Mimir just says, Great bleeding f- you freed Garm. <laughs> Like, everyone's yeah. just horrified. Like, of all the things you could have done, like, I love that everybody in Asgard and everybody back at Sindri's house are both like, you did what? Are you out of your mind? And, yeah, uh, somebody wrote in about that section as well. Um, I ain't a bloody squid, writes in and says, I loved when Kratos defended Atreus from everyone, getting on him about freeing Garm and helps him correct his mistake. This is where yeah. it felt Kratos really changes his nature and is the beginning of him becoming a beloved god. It's also like the most understandable thing because it's almost like I can yell at my kid, but you can't yell at my kid. So it's like when everyone else gets mad at him, instead of it being like a thing where he's like, yeah, Atreus, what the hell? He's like, he's immediately on the defensive of like, look, what happened happened. We have to like, let's just fix this. But like, you do not get to yell at my child. It's basically like his whole tone uh, uh, there, which is just fun to see like Kratos behaving more fatherly. Mm -hmm. This This is a funny scene. In hindsight, because they're all they're mostly mad because he went to go talk to Odin and worked with Odin. This is mostly what they're mad about. They're like, you went to Odin. He is the worst guy. You shouldn't have done that. And then, you know, two chapters later, they're going to be like, you should go to Odin. Right. Go back. Go back. We don't have any other ideas. You should go. You should go see Odin. We're out of ideas. Go over there. I want to unpack that. But yeah, that was one of my least favorite scenes in the game. I hated that. Yeah. 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 Nick Olson says, I cried when Atreus and Kratos reunited. Didn't we all? 
I didn't, but that was a very sweet scene. Uh, I thought it was lovely. It was. Uh, especially, like, you know, everything was like blown out white and Kratos was just looking around. And then it in- took me a second, honestly, for it to, it took that whole chapter where they're together and then they have some revelations for it to like really set in that like, okay, is everything good? Right, right. Yeah. yeah. And like, you know, you talk about him being like, you can't yell at my son, only I can yell at my son, Serial. I think part of that, at least my read on it was, it's a little bit like the the big quest with the jellyfish of, I'm sure part of Kratos is just happy to see his son and also being like, right. oh, I get to go on another mission with my son and it's probably going to involve killing a big wolf. That sounds like my kind of thing. I can do this. You know, so like having one more opportunity to bond with them. Maybe that's why he's not upset about Garm because it's kind of like, almost oh. the most noble. Like I'm like, oh, here's this obstacle that you're going to have to kill. And Kratos is like, great. No ambiguity about what I need to do. Like yes. it's not going to involve me growing as a person. All I have to do is <laughs> like dig my blades into this guy. Awesome. Can't wait. Yep. 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 For sure. Uh, Ian T. Clark uh, writes in on Patreon and says, when Kratos asked Atreus, what should I call you? I thought my heart was going to explode yeah. when Atreus runs up to hug his father. That was a really sweet line for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he just completely loses Like, he, you know that he had planned that. He was like thinking for days, what am I going to say to him when I see him? Right. What's the first thing I'm going to say? And that was the, like, the, the plan. But immediately upon Atreus not trying to argue or anything completely admits it's just like oh, i'm so happy to see you dad like he just breaks down he's like of course you're my little atreus yeah best buds forever uh and then they go to hell again to track down garm and i love going through the portal and the first thing you see is just garm jumping over and running through the environment you just get that immediate sense of the scope and just the size of this thing that this was one of my favorite sections in the entire game for sure was my favorite boss fight, I think, was yeah. the Garm fight. Yeah. Um, but just, I, think, I think it is like the peak uh, boss fight that showcases like what they're doing with both the camera and like it felt like a return to form of like, oh, God of War is about fighting really big dudes and like stabbing the crap out of them. <laughs> that so I think is it was really know. hard, this boss fight, not because of its difficulty, but because I didn't want to kill this wolf creature at mm. all of like i i'm really hoping that there's some way like can i get atreus in here to talk to him or is there some way for me to like not hit him but still like oh maybe if i freeze the chains enough and i don't attack him it'll be okay no i had to yeah it was surprising it seems like it was nudging that direction of like okay atreus thinks he can maybe talk to garm okay i guess that's out the window and it's like, okay plan b i guess let's just kill it and then there's an ultimate plan c of course but this entire kind of like emotional journey to the garm fight i think it was in this chunk here um what it was still like atreus being a little bit cagey about like Both yeah of them. yeah and i was i was just feeling like man this deep into the story start telling each other what's going on you say you're on yeah. the same team it was frustrating and then it was like Atreus saying, like, I can't really begin to explain what's going on. And then it was like the next puzzle. He's like, by the way, there's this mask and here's exactly what's happening with Odin. It's like, yeah, you can explain it. I'm so glad that it didn't take that long before finally he was like, yeah, okay, let me just tell you everything. Because it's really not as complicated as you think it is, Atreus. Yeah, I did remember thinking, like, I feel like there's a maybe a missing line from Kratos saying, like, don't you think it's worth it for you to try? Like, oh, I can't couldn't possibly explain what's going on. I feel I, I yeah. feel like Kratos should have pushed them a little bit more on, like, I feel like you owe me a, something here. Like, maybe you don't have to tell me the big revelation of, like, Ironwood or whatever, but, like, you should come up with something. Like, I feel I am owed something here. Yeah. yeah. I think what happened is he, uh, Atreus would spin it back on Kratos. Usually the way that conversation would end, right? Is it's like, well, oh, just like you and your secrets. And then, you know, uh. so I think that's what was nice is that Kratos in turn said, hey, also, I talked to some Norns and they said that Heimdall wants to kill you. So that's what that's what I've been on about. Right. So I got right. the spear. And so, yeah, I, I le- it was annoying that they were both keeping their secrets from each other. Uh, but... It's nice to see them just, you know, a little deeper into this mission. Yeah. Finally divulge that stuff. And then I'm like, okay, we're good. We're all, everybody's good now. That feels nice. Yeah. Yeah. And I do like that, you know, when he talks about, yeah, I visited the Norns. And then Atreus is like, I thought you didn't believe in prophecies, which is what he's been saying the entire time. And it's like, yeah, it turns out when Kratos is back against the wall, he just ran to the Norns. He's like, please just tell me what happens, please. You know, it's like, <laughs> okay, we see through this nonsense. Like someone who's yeah. like not going to look at a guide and they're just so <laughs> stuck. They have to go. Right, right, right. Yeah. I was definitely thrown uh off by suddenly they're just revealing that they both know kratos is gonna die and i'm like yeah what? i thought that was gonna be a big moment and for that to I be like i'm shivering over yeah it's just bizarre a little bit like especially since we're taking a lot of time for these kind of emotional beats i felt like that was gonna be a big one yeah 
Uh, I like to in the section just you know where they're still keeping secrets. I feel like Kratos is kind of tiptoeing around it when he's just like, so did Odin ask you to free Garm? Just like really trying to like map out every possibility. He's like, is this where this is going? Because I really have no idea what's happening and I'm not going to be mad. I'm just asking if this was maybe part of the plan. And Trey's like, no, no, dad, you wouldn't understand. Um, also, I like the idea that you're fighting the Raiders again. And it's like, well, well I guess they're dead. Where else are they going to go? Of course, they're going to go here. So that explains why we can kind of recycle those enemies from early on in the game. Where are they going to go? Detroit? Um, all right. We got... Uh, who? Rory Gladstone says, I've still not finished the game, but I had to write in and talk about the emotional payoff for the mission in Helheim. I've been screaming at these characters to tell each other the truth for the whole game and the build up to that to then finally get the release of this heart to heart. I love the pack that they made and I hope it lasts till the end of the game. Uh, which is, yeah, I guess jumping ahead a little bit past the Garm fight, but that pact of we're going to, I'm going to constantly, how would you describe it, Kyle? We're going to hear each other in each other's heads and act accordingly forever? Not act accordingly. That was not part of the plan. Okay. But if it, it was basically, hey, if they ever make a game that's just starring you, <laughs> I'm going to narrate some of it, okay? It's like, okay. <laughs> you call me on the phone. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Hand shaken. Uh, Patrick Henderson says, after the first Garm fight, the reticle still turns red when you aim your axe at his corpse. So I totally saw the rematch coming. That's uh, cute. Now the part where you stab him in the head to transfer Fenrir's soul into a soulless husk to make him the biggest, goodest boy ever, I did not see that one coming. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. I was being cynical. I actually yeah. think that it's really sweet that Kratos in return says, Atreus, your voice has value to me in, in right. my own direction. Right, I actually, right. I think it was sweet that that was a pact that went both ways. It wasn't just the father saying, you know, listen to me in your head. It was also like, I'm going to listen to you in my head too. Yeah, because yeah. he said that he's feeling himself turning back to his old ways and he needs to have Atreus in his head and Atreus around to kind of keep him on the, on the old straight and narrow and away from just killing gods left and right. Yeah, I think too this was a really good show of like one of Kratos' hardest challenges during this game has been seeing his son as a uh, like an adult. Like he's not quite an adult yet, but he is growing and that sort of like that weird transition parents have to go through where you've been my child for so long and now suddenly you're an adult with your own thoughts and opinions and I have to respect you as as one adult to another. And then I feel like that's the conversation where Kratos is kind of like, yeah, you, you, I mean, I'm still kind of guiding you and you're still growing, but I have to allow you to become a real human being instead of just this. Yeah, this, this is him preparing himself for Atreus's eventual departure, basically. Right. Mm -hmm. And he has that line, too, where Atreus says, after they've tamed Fenrir, and it's like, hey, this is what happens when you trust me. And that carries through to the rest of the game in a big way, but... I think through this entire chunk, it's like, Trace is still pretty dumb. The idea that the yeah, lesson is he, to have full he, faith he, he in a 15-year-old, yeah. like, come on, man. That, that should not be the takeaway for anybody here. It's like, all right, you can do no wrong, 16-year-old, or however old a Trace is supposed to be in this chunk. Yeah, I mean, on, on it, 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 like, it is totally what he would say, right? But it's like, I don't know that I totally like, oh, well, I guess I should, yeah, again, trust the 15-year-old. But it, it's like totally in character for him to be like, see, I, I'm capable of doing stuff. Yeah. Uh, the Canapa Effect over there on Patreon says, can we give the Santa Monica team a shout out for their excellent dog animation? The switch from Killer Wolf to the adorable Fenrir was sublime. Yeah, I think... Absolutely. They, that is, I think it is my favorite boss fight in the game for a lot of reasons. Yeah. Uh, for one, like I think the camera work is impeccable. I think they do... One of the hardest things in, in, in games is that like a lot of big enemies are basically defined by like either their top or bottom third where it's like either it's like the big guy at the top of the building you're fighting his like torso and hands yeah. yep. or, or you're just pecking at their legs right and this does not feel like either one of those I mean you are attacking his legs a lot but it's like you get to see his uh, uh, his full body and you fight and it feels like you are fighting all of him like in, in a way that you don't do with a lot of bosses and I think that fight works really well to again convey the, like the oh in order to like attack it in order to like you know deal real damage to him you have to stun him and then uh hit the chain and you get yep. to do this giant godlike you know swing 
Uh, and also, like, yeah, his animations are really, like, the, the most I ever empathized with him as, like, a dog was when he's doing that, he has that one stomp where he, like, fires waves at you. And the way, like, that, the animations feel so, like, dog-like of, like, oh, it looks like a dog, like, looking for different patches of dirt to dig into. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like, it, it, it's like it, it is such, from top to bottom, such a well-made fight in terms of, like, both the animation and I think the design of it, of, like, having to block all of his attacks and stuff is is pretty uh, well implemented. And then when, like, the cook time events kind of shift from Kratos to Atreus after like the first time you defeat him is so cool and then I think it's what well, the second time you fight him then there's that moment where Kratos 2 like uh, he latches on him with his chains maybe it's the first time I forget and then Atreus is running on Kratos' chains and then Kratos like whips his chains up to like launch Atreus up and then I think that's when he stabs him so that's the second time with the mm-hmm. knife there but all that stuff that camera work is just amazing mm-hmm. and, the, and the music like the music is kind of an evolution of I think it's the song's called like Deliverance, like the Balder boss fight music from the first game. It's just kind of like a bigger, more epic version of that. I think that's the track that it's kind of spinning off of, but it's just amazing. Uh, and there's something so strange. I, I don't know. I, I, it made me more scared than I expected for all the sections, all the chunks in this section where you're just really close to his mouth like the dog's mouth like seeing something that you know in real life so well like ah, it's a dog's mouth no big deal but being that close to a gigantic version of it like it freaked me out a little bit more than i expect because like i know this thing but now it's giant and i'm actually scared of it on my tv right now yeah there's that part in the end the epilogue where they're like where anger boat is like oh yeah maybe we'll see about getting you uh, some treats and i just immediately like what does that look like for him because like the (laughs) idea of how much does this dog have to eat now of like I need to eat like a full village every day or I'm going to starve <laughs> like what is what is it like it's like a you know very terrifying version of Clifford the Big Red Dog is basically what we're dealing with yeah do they ever feed Clifford in those books there must be some book where it's like we need to raid the milk factory for him to lap it all up or something but yeah. you know. or like uh, children start going missing from the nearby village <laughs> oh excellent uh yeah also I feel like this entire section um as I, I I'd imagine they look to Last Guardian a little bit for inspiration, which I consider to be the, the best animal animation in any game up to this point. But just being around that giant of a creature, I thought, of like, oh, Are it you feels... feeding your dog's milk? <laughs> I just, I'm sorry, I'm perplexed. Like, the first thing you went to, to is, like, uh-huh. what do you feed a giant dog? And you're like, milk, obviously. Lots of milk. <laughs> look, uh, this is... You're not, you're not going to tell anybody, right? I, I don't have a dog. Uh, I was just kind of taking okay. a guess, man. <laughs> like, dogs love milk, right? Yeah. There's like an associate. I don't know if it's like <laughs> literally from Clifford, but I feel like there is like some association between like dogs and like old traditional like milk bottles that the milkman brings you for Oh, well, some they attack reason. the milkman and they sure. love That's milk true. bone. Milk bone is a thing. And, and calcium in yeah. yeah. bone. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. in my defense, cats like milk, so no, don't, feed, milk. don't yeah. feed cats milk. Wait, really? Oh, yeah, for real. But they like it. In They're all like cartoons. lactose intolerant. All oh. cats as a species, uh, like for for like cow milk and stuff, like things we would drink. Um, like, don't do it. Don't feed your cats milk. Hey, Kyle. Um, question yeah. for you, buddy. Um, babies <laughs> can they be lactose intolerant? And then they drink the breast milk and it doesn't go well? Yes. Human babies? That's a thing? Human babies, yeah. Yeah, you're not supposed to feed human babies cow milk either. I well, think. I think formula, right? most, yeah. most doctors recommend a kind of like a cocktail mix of most mammals' milks, and then you feed that to your baby. Most mammals' milks. milks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why you see those signs in the doctor's office that just say most mammals' milks. <laughs> and you kind of know what to do from there. Um, Jerry Young, however, writes in and says, I don't remember specifically what was mentioned as moment of the year on the last episode, but if giant Fenrir being told to sit by Kratos has uh, doesn't overtake it, then everything's wrong in the world. It is such a well done moment. Uh, it is and very then home. fun. And he just says home. Yes. And then he warps cool through. Moment. I, I really thought that that idea of Fenrir being able to warp between the realms that was going to be a bigger component. Mm-hmm. Like when they said like, oh, Garm's free. He can tear a hole in the realms. It's like, okay, well, this is how we're getting around from here on out. And then it really wasn't. Even when they're like, later on, it's just a brief window, I guess. But they're like, Asgard, how are we, the hell are we going to get to Asgard? And it's like, you have a giant puppy that obeys every command that tears holes between the realms. I thought it was very yeah. clear. I even thought I even went as far as to think like, oh, here's a here's a dog that makes portals. The, the mask is like, you know, in part, 
you know, like it, it, it is associated with that one crack in Asgard. So I figured like, oh, they're going to use that crack to invade Asgard from the inside is to, is to like, you know, Loki's going to have Fenrir sniff the mask right. and like burst through Asgard through the crack that Odin was trying to look into. That'd be cool. That'd be cool. Nothing short of that, like when they start, we're, I'm skipping ahead, but when they start losing powers and they're like, oh no, people can't come to us. Like, why not get the dog who can like rip through the fabric of yeah. reality to help your your allies come through and keep fighting. Like, yeah. We were underutilizing that dog. I don't know if Kratos deserved his place as general. Uh, yeah, I wonder... We'll if, get to that. We'll get to that, I We'll think. get to that. Um, yeah, I wonder if it's kind of like a backdoor thing of they needed to get him to Asgard somehow, so how are we going to do it? Let's just say that he can rip a hole between realms, and then we need to plant that earlier, even if that is going to derail where we think that the story is going to go. But Randolph Sparks says, I love the game overall, but I was a tad disappointed with how little Fenrir was utilized in the endgame, especially with how they set up uh, the obligatory God of War trip to hell. Um, yeah, I think I think I was expecting a little more Fenrir. It, like I was delighted every time I saw him. There's definitely super cute stuff with him and Anger Boda and stuff throughout this entire ending section. But at the same time, yeah, I think I think I was expecting to be a bigger deal. Maybe just from like the the fact that it was one, I don't know, like the third trailer we saw for the game it was kind of that 30 second CG teaser where it's Kratos and um, Atreus encountering Fenrir in the woods. Did you watch that one? Did everybody remember that one? Oh yeah, I'm thinking I hated that CG trailer. Yeah. Yeah, and like it wasn't. But that, I guess that is what that was at the end. Not, not coming back to think of it. Yeah, and it wasn't really a specific scene because it looked like they're kind of in Midgard where they encountered him yeah. and stuff. But um, I I thought that uh, I thought it was a weird choice to have Atreus stab him with the knife, and then Garm runs away, um, and then like as you're maneuvering and going through cracks and climbing and doing doing all this stuff to go up to the cave where Garm slash Fenrir is hiding in. I thought it was a weird choice that, like, they have Atreus explain what happened to Kratos. I'm like, yeah, so I had the soul in my knife, and then when I stabbed him, I put the soul uh, from Fenrir into him, so now he's going to be good now. It's like, that seems like such... Of all the times in the game where they should have just said, like, just wait and see, you'll like this, and then you get to have that big moment of, like, him jumping out of the cave but being a little puppy. It seems weird that they would, like, step on that reveal by kind of explaining exactly what happened beforehand. Right? Yeah, I, well, I, I think I, you're not supposed to. I think it, the question is whether it worked or not. OK, yeah. sure. I think you, you're supposed to feel uneasy. Like, did it work? Did it work? OK, did, it, did his plan work? I think like you're not supposed to feel a certain or not whether it worked. I don't know if that's worth it, though. I think it's more fun to have the big moment of a puppy jumps out of the shadows on you, like licks your face sure. or something. Yeah, right. But yeah, maybe, I, I could almost see that as like a maybe maybe people were just confused about like, wait, yeah. what happened? And, yep. and they just thought like, well, I guess we can just explain it, basically. I think I think like that's exactly game, what happened. Gameplay testing. Yeah. Everyone's like, I'm confused. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, but hey, uh, that was cute. And then you run around and you talk to the big eagle from hell, which is awesome. That was <laughs> and the really eagle's cool. just like, yeah, just you shouldn't have done that. Just fix the holes, everybody. All right. I'll be here. Wandering the character hell. model of uh, Gorm. And then Fenrir uh, and the the eagle whose name I could not say to save my life. Harass um, Helger. Yeah. They're so like Dark Souls in yeah in construction. And I'm just like, oh, this is so perfect for this level. And I was really expecting that eagle to like come at me and pick me up and fly me somewhere. <laughs> no, he just wants to have a brief little chat. That's about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. This section too is interesting. Like I guess before he turns into Fenrir and he's still Garm running around. I love that chunk where it's like, okay, he's back after the first boss fight, and he's, like, clawing through the holes, trying to get at you and stuff, and then there's a moment where Kratos is just like, run! And Kratos is like, what are we doing? What's the plan? And Kratos is like, I don't know, just run! Which feels, like, so anti-Kratos, just like, let's just run away from the big thing right now. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a nice evolution of his character or what. There's a moment when they're running, too, that I really liked, that Atreus just quips, like, "Uh, there's a hole here, jump! And the only reason he knows there's a hole there is because while you were back there with um, oh right, right. Yeah, with you, Yeah, you cut, you cut the, the thing that dropped down to the floor. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, that's a cool callback. Yeah, for sure. Uh, then you go back to Sindri's house. Um, they talk about the mask. It's kind of the big, uh, big on masking, where uh, he's showing them like in the book, and they're passing around to be like, hey, what do you think of this? Have you ever seen this before? And most of them haven't. I think, what Mimir and Freya are kind of like, oh, that old thing. All right, I guess he's still obsessed with that. Um, and then there was a weird moment where Tyr is like, oh, yes, the mask. This is what Odin was torturing me about. 
And everyone's like, okay, cool. And like, no one has any follow-up questions for <laughs> Tyr in that moment, which struck me as so odd. And then he also apologizes for not defending the house earlier when all the hell walkers were attacking it. Where he's like, next time, next time I will defend it. Because when they attack your house, that's different. You never attack a man's house is kind of his lesson, which is some fun foreshadowing happening there from Tyr's point of view. But I definitely was during this section, like in the earlier chunk too, just starting to really wonder about like, where is Tyr in this house? He's just in that tiny closet every time that I'm in here. It really seems odd that he's just tucked away and not mixing about with everybody else. But maybe there's a reason for that. Uh, and then they also say uh, where they're talking about Garm. Mimir has a line here where he says they're like, oh yeah, you know, like uh, Tyr's arm actually got ripped off by Garm uh, a long time ago which I thought for sure was going to happen in this game. Jill, I assume you're in the same camp that at some point Garm was going to come rip Tyr's arm off. That's a big thing in the myths. Um, and then Mimir just basically says like, yeah, he got better. Like it grew back. He's a pretty good God. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what? Like, <laughs> turn me into a newt. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, but, you know, I guess, you know, we see Heimdall regrow his arm later on and stuff too. So it's not, not that wild. I would say, oh, we're not there yet. I'll not there yet. Uh, but then you go, well, Freya basically takes off like, hey, if you're not going to attack Odin right now, I need to go help my brother in Vanaheim. See ya. And then you can get an opportunity to go on more side quests or you can go join her there. And then you go and you meet somebody there, which nobody wrote in about. This is one of the oddest characters I feel like in this game. And I don't think he had a big impression, but a uh, boar guy. No, I yes. do not remember hitting a boar <laughs> at all in God of War 2018. I remember First one where um, just before you get to the Witch of the Woods, because you don't know it's Freya yet. You yeah, uh, it's when he runs off and you're like, Atre you're like chasing after him going like, Atreus, we're like, you need to not, you know, lose like yourself. Is, to, yeah. yeah, he's trying to prove to his dad that he can actually do stuff because he couldn't kill the deer. So he's like trying to kill. It's like a big white boar, right? Like, yeah, I remember carrying it back, um, but I forgot the specifics of like the fact that he shot it. It's so, like this character. It, I, I sure, <laughs> like I guess it was cool to yeah. have another character thrown in there, but yeah, no one had wrote in about him. I don't think he had a huge impression. I think a lot of the Vanaheim stuff kind of fell flat. Like, really, nobody wrote in about Freyr and talking about how much they like him. I feel like him yeah, as a character man. overall was yeah, just bad. the boar especially feels like a Rodig the the squirrel situation where yes. it's like, oh, we totally goofed on like this character actually has more significance to the world of like Norse myth. So we need to bring them back. Uh, but like, I, like, I guess this is like the best we can do of like, yeah, they, they're associated with Freya, but it, like sometimes they're a boar, sometimes they're a person. But now we need him to be a person instead of a boar because we have bigger plans for him. Uh, that That's what that felt like to me. But yeah, like the I think the Vanaheim, the, like this Vanaheim section, I think to, for me was the lowest section in the game. Same here. Both because I think the story is like the most like MacGuffin-y of like, oh, I'm chasing, I guess I'm chasing some artifact and the moon is gone and I have to figure out this. And like, I think it's, that was sort of where I was most kind of frustrated at, at some of the combat stuff. So it, it just felt like a weird, like, yeah, I kind of don't like it. It was like the most I was kind of compelled to put the game down. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think after that, it, de it definitely picks up, I think. Yeah. And by it's the way, it's extremely chat, uh, muddled about yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Can anyone co sort of explain? We get to Vanaheim to help Freya, Freya and Freya. And I, I, some of them have been kidnapped. And then I thought I was going to go out to help them. And suddenly I'm getting the moon. Why? I was also confused about that entire yeah, section. Yeah, because they're like, oh, these two people that you've never met before have been also been kidnapped. And so, like, Freya, I guess, is going to help them. And so you ha and also the moon's gone, so you have to go recover this artifact. But it's like, it definitely feels like overly dense for how, how, like, how little the relevance is to the overall plot. It feels like a weird tangent in a way that, like, I think the, I know the Ironwood was also kind of in this vein. But th this, I feel like, is not as good as the Ironwood section, and I'm, that's probably controversial, but, like, this felt the most, I would, like, this This was, like, the most disconnected I felt from, like, the stakes of the game. Yes. Yeah, because Kratos, to me, would definitely have said, like, I'm sorry your friends are kidnapped, but I'm here for Freya. I'm going to go help her. Like, why am I on a mission to go get the moon and help the two wolves? Well, like, yeah. Did they explain it? or And I just missed a line? Well, I think he has that line where they're like, you know, I think Curtis says something along the lines of like, you know, yeah, I know we're supposed to defy fate and all this stuff, but what are we supposed to do? Like, not help our friends? Not go save the moons? Like, we need to do this stuff because it's just the obvious right thing to do in this situation. I think. Did they connect so, how the moons help in some way? That'd be bad. Like, we didn't and, know and, up until we got the the bowl scribey thing that the moon was going to have anything to do. Like in in game, the characters couldn't have known it was going to do anything to help these people, right? 
I think it, I think they did. I think they knew that though, like it was harming their land to be in a, like a constant stasis of nighttime. I think there was some implication that like it was hurting the world to like not have daylight, right? Again, that's another weird thing. It's like Kratos would be like, "Well, that's too bad. I'm here to help Freya. I'm gonna go help Freya's been kidnapped. I'm gonna go help him." But maybe, so, yeah, yeah, Jill. It's a question I like have a big time actually because like the I feel like this is a big part of the mythology, right? Yeah, and like yeah. it was part of the like the moon thing was like called out from the beginning as being part of the prophecy, right? And yeah. so to me, I was like reading this like, oh, okay, so this is just happening because it's part of the prophecy. It like needs to happen. Yeah, it seemed like it was one of the only times in the game where they're like, okay, the mythology says this, so we have to have something involving this. So we're just gonna make them go on this mission. Well, it kind of seemed like that. Yeah, Twitch chat is correcting us on a couple things. Uh, first of all, okay. it's Fenrir. That eats yeah, the arm of Tyr. Yes, Tyr. please forgive yeah. me. Please forgive me. Um, also, they're saying that it's uh, Hildzvini, who is the the boar guy. That it's him being, saying, "You owe me. You owe me for shooting me. I need you to lead. I need to lead you on this chunk of the quest." We f we carried you all the way back to a witch in the woods we didn't know about. We're even. <laughs> I also feel like I don't know that. Calm like down. I, I guess it's like fair, but also I feel like that 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 doesn't necessarily resonate with me as a player of like yeah, I guess I'll hill this Vini for this. I, right. I feel like the, the entire reason that I'm there, it, it feels like we need to do Freya a solid. We need to kind of yeah slowly like she's come around on us, so I feel like we need to like. We need to make sure that she's taken care of before she kind of lines up with us and says like, okay, now we can all together. Like I'm here for Freya. I'm not. I don't necessarily am like too connected to to Freya or anyone else here. And then it, and this is like when it also introduces like here's two new characters to take care about. And I don't know who these people are. <laughs> I guess they're nice. I I don't hate them, but it's like these are probably the two weakest characters in this game. Yeah, I think so. Uh, Rory Sublet says, if, quote, recover the stolen moon isn't one of the best all-time game objectives, I don't know what is. Carrots and sticks, man. Carrots on sticks. I hear you. As a sentence, that's awesome. I just think yeah. it, it didn't hit me as much as it, it should have in this section. Um, yeah, so to me, it's, it is. It, I think what we're ta talking about here is like uh, the pacing of escalation. This would yes. be a cool little adventure to go on earlier on in the game. Yep. I think a lot of Anaheim is like that, but it's just like where we're at right now, the stakes so high, you know, we have this mysterious green mask. Loki has met Odin. It's like, it feels so late to do this of Anaheim stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it's kind of like the difference between like, this would have been a, a really kick-ass side quest, but I think putting it where it is in part of the mainline quest. And I think maybe they needed it for like, almost to just say like, we need a surprise Heimdall moment. And like, this is how we're going to do it. Uh, it, it feels a little bit underwhelming as a main story quest, but I think if like this was like, just like, hey, like you can just figure that you can find this random thing to like help recover the moon, I think it would have been really cool to just discover that versus it being kind of foisted upon you in at this particular moment. Yeah. On uh, the other hand, though, I do just want to point out that shooting this shooting this guy and then having this guy split in half. It's amazing. And see the Very wolves good. like. Such a good visual, like one of probably my favorite visuals in the whole game. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But then you see it 20 more times. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool every time. Uh, it's cool every time. Lucen says, I can't believe the trailers show the day change cinematic with Skull and Hottie. Not to mention the double Valkyrie fight and atmosphere, atmosphere of the spark of the world. I remember Ooh, that's watching. A nasty one. I remember watching the trailer and thinking, if they showed this, what are they holding back? But I feel like those were the best bits of their respective quests, and I can't help but be disappointed these late game moments were spoiled. I hear you. I still think marketing for this game is better. Nine, seven, five out of ten. I think they did such an amazing job with just restraint and did not show that much. That having one cool shot of the day-night cycle change, I think that's worth it. And the stuff about the spark of the world. I remember there was some cosmic thing, but even after seeing that trailer so many times, I wasn't counting down the seconds till we got to cosmic yeah, areas. So I, it, I think it's, it's like one of those non-spoilers where it's like, yeah, you don't know, you have. You don't have any idea for the context of this. You yeah. don't know if this is like the first hour of the game. It's like, yes, it, it is a spoiler once you get to it. You realize it's a spoiler one after you've been spoiled on it, uh, of like mm -hmm. once after you've seen it in game. But like, I think seeing it in a trailer, it's not, it doesn't feel like, oh, you fight two Valkyries in like some weird mystical zone. You don't even know what that zone is. That could right. be like a thing right outside of your house for all you know. <laughs> but it's, I mean, that moment in the trailer hit me harder than it did in the game. Yes. The, the moons or, or which one? The moon thing. Yep. Yeah. The moon thing. Yep. I'm totally with you. I, I figured like, oh man, that must be, there must be so much leading up to that moment in the game. And that must be like, they really have to just struggle with this decision or something yeah. like that. And they're like, no, nah, just go shoot, 
shoot an arrow. Like Loki just instinctively knew to shoot an arrow at it too. It's like, <laughs> well, I mean, I guess it's because they saw the prophecy, right? And they they yeah. worked through all that stuff. But yeah, I totally. It felt like in the trailer, like, oh man, this is kind of phase one of blowing the horn. And I guess it kind yeah. of is for like once you start this, Ragnarok's a coming. But it just didn't really feel like that in that section. Um, Garrett Hullfish writes in with the important stuff and says, please tell me I'm not the only one. Along the dam in the jungle section of Vanaheim are all these lit torches, except for two right next to each other. My yeah. Zelda brain kept trying to light those torches in the hope of unlocking a collectible or secret, and sadly I could never get them to light. Sorry, yeah, Garrett. That, that was basically me in the Alfheim section of like every every purple stone has to be yeah. a puzzle so i totally under I, I i think i totally just must have missed those torches but it i definitely feel you there yeah uh the uh there's also this section that i thought was interesting where you have what you're carrying Freyr and you're running through vanaheim and it's like a big action set piece again where you're like hitting r1 and r2 it's kind of like you're on the motorcycle in final fantasy 7 and like the wolves and animals are like running up on the side of you as it's like this big action set piece it also kind of feels like that part in the last of us part 2 with like the burning village where it's kind of just just sprinting through an environment as our big climactic action thing but that also one that didn't really land that hard for me it was it was cool and then you get on the flying boat and you fly around um thoughts on Ferris flying boat I think it's cool. Very it's, cool. Very cool. It's almost another thing of like, could, couldn't you have just used this to like fast travel everywhere? Like, I, I thought it was going to be a big thing. Was be that of like, oh, now you can immediately fast travel to any, Same. like any like a uh, gate, basically. I, saw, I was sure I just unlocked fast travel. I was so excited. Yep, especially when you get to keep it. Like, but there's not really a big use for it. It's not even. I don't. As far as I know, it's not even a mechanic in the game. Where I'm like, oh, no. this section you can use. To, you can cross this section now. Now that you have the boat, you can cross these specific sections. It's like you use it one time. Yeah, yeah. I used it once and then never again. Yeah, that is really odd. Um, also, this section. God, hang on. Am I sounding too negative? I, I love this game. Just to be clear, I yeah. love this game. Uh, I think it's that problem too of like everything. Like the game is so good. That it's like we can't go over and over again. Like it's it looks fantastic. The <laughs> set pieces are really amazing. Yeah. The amount of detail and everything. Um, I didn't care about Bear Gear's death. Yep, I'm totally with you. The guy who was like, "I will sacrifice myself." Uh, that entire section, I was like, "Who? Should yeah. I know this guy? Should I have talked to him more around the fire or something?" I, I see ya, <laughs> dude. All right, bye. Thank you. For Thanks for hanging out. Swiver. And, th and yeah. then it's like, oh, I guess rescuing him must be a big thing, right? And it's, and it's not even like that no. quest is not even like top five most memorable quests, which you would think it would be, considering it's like one of the quests where it's not like, go get these four things for this dead person, right? And <laughs> it feels like it's on that tier, even. I thought, uh, also in that arena, I thought that like right at the very start of the section, right after the last section ended, uh, there's that quest where it's like, find Durlin's hammer. Uh, I thought that was going to be a big thing because it feels like Durlin should be a big character the way they were setting him up. Like, this is one of those quests that's going to unfold and un unveil some whole new arena of this game. And then it's like, no, you just kind of just find his hammer and that's about it. I kind of thought that same way. Okay, good. I'm glad you're with me, Kyle. No, he just says thank you. Yeah, hey. okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. <laughs> um, yeah, that same thing with uh, the big sword guys. It's like, okay. And then he just kind of goes through. He says he survived it by landing on his shield. Or he rolled is what he said. He rolled. He said I yeah. rolled. He did, he did parkour. Right, yep. right, right. Which, you know what? I guess we survived it. We're fine. Uh, John Skavik says, I want to get off Mr. Vanaheim's wild ride. I assume that's the, the flying boat section that you're talking yeah. about. Where it's like slowly descending. I mean, it is weird how often this game kind of harkens back to a Disney ride. So. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, see, I thought of like Super Mario 64, that last world where you're on the, oh, yeah. on oh, the oh, rainbow, that section. rainbow course. Yep, yep, totally. Um, but yeah, it, it's on that boat where the first, I think it was the first line in this game to maybe go like, oh. Because I think the writing is top tier. Unbelievable, so, the entire thing. But it's it's when they're flying in the boat and Atreus is like, it's flying? And then he looks at Freya who kind of has a dour expression. He's like, I knew it would do that. And then like right after that, there's a moment too where Freya, he sees the dragon. So he goes, uh, little help? I was like, suddenly this feels like a cheesy movie from 2003. I don't exactly understand this pivot. Yeah, it's like uh, this weird, like DreamWorks esque, like yeah. dialogue going on. It, it's yeah. It, help. It, Kyle, he says a uh, little help. He says a oh, little help. It's it's when the dragons are already attacking. Yeah. And the camera's like moving around. It's and no good. I think it's probably when the focus, the camera changes to big sword guy. I think is maybe when you hear, you don't see him hear, say that. Okay. Line. You just hear him say that. Line, <laughs> okay. Right? Thank it's you so for it. It could be. It, yeah. It's but it, the, the, this idea that they're all like getting attacked by like a bunch of 
wyverns uh while they're on like a, this boat and like they're all helpless until this one guy who's just walking around <laughs> makes one leap and then they're safe again it's that was weird it, it is it's it's a weird section i think if we had to describe it uh overall it's weird it's, it's weird. kind it's, of weird maybe not bad but definitely weird but i do like then when they give him the boat uh and then i think it's fair that says this to kratos where he's like hey sun yourself on the bow uh it looks like you could use it a little bit you know so there's, there's good <laughs> yeah. there's good little moments in this section yeah, as well and then, well, yeah, one of, I mean, people wrote in about it so much. It was one of the most mind-blowing parts of this entire game, I think, is just that idea of, God, how, what was leading you? Oh, yeah, it's like there's a dog barking in Vanaheim. And if you just follow the dog and follow those footprints, which feels like just a run-of-the-mill side quest, whatever. It does. Then that opens up this entire crater and kind of this mini open-world region within the game, which is gigantic, Uh it, tr- it just keeps going. It just keeps going. It just it just feels like, hey, yeah, you know, this game's got a pretty big budget, you know? Let's show you how just how big of a budget it can be. We can take one of the most ambitious pieces of design for the entire game and just put it off to the side. If you follow the darking bog... Darking bog? <laughs> Barking yep. dog, so be it. Follow if not, dog, no so big deal. It. It's just unbelievable that all this stuff was hiding in there. Um, I, um, I, I have a thought. I actually think that <laughs> whole... I think that whole thing was like designed earlier in the development and then like narratively it wasn't working out and they had to just make it all optional. I love that. So to me, there's no way the the sun and moon, like during the day, there's plants during the night. These boundaries are gone. Like, like that's such a cheap video game mechanic. Right. But like, I feel yeah. like that mechanic and the, them thinking that would be visually impressive every time. I feel like they worked on that early in this game's development. And then later on, it's just like, this doesn't fit anywhere. We have to just make this optional. I don't know. So in one of the interviews, Eric Williams talks about the entire idea for this crater section came from, is at some point in his life, I don't know if it was after they wrapped 2018's God of War, but apparently he went with his family to Africa and I uh, forget which country, but in some area in Africa, there is a crater where there's just like a real pocket little ecology and there's a bunch of unique animals and stuff in there. And once he was there, he's like, this needs to go in a future video game. And so yeah. and they, then the team started working on it and he told the narrative team to worry about it later. Well, I think so. The way he describes it is and it just is kind of bouncing back and forth with, I forget if this was on kind of funny or IGN, but he talks about it like, yeah, we set it out as kind of like a passion project within the team, which would imply that maybe it was a little bit later in development of like Got as it. a challenge of, can we make a little mini open world and test some open world design ideas within a God of War game? And the benefit of it all being that optional thing is if it doesn't work, we can cut it and it has no impact on the rest of the game structure. That's truly interesting. So that's a, that's a neat little pocket way to develop that. That's interesting. right. Right. So it's a pocket uh, game development wise and a pocket, uh, I guess, for the ecology of this entire area but i certainly felt like you know i i'm sure every developer is thinking about open world design and you can't ignore it in the industry and stuff but it kind of feels like eh, if they're t- are they testing some waters for if they want to take god of war into an open world direction would it work this feels like the the best test case for that so i don't know jill what do you think right. of this entire chunk i mean especially if the original plan for three games was still going on at that time yeah to have that content would have made sense. I think it wasn't. I think that was a pretty early decision, apparently, to make okay. it too. Yeah. Then no, I, yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. I don't know. I um, it's cool. It's yeah. One of those things that I was really sad because I basically, I, I I basically was like, I have I have to go finish the game. So it's not something I gotta yeah. dive into, you know. So. I, and I think even if I weren't trying to finish it for, you know, a uh, podcast, uh, like this is what, sort of what I love about indies and, and shorter indies, too, is just like, I just I want to see what your story is. I'm mm-hmm. tired at, at this point of sort of like going off and getting sidetracked. Like, I want to see the main point of it right now. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it feels like a good area to just go back to. And really, hey, you want to savor more about this game after you've wrapped up the story, go back to the crater yeah. and just hit everything up. Because a lot of it's going to be gear focused and there's really awesome stuff. Like, you know, you get to fight the big Crimson Dread Dragon and stuff like that. Like some of those fights are awesome, but I don't think you're going to be missing too much, really much at all narratively outside of the Lightning Bolt Ghost Quest where they kind of shed a little more light on that. Like when I was a kid, that would have been really cool because sure. I could basically only play one game a year. So I would need that kind of stuff. But like being in... 
a, a game fan right now, you're constantly in this state of like, I've got too much to play, especially as we're getting to the end of the year. I have so many games I have to check out for end of the year discussions. And I know even people who aren't in media feel that way as well. Yeah. And I'm wondering how much this is going to be missed. How much of this nobody's ever going to see because now they're like, okay, I rolled credits. I have to go on to the next thing. Yeah, it's, it's mangoes on the table, Kyle, as you once put in a beautiful analogy on delayed input. Yeah, I, I mean, on the table. That was your point. Yeah, you <laughs> said on the table. having more games in this era of uh, game releases is a mm. waiter in the middle of a meal that you're super full on yes, saying, "Hey, yes, yes. mangoes," and you say, "Yeah, put them over there, buddy." Like, <laughs> it's insane we... that you're telling me my analogy. That's, that's... <laughs> no, like throughout I... this, we should just make up things that Kyle. Has said <laughs> I would believe you. Too, yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, the yeah. flip is I compliment your analogies. You see how that system works here? It's a whole yeah. thing. <laughs> Oh, okay. So the Final Fantasy VII motorcycle thing was a good analogy. Oh, oh thank you so much. Thank you so much. Oh, my God. Thank you that so much. That was really good. That was really good. <sighs> Feels good. All right. Sorry. Surreal, Surreal you're going to say no, something. Yeah. So I actually, I, I feel like I played more of the game in this section than I did in the last section. Because I feel like last week I was super busy yeah. trying to get that essay out. Uh, and this week I, I was I was like on the other side of there of just like, I'm going to do one mainline quest every day. And then from the rest, it's like, I'm free to do whatever I want in this game. And so, like, I did end up doing most of everything in the game. Like, I'm, I'm pretty close to the Platinum at this point. So, wow. like, nice. And so, I, so I did a lot of that stuff. And, I like, on one hand, I totally agree with the idea of, like, finding this section, I think, is, like, one of the biggest surprises in the game. But I feel like the effect that that has, I feel like it wants to say, like, here's an open world game where you can do whatever. And it feels more like, like, a very limiting, almost, like, Metroid Dread-ish, like, kind of, like, okay, it's technically a square, but you have to path it in a very specific way, where it's, like, I, like, when going into the section, I wanted to just do specific things, right? And it's not an open world game in that, like, you just, you know, set your waypoint and go. You have to unlock every part of this area yeah. in a very specific order, and there's a lot of, like, the, you know, doing a lot of the day-night cycles, and... Like, the more I played of it, the less I liked it because it's just like, oh, cool, you get to fight a dragon here. And it's like, oh, th those are, you basically fight that boss four times is basically what ends up happening. And a lot of it is like, oh, you get, you have to fight another phantom. You have to, or I guess, like, I don't know if you, if the first phantom is optional, but like, you fight that, the, the stag, like the, the Minotaur lady again. And like, it, it's a lot of like, here's, here's a lot of content if you want to do more of this. Yeah. But I didn't find a ton of like, oh, this is like must see content in this, in this part of the world for me personally. It's very interesting. It makes way more sense now, actually, Ben, after you talked talk to us about that interview, that it was just like, yeah, we, I mean, we just tucked this aside. It's completely like, it's good to know this is completely optional and it makes right. me like appreciate it more. You know, I get it. I get it better now. Yeah. Uh, Drake Heinhorst says, the moment that really encapsulated the surprising scale of this game for me is when I discovered the crater in Vanaheim. Suddenly, this realm that I thought I had fully explored doubled in size. Dragon battles, backstory to Faye and Thor's battle, endgame materials to grind for, so much extra content in a game that is already packed to the brim. Uh, I did love, yeah, the, that wishing well of, like, finding that, oh, here's this crystal currency around, I'm going to collect those, and then you get some really good gear from just throwing that uh, into that wishing well. And I love... It looks cool, at least. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's all that really matters. But I love that line, too, where I think Mamir says something like, hey, how about we toss Atreus into this wishing well because uh, he is starting to smell. <laughs> and then Atreus is like, I am not. Dad, am I really starting to smell? And the Kratos just goes... It is natural. <laughs> and then they just kind of move on from there. <laughs> it's yeah, the, the implication is that like, Kratos doesn't? Like, because it feels like if anyone smells, it's Kratos. Well, like, I, think, ring on. I think teenage just boys are smelling more than most people. I think you kind of get mm -hmm. past that phase in life. We all Maybe the ashes on your skin are absorbing. It's kind of like a deodorant, like, a natural deodorant. Yeah, like an arm and hammer. <laughs> it's actually what it is. I turn my wife and kids into deodorant. <laughs> Uh, Tim O'Keefe says, throughout the game, I was wondering what Thor meant when he said the frozen frozen lightning was familiar, only to find another one in the crater and find out that Thor and Faye fought each other, destroying the whole area. It was interesting to hear more on her backstory and her similarities to Kratos, but I couldn't help but wonder if this is a sign of them being drawn to each other without really knowing each other's past, or a sign of Faye using Kratos if she did love him dearly. Yeah, that was interesting of just slowly uncovering through the ghost story that the reason this crater is in the state that it's in is because of this big battle between Faye and Thor. And throughout so much of that, Kratos is just saying like, I don't think Faye fought Thor. I think she would have told me about it. And then realizing, okay, she's got a lot of secrets after all. I, uh, it's still my, my head cannon. 
because I don't see love. We, going back to like the, right. those, the, the dreams, the You're dream sequences, it? I don't see the chemistry. I don't see love. So my headcanon is still Freya's theory that he was recruited to come and kill Odin. I like that. I like that. I love that theory. It's fun. It's fun to imagine. It makes her more interesting as a character, I think. Yeah, other than it just does, she was really yeah. strong. Yeah. I yeah, I think I was expecting more. I think overall for this section, and especially with Thor saying, like, oh, that looks familiar with the frozen lightning, I thought there was gonna be a lot more of the cyclical nature of the mythology tapping into this finale. And I think that kind of sums up some of my disappointment with where this game ended, I think. Um, and that idea of, oh no, it's just every time that uh, Leviathan met Mjolnir, it created this frozen lightning bolt. That's kind of, it's less cool than this idea of something that would be tying back around, but... Yormi is the only one who time traveled. Right, right. Yeah. And, and even right. Which I actually, for, I actually for, like, that's clean. It is, for, yeah. as, for as early as they put that line in and as much prominence as they give it, I feel like I, I was thinking the payoff would be a little bit more impactful than like, well, you could miss it, you know, like if, if you you have to do this one quest that tells you about it later on and it's kind of tucked away from the side. It feels like a weird kind of thread that I guess they do technically address, but it maybe not to the degree that you may, that you might expect from that initial kind of planting of the seed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Andy Wera says, uh, to me, the crater area, having the layout change after a side quest did a good job of tying you to healing this realm to the gameplay since you can now get to more areas. Um, I didn't get to that. So you can like make oh, the river flow again in this area. Yeah, so there's like yeah. there's basically a dam that you can unleash, and then that kind of floods the area, and that's you access boat travel, which lets which opens up a bunch of other areas. Okay, that's really cool. That's a, there's a lot of really cool ideas in this section. I think is the best mm -hmm. way to put it. Uh, go back to that line though. I was thinking yeah. about it right when we finally found that lightning, and what I really like about that is this idea that um, the writers aren't done. That to me, that implies that the writers are working constantly throughout the development of the game, because I don't believe that somebody wrote that line during the Thor fight thinking like, OK, and then later on, we can have another frozen lightning bolt in a right. completely optional area. That, you know what I mean? This is like people are still the writers are still working with the project and seeing it as it develops. And to me, that like it really adds more to everything. Everything feels real and everything feels like lived. Thor in that moment would say this and then somebody thought about like, hey, Thor would recognize this because we have the other lightning bolt over there. Right, right. I think, I think it's very impressive, yeah. honestly. Yeah, for sure. You could keep your narrative team in the loop the entire time. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Aaron Vasquez writes in and says, does Heimdall look extremely Pantheon Greek in his garb, attitude, and speaking? He seems to stick out like a sore thumb to me. Yeah. Yeah, he does. Bit, yeah. yeah. I like, think that's maybe intentional. Because I think they've done everything to make this character so annoying. So you want to hit him so yes. much. Yep. But the first time you see him up until you're sort of in that fight, not wanting to kill him. But the whole time I'm like, please give me an opportunity to kill this guy. I hate him so much. And like Kratos has already talked about how did he talk about it or did we talk about it? How like. <laughs> Uh, Norse mythology and all of this stuff going on in these games is so uh, opposite of all the Greek like opulence right. and splendor. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, so I think him being sort of the like triggering that memory for Kratos probably made it easier for him to kill. I think it was just yeah. a really good visual. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I was uh, during this entire section. I just kept thinking about. Heimdall and just how over the top dickish he was just so that you were eager to to trigger Ragnarok and really jump into the sucker um, but I was just thinking about that old phrase you know like well every villain's the hero in their own story I was like yeah okay if anybody ever tried to pull that thing with Heimdall that's just laughable because he is so over the top dickish but then in those interviews uh, with the game's director he kind of opened the door a little bit for me where he was saying that Heimdall's point of view is, I mean, he knows everybody's intentions. And after thousands of years of existing, however long he's been around, just knowing what everybody wants at all times, it'll turn you into just the darkest, most sour person who just hates every living being, every human, because if all you know is just how greedy everybody is and everybody's trying to claw their way and get different things, like that is what has turned him into this monster who's just immediately like, F you, F you. So they... they 
don't know if it's humanizing, but it made me understand a little bit more how somebody in this pretty subtle game can be that over the top with his taunting and everything. So I like that take. Yeah. And why he's so quickly bored too. Yeah, yes. I like that actually. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Semir, I got a question. Yes, please. I got a question. Sorry, please. I know you're about to hit a no, question. No, 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 no. Me, me, why does um why does the spear work on him? I was wondering the same thing. I thought I missed something. No, I mean apparently the only reason is I guess he didn't think about the fact that it would explode afterward. But that seems like a weird. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's like supposed to be too too overwhelming. Of like, yeah, he can see your intentions, but it, like the spear is like you know too like manifesting multiple spears and making them all explode. It feels like it's it's you can see it coming, but it's like you can't do anything to stop because it's too fast. I guess is the implication of like he 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 can't move fast enough to stop something like that. But even then, it's kind of fl- like it's like. Do- doesn't feel like it lands the way they want it to. No, and I, right. feel like- I was waiting for like the grand reveal. Yeah. Anime style, you know, like a, like a Jojo thing of like, oh, you thought, and then I thought, then you thought kind of thing. But no, it just like explodes and hurts them. Right. And they know that like we need to make this weapon because it'll take down Heimdall. And even then I was still confused. Like, okay, I missed something then. And then even during the fight, it's like, okay, no, yeah, it's just, it explodes. And even um, in <laughs> one of those interviews, Eric Williams talks about like the first punch where he's like, you made me bleed my own blood, you know, um, that I guess that punch that is with the ring on Curtis's hand that's dropped near that's like scraping him. So it's even the ring there is the thing that first does damage. But in terms of why that is, yeah, I, I'm with you. I'm a little yeah. confused it's overall just, about it. Like the nature of the ring is to constantly like multiply itself. So yeah, it's, 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 never it's one thing. yeah, it's an overwhelming amount of stimulus that I guess is supposed to confuse him, right? Like between like okay. all the spears and like the, you know, yeah, the, the ex- like the exploding tips and stuff is supposed to be overwhelming. I, I do love that he just... Th- I love that he calls it a stick a couple times. Like, oh, your little <laughs> stick? You're going to come attack me with that thing? Yeah. Oh, he's such a dick. All right. I'm going to stick with my last week theory then that, like, the concept was a spear that you can throw forever. And then how do we narratively justify it? Mm. I think they started with spear first and then worked backwards to justify it narratively. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, in, in one of those like interviews, that. they talked about how one of the ideas was that what was it that every time you threw a spear like the rings would keep multiplying and the rings would be like shrapnel on the ground and they would also explode and stuff but then I guess people on the team said that it was too much like Sonic the Hedgehog to have all these like rings like popping out all over the field at all times no such thing no such thing as too much like Sonic (laughs) I do really love about this spear though when you get like a finisher and there's a particular finisher where you like stab it disappears stab it disappears stab it disappears and yeah. it's just like that's genius for a spear cool. that you can always have regenerate yeah yeah I, I do love heimdall how dismissive is he he is even of like the axe when you throw it to him and he just kind of like brushes it away or i think like when you throw like the chains to him you're just kind of like eh, whatever like it's very mm-hmm. fun just to have a boss be that much of a dick he's riding around in this weird lion thing out of the gate uh, Samir Mukhashan writes in says lots of great bits during the Heimdall fight but what stood out to me was I instinctively mashed the square button and Heimdall responded by saying nobody is coming to help Queen Mistletoe yeah. is long gone it, what a great use of his intent power to know that you were hitting the square button that is a very cool idea for sure I did the same thing like I assume I have some companion around oh no I'm actually on my own here okay I'll be damned yeah. uh Johnny Magrippus writes in and says, Heimdall is my favorite fight in recent memory. And yes, I beat Melania. Melania? Anyways, uh, from Elden Ring, they really made us hate Heimdall while showing, uh, while also showing and telling that he is literally untouchable. Uh, Heimdall catching your spear uh, and showboating for you to explode it and get an opening is perfect. Heimdall ignoring the spears on the ground afterwards is a bit weak. Feels like you'd be able to get him by using the axe as a boomerang too. Well, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, Aaron T says, After killing Heimdall, I love the subtlety of Kratos trying to grab Galahorn off his body, but missing it the first time. I thought that tiny moment felt out of character for Kratos and really drove home out of control he was in that moment. It's a small little thing, but he reaches for the horn and kind of like misses and then goes for it again, which in That's one cool. of those interviews, Eric Williams says, was just a mistake that the actor did. At, at on the set and they said actually yeah, that, that looks good yeah you should keep yeah. it because instead of you just fumbling it kind of feels like him being t- so pissed he can't even pick up this galahorn which is cool um what did you all think about yeah him going full god of war three style vengeance and just beating his face to a bloody pulp in front of a mirror i was sort of surprised yeah like i really thought he'd kind of 
gotten past that. I don't think if he had gone full God of War, I think it would have been in the first fight with Odin, where Odin was not Odin, uh, Thor, where Thor was like uh, threatening his kid and saying what Odin was going to do to his kid. Like, I feel like that would have triggered it. But we already know that like Heimdall wasn't really a or do we know that? Like, did Kratos ever decide that Heimdall... Like, Kratos had decided that he wasn't going to kill Heimdall. That was a thing that he had already decided. Right. So Way for through him the fight. To, yeah, it just seemed like during... Like, yeah. He he walked away. He was like, I blow your arm up. The next thing I was expecting... I was expecting, like, a Game of Thrones moment where, like, you take out the eyes in some way. And then it's like the that one way, extra thing, yeah. Yeah, and then he, like is no longer powered and you get the horn anyway. And then that's the killing of Heimdall because he no longer has his powers. I was actually surprised to see him just straight up murder the dude. Yeah. And Evan Ramirez say, brother, this isn't who you want to be. Um, yeah. I, I almost feel like that this beat would have worked better before the Helheim section because it would have said like, oh, you have a very clear example of Kratos re- like regressing into his old ways without right. uh, Atreus, and then him kind of them having that conversation of like, you need to, re- you need to, I need to remind myself of you basically to to hold me back. Um, but I also see it as like him kind of returning to his old self, being like not necessarily a terrible thing of like, oh, in some cases like harnessing that ray like the panic that he, the panic line that he gives of like don't waste it harness it you know just make sure to use it appropriately this feels like the most justifiable use of his old rage which he wanted to like jettison completely but it i feel like this kind of gets across the point that it's like sometimes it's justifiable but it feels a little bit confusing after like they just had a conversation of like yeah i, I need to grow past this kind of you know regression right yeah yeah um I think during this entire section, I had a tough time tracking where Kratos was at and what he wanted and what he was flipping for. But that's, I feel like that's coming up a little bit later. Um, Sean Mills writes in, oh, hang on. I do like there's a line where Ramirez just says after this section where he says, I don't know if we're breaking fate or fate is breaking us. Uh, I love that. It was like, yeah, who's really it's after, the it's yeah, after the right murder? Yeah, right after the murder. Yeah. And sorry, yeah. I guess the boat stuff, I guess, was after uh, the murder and stuff. We ran the... Uh, through backwards, but you get the idea. Uh, Sean Mills writes in and says, I completed the side quest Lost Treasure after the second stopping point in which you help a ghost find his son. It turns out that the son and his father both died trying to protect the other one by going out uh, on their own to get a treasure. At the end, Mimir remarks that we certainly learned a lesson today. And then I immediately jump back into my suicide mission to kill Heimdall to save Atreus. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Lesson learned, Mimir. No questions asked. Uh, Nathan Freeman says, it seems like the entire scenario could have been avoided by Kratos and Atreus just going home and not following the prophecy. Was I the only one wondering why everyone in this section was just making colossally terrible decisions at all times? I think it's the point that the Norns are making is you are, this is who you are. Like Kratos is not the kind of person who can just sit in his cabin and let this happen, even if that's what he says he wants to do. You know, Atreus is not the sort of person who's just going to sit in the cabin and and let things continue on. So, like, it is just, it is flawed because they are flawed people. And so, like, it's kind of the story with, like, any mythological story where the people doing things uh, sets about their own demise and brings about the, the... the doom that they didn't want. Right. It is frustrating just because the characters are being frustrating, but it's not necessarily like bad storytelling. Yeah. And the fact that they're so aware of it and even mention those old myths and the Greek myths and stuff in this game, talking about that kind of self-fulfilling prophecy thing. They're, they're very aware of what they're playing around with. Mm-hmm. What's really funny is uh, at this point, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I was thinking, well played Odin. I was, right. I still believed in Odin's schemes. Right. And so when when he had Heimdall there to bring the dumb little moon holder there from hell, I was like, "Oh, Odin, this is all genius." Like Odin's Odin's like this Heimdall dying is part of Odin's plan. I was like I was like so convinced of everything. <laughs> but no, you're you're right. It's just it's just people being the people who they are. Yeah. Uh, you know, if if Spider-Man's friend is in trouble. He'll go save his friend. It's the same. You know, it's like, it's yeah. going to happen. Um, so then you go back to Sindri's cabin and they're like, oh, you killed Heimdall. It's a cabin you, now? 
I'm sorry, whatever it is, his, his treehouse. <laughs> treehouse. <laughs> yeah. Um, everything in, in the arena of Norse mythology, I think, is technically a cabin, officially. Yeah. But, um, but uh, yeah, then Brock says, well, you have Galahorn. He says, like, happy Ragnarok, everybody. Let's drink. I love that line. Yeah, it's yeah. very good. <laughs> and then they, this is the scene that you talked about earlier, Kyle. This is really where I was confused, where it's like, okay, well, what's our plan? And Atreus is like, I think I need to go back to Asgard. Mm-hmm. I need to go to Odin. And then Kratos is like, absolutely not. Go back. Are you out of your mind? But then Atreus just asks everybody and everybody around the table, like Mimir and Freya and obviously Tyr, everyone's like, good idea. It's the only way. It's truly the only way. Yeah, and they're this, all like, strategically, this makes sense. And it's yeah, like, it, who are you trying to, are you trying to convince me, the audience? I'm not convinced. <laughs> I am extremely unconvinced. And Mimir is even like, oh, this way we can keep our eye on Odin. We can, or like we can divide his attention is what he says. Yeah. And it, it is <laughs> like Tyr specifically has a line that's fun now in retrospect where he's like, oh, it's good because you can keep your eye on your enemy if you go there. It's like, okay, <laughs> got that. Um, but I was just dumbstruck, but like clearly this is when Kratos is going to slam his fist down and be like, are you out of your minds? I don't understand what the goal is here at all. Like I, Kratos just wants to keep Atreus safe. So he should just, go home again but it's that tough conflict of you can't have your protagonist in a game the entire time be as have his sole motivation be i want to just hang out in my cabin with my son like there needs to be some motivating factor and they need to move things along but later on atreus says something that makes a little more sense where he says like well i couldn't figure out how to stop ragnarok and bring the giants back without the knowledge of the green crack so i needed to go figure that out it's like, okay, that's something better than just... Don't question him going back. It's the whole crew suddenly being very cool with it. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, I sort of, like, obviously we get white tears cool with it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Freya is sort of, like, my only purpose in life right now is to kill Odin. And right. Ragnarok needs to happen. And if this is the way to do it, I kind of believe that she would be there to, like, push him uh, to doing this. I don't know what Mimir is kind of why Mimir's on board with this, no. but I kind of see Kratos because we are getting to that point where Kratos needs to see needs to see his son as uh, uh, growing, not full adult, but is is sort of like okay, I'm I'm here to let you walk your own path, and this is what you're gonna do, and so I might as well be uh supportive rather than pushing you away like I-, I was trying to think like if loki were anyone else if he was just some random like frayer character that walked in <laughs> unlovable and, frayer, and yeah. he's like i have an in i can i can be in the asgardian's like defenses i think we would all kind of be like yeah that's a good idea but since it's atreus we all kind of want to be protective of him that's interesting i like that point I, I'm sure they wouldn't mind if some random schmuck like Freyr went and died there, but I think also it'd be like, what What do you mean? We're dividing Odin's attention? Like, I think the point of that Tyr makes of like, look, we're already on his hit list. There, there's nothing else we can do. We might as well be as informed as possible going into it. Like, that's another thing. It's like, we can't, we can't go back and hide now because they said if more Aesir blood was going to be spilled, it's, it's game on. And so we're in the end game now, baby. Um, but yeah, there, there's something there, I think, of just why not. Yeah, I think I was also confused as to like, what what makes them think that like Odin would continue to like welcome him? Because it's like, right. I get yes. it that he may not be totally aware of everything, but it's like, I feel like, Heim, like Heimdall dying is like immediately cause for him to like close ranks and say like, okay, well, I need to be on the defensive and like, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. Heim, like Heimdall dies and then suddenly Loki's back and he's like, hey, you, you guys got anything going on? And like the idea that he would be like, ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess I do have this thing going on. Like right. it either, it, it is like maybe a push to like, well, he's that obsessive about the mask that he doesn't care. But it's like, even for that, like, I don't know that they necessarily clear that hurdle as well as I would have liked. Yeah, and I do love that it's immediate right when you open the door to his hall. Odin just immediately goes, Heimdall is dead. Happen to know anything about that? Like, he does not waste any time. He's just immediately like, okay, this has happened. Now I'm going to watch you squirm as the worst liar on the planet for a little bit. Um, But before that, you are Atreus again, and you go back to the cabin, and there is dialogue with the wolves there. Um, And then you also talk to Anger Boda um, again in this section. And this was... I was kind of confused with that, but you see Fenrir at the at the house and everything, which is nice. But 
he asks Anger Boda, like, how did you know where I was? And she holds up, like, the Loki marble. Did I miss that? Like, you, can you track people through that marble? or? No, there was nothing about that. Okay. So I think that was a weird thing just to show just to show us there is a loki marble but that didn't come back later in the game i don't think i think right she's on a marble quest and i guess there was just one in midgard for loki which is already crazy that's already very crazy that is weird mm-hmm. yeah i think she hands it to him at the end of the game she hands him what? one marble so i is assume it it's that, that one. marble that they put odin in no that one's like, gone because jumping... it can't be odin's because odin isn't a giant well hang on i mean the that marble's shattered right that marble doesn't exist anymore yeah but no. which which marble did they put odin in like what oh was the i name see of i see i'm sorry um yeah that's a good question so maybe that, wild if that was yeah maybe it's that one well so they wanted to show you the like ultimate this is how we're gonna get rid of him and you guys yeah. don't know yeah, it yet i guess so it is the same color joe i'll buy your theory i think yeah. i think they put I think, him in the loki marble i think that's right but then yeah, but then even after oh, that, happens. like post-game style stuff is when Atreus heads off, she hands him one more marble, it looks like, in kind of the final, oh. final exchange there. I think that's what's going on. Yeah, it says, uh, like, the the subtext says, like, oh, you can't tell what they're saying. And mm. she gives him something. Okay, but. gotcha. Oh, so it's like inaudible? That's funny. Yeah. Okay. A lost in translation, if you will. Yeah, good. Good oh, reference. Okay. Good reference. Yeah, no, uh, I'll, <sighs> breathe, everybody. Breathe. I don't know if we breathe. should be enabling him. Like, no, the everybody Patreon. likes it. Everybody likes it. Everybody <laughs> loves it. Uh, let's see. So yeah, you go back to Asgard, uh, and then this is where you know he, Odin calls the young man a lot, which is very fun. Uh, he's still chummy, chummy enough because he still wants to get to the core of this mass stuff. Sometimes son. Sometimes he says yeah. son. Yep, he just mm-hmm. pulls out the full son, uh, and then he's like, "All right, you gotta go uh, recruit Thor." Uh, so go get him out of the mead hall. Uh, and Jordan Kirk writes in and says, the subtext surrounding uh, may have been pretty sad, but I thought the bar fight was a ton of fun with Thor. Kicking off uh, kicking off of all ways by Thor calling Atreus boy and finishing off with Thor drunkenly saying uh, a good fight to which through degrees. She's not mad, she's just disappointed. Uh, what do you all think about this entire bar fight Thor section here? The subcontext of like dealing with having a drunken parent yeah is surprisingly like heart-wrenching because it's like they didn't have to go there it could have been like oh dad you're drunk like they really do draw from the trauma that that inflicts upon a family to have someone who is lost in addiction and it's just like oh that hurts and it doesn't need to hit that hard and they went there and i really appreciate it um but the scene itself i had a lot of fun with it was sort of a like on rails action piece but i was like okay this is kind of silly and fun and just a moment of like in a game that's been very serious and very um weighty and having a lot of big consequences just to like have your weapons down and i'm like I guess I'm going to start a bar fight in Valhalla. That's yeah. cool. Yeah, a change of pace is always that. nice. That, that That's true for sure. It did kind of, you know, it is a tough line to walk, I think, to have this scene. And obviously it, it culminates in kind of the emotional discussion between Thor and Throod outside and whatnot. Um, but to always have that line of like, is it fun that Thor is a drunk or is it just always a full on bummer? I mean, le- later on, even when you're running around the environments with Thor and he's like, give me a second. And he runs off to the side and like has a big puking animation. I was like, is this supposed to be fun or sad right now? Or is that just... I truly guess... wondered the same thing. Okay, good. Thank I you so much. I think sad because of Atreus' response. Yeah. yeah. I think he responds in like a very genuine, sympathetic way. Right. But yeah, it does seem like it's played for laughs. And it's like, maybe not now. Because I think that scene was performed so powerfully. I think it's the first time any character says I love you to another in the script. Mm. Like that was... That hit so hard. She says, you know, me and mom are here for you. I right. love you. And like just hearing of that... And the the performance capture and everything like that, they really did hit hard. And then the, the joke immediately after is Thor snaps his finger and the, the hammer comes through the wall. And yeah. it's like, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, I'm okay with like a, like a brief point of levity right there immediately after it. But yeah, yeah. the puking's not funny. <laughs> yeah, I, I think... I, I was of a different mind of the puking scene. <laughs> I didn't think it was played for laughs. I was yeah. sort of like, he's not capable of even doing anything because right. he is so sure. off. But I think, yeah, we're starting to kind of, I mean, that was just, that whole section was him bonding with Atreus. I think it was less, 
eh, maybe about focusing on his alcoholism. But I guess that's kind of overwhelming for that entire section, so they can't pivot away that that quickly. The bonding thing was really cool too, yeah. because like obviously in the mythology they should be brothers. Mm, okay. So the fact that they're like, yeah, I guess we share similar life experiences having a very <laughs> similar dad. I was like, oh, this is very cool. This is a cool way to connect them. I didn't yeah. even think about that. That's interesting. Yeah, and I do like Thor in that section where he's like, I have no interest in bonding over shared blood. But he's just trying everything he can to try and connect them a little bit more. And I think it ultimately works. But yeah, talking about like just that, that messaging balance of Thor being drunk and it being sad I think it's another reason that kind of Freya rubbed me the wrong way is like this entire section before and also afterwards you see Freya like, hey, let's toss it up. Let's drink, which is a weird note to hit on right after this. But even that section before when he was like medicated by Freya and kind of the big joke was that he was kind of high on medication or drugs, but kind of was just like acting drunk for a comedic effect of that entire section to have these two things right next to each other. It also was just like, God, now I really yeah, don't I like that, that guy. There's also <laughs> that section... I think it's when you go into the library, but I can't remember when you're talking with Freya and she's like talking about when he first learned how to travel different realms. And like when he traveled, he was traveling, you know, like the implication being like he was super high anytime oh, that he okay. was going through. So they're trying so, to walk that line of like drugs are funny and Freya is funny, but alcohol is bad because Thor's drinking. Yeah. Unless, like addiction is bad. Right. Right. And I think they were just kind of falling back on a, this is a fun, loving character. and Yeah, yeah, it, it's a tough one to walk. Um, uh, Christopher Reardon uh, writes in, uh, says, Who among us expected the recovery plotline for Thor? In retrospect, when Odin tells him, you're no fun anymore at the start of the game, it's because Thor doesn't drink anymore, which is like, yeah, that's, that's, that's so sad. devastating. That is so brutal. And he rubs it on uh, Mjolnir. That makes more sense now. Oh, he takes the mead out of he like remember that he like t- tips oh, his fingers in the mead and rubs it on Mjolnir. Oh, that's really good. Although now it's extra weird that I guess if he's like in recovery, but then he offers the the mead to Atreus. Is he trying to like damn his life a little bit or how's that working? Yeah. Uh, uh, the line from through to I really enjoyed and I, I, like that whole moment. I I can't praise enough for yeah. how much was going on. That that line that you talked about where it's like we're here your your wife and your daughter we love you was in a uh, contrast to his father being yeah. horrible it's like how are we not enough there are two people who love you dearly and one person who's like really horrible to you so why are you giving up two people who really love you for the one person who really hates you and that sets up a lot of the dynamics that go on in the final kind of battle yeah i forget when it is but when you walk into Odin's room at some point and he's yelling at Thor and he says like I can explain this to you but I can't understand it for you like that level of just super condescending stuff Mm -hmm. Uh, Charles says I could talk about Thor in a bar fight but I really just want to know why the cut on his belly won't heal yeah because that's the one that uh, Kratos gave to him yeah and even later on they they cut again yeah it's like they're they're obsessed with cutting up that belly Uh, Frankie Rough Knight says, I just want to say that I love the characters of Throod and Sif. Uh, Sif always scared me away with her fierce beauty and antagonizing demeanor, and Throod enthralled me with her ambition and courageous manner. Yeah, what do you think of Sif throughout this game? Uh, For me, one of the most uh, upsetting things of this game that we did not see was Sif getting her hair cut off by Loki. (laughs) You really wanted that I wanted to see it so bad. Every time I saw her, like, giant lock, I'm like, come on, just chop it. It's going to be a tough but. thing for the physics, but we need to see it. And they, they're next to each other enough where you would think something could happen, even like in that hell scene where she comes um, and tries to explain. Oh, I, I did. I thought that was a fascinating scene where she comes and is explaining to Thor that like, hey, Odin doesn't care about you. Like Heimdall's dead. He is not protecting us, Thor. And Thor immediately is like, all right, F you, Atreus. Like, he still won't attack Odin. He still is like, all right, somebody must be to blame. It's clearly Atreus who's at fault for all of these problems within my family right now. Um, I like that scene, too, where you're in... You're just walking around in Asgard, and you're in Thor and Sif's room, and Atreus is like, God, I can't wait to get home and tell people that I'm actually standing around in Thor and Sif's room. And he's like, on second thought, why am I just standing around in Thor and Sif's room? Mm-hmm. Cool uh, room, though. It is a great room. Yeah. 
Uh, Hamza R says, as Thor escorts Atreus through Niflheim for the final mask piece, Thor seems to warm up to Atreus. Both Thor and Atreus seem to understand each other a bit more by the end of the level. Then Odin shows up, says a few, few words, and Thor seems to do a 180. I felt like most of the writing flowed really well through the game, but this part fell off. Felt off to me. Did anyone else feel that way? I think it is no, just. No. Yeah, I, 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 I think it. It, it does symbolize this kind of conflict between like yeah. this man yeah. has manipulated me and it also holds this power over me just like by being my father, but and also being abusive. But like it, it does it like it allows them to oscillate a little bit and move him more towards like his turn at the end. Yeah. Um. But it's like I think it's totally understandable. That, like the second you know like the authority figure returns, you're kind of like it, it shows where your allegiances are, even if you're being pursued like persuaded to the other side yeah uh leviathan 765 says um well maybe we should maybe we should save that a little bit uh nick says uh, i believe this game does a great job showing family trauma between odin and kratos's family odin using violence and talking down uh to raise thor which used alcohol as an escape which he continued to use on raising modi and magni with violence with kratos uh where he learned that the way he was raised as a Spartan and having an absentee father like Zeus was probably not great. This is just scratching the surface surface on both of these extreme family dynamics. Yeah, to connect those with kind of the overwhelming father, distant father type of thing. Yeah, I guess that's another way for Kratos and Thor to theoretically bond, which I guess they do a little bit by the end of this game. They have a little bit of a, a moment. One of the bigger themes kind of going on in the background of like, family drama and trauma and how multi-generational trauma and how you deal with that and breaking the cycle where Kratos is really trying to break the cycle, but he keeps like falling into bad traps. Whereas uh, Thor is also trying to break the cycle in his own way by not drinking, but is not, has not identified that he is in an abusive place and needs to break a cycle. He just thinks like, if I stop drinking, that will, make everything better so it's like a very interesting psychological dive into how families continue to have problems down generational lines and hopefully the hope for their children in the future uh thing kind of ties into that too and hopefully both of the kids go off and are better actually there is generational trauma too back with angraboda's family as well so mm. it all kind of ties together in all of the like the children characters yeah That's yeah interesting that is amazing they're, they're tackling such a such a big concept i like here. it is handled so responsibly too it's never yeah. easy right like with the grandmother it's never like oh i'm okay now i love you you know what i mean right. it's not at all that it's, it's even at the end you get a hint that it's like yeah we're working on it you know yeah. it's like it's this is not a one-step process so I, yeah i really love that actually yeah absolutely um so then thor is gonna attack atreus and he pops the little uh one popper deal that sindri gives him and then he has the line where he says, Sindri, you sure know how to plan an exit. Uh, and then he's back, uh, which was another line I wasn't crazy about. But then you're back uh, at uh, the house, or at least on the Bifrost with Kratos. And then he has the mask. He has the mask with him, which is amazing. He was able to make that escape while actually holding that thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then one of the biggest scenes in the game happens where they're all talking about what to do with this mask. And Tyr's like, hey, how about you uh, go ahead and give me that thing? Uh, let's really plan this, because I could actually get to Asgard right now, and we should probably go right now. Um, and everyone's like, great. You've been holding out on a way to get to Asgard? That's totally fair. And they start to walk away, and then Brock says, slow down, you damn spruce. Talking to Tyr. Love that line. It is really good. Right. Um, and then what happens, Kyle? Walk us through it, man. Okay, so Brock's the dumb dumb of the group right he was also the only one emotionally aware that's like oh yeah that's something is wrong here why is he calling him loki yep so he is accusatory he so he does say slow down but then it turns out obviously that that tear we all saw this coming was actually <laughs> mm. odin in disguise <laughs> the whole time the whole time uh yeah isolated reverie says uh the nature of a thing is more important than the form of the, th of the thing uh fitting that brock was the only one to see tears true nature and not be fooled by his form but how yeah. are they all tricked by such a bad plan um I, what was your first reaction kyle to this reveal it's tough there's yeah. you've seen this scene many times in movies and sometimes it's like oh 
Yes. Oh. And then here it's like, okay. You know what yeah. I mean? It didn't there, there's feel that like they were double really, check. Yeah, it, it didn't feel like they were really seeding it this whole time. Tyr up until that point is written as his own character entirely. He's There's like nothing suspicious about it. There's nothing you can go back and point to that's like, oh, this was actually him doing this. It's like him entirely acting as if this character would act, you know, and even yeah. more disappointing afterward. Now I'm like, OK, Odin knows everything now. He was a professional actor. He played the character perfectly. Now Odin knows exactly what they're going to do. So he's going to stop them at every step of their plan. But then like their whole plan worked anyway. So like it's to me, the, the twist, I almost feel like came late in the development of uh, the storyline. It, so I feel like they, they conceptualized Tyr being a party member and yes. being part of the story before they conceptualized what if it's actually Odin the whole time. That's exactly right. Uh, they did that according to the spoiler cast. I guess it was Eric Williams had that idea. It was unclear when it was, but he said that he talked mm -hmm. to the writers about like, yeah, what if Odin was Tyr the whole time? And they're like, uh, we'll see if that'll work. Actually, yeah, we think that's cool. We think it'll work. And then they planted a few seeds in there. But I my first reaction was like, Okay, so just like for the last little chunk. And then when Atreus was yeah. like, the whole time, I was like, wait a minute, what? That it, it didn't really work for me. He's quite tricky. I got that part. But so some of the hints in there is, I guess, like Tyr calls Freya Frigg when he first sees her, which Odin and all of the Aesir do throughout the game. There's mm -hmm. like in the room where you find Tyr, apparently there's like uh, Raven's feathers scattered around the room which is pretty small. There's small stuff that That's Eric, a cute one. I like that. Yeah. Eric Williams pointed out um, that, you know, there's stuff like uh, Tyr apparently is obsessed with Freya's room or he'll like go over and talk about Freya's room. It's like just like the idea of his ex. I guess he was extra fascinated in that. Um, so there's those types of small things. You know, we talked about some of them. There's the one where they see, where they go inside of the vision um, from the giants and stuff and they see Odin's death and Tyr does kind of step up being like, wait, what's this type of thing? So Odin doesn't know the whole truth. Um, but they are they are far on the subtle end of that spectrum. I feel like maybe they're just so scared of people guessing it that they're trying mm -hmm. to be so safe. There also is the big one, which is the first reveal trailer. I believe they have some line where they're like, Odin is very mysterious and very tricky and he's playing tricks with us all the time. And then the next line in the trailer is Atreus saying, maybe there's somebody who can help us, like talking about Tyr. So at least- They it, did that in the Bronx Tale trailers. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's pretty light. And again, I went back and I looked at, I looked at a compilation on YouTube of every Tyr scene just to try and pick out stuff. And it's yeah. like, this just feels like he's his own character who I really liked. <laughs> Right, yeah, like it's, think, of, it's, think of Odin like, I'm going to cook everyone's stew. Like, right. he's, he's that deep into this character, you know? Right. Yeah, it, it almost seems a little bit like this is where the scale of the storytelling kind of allows them to obfuscate a lot of it, where it's like, oh, well, how do you explain, like, you know, o like Odin and Tyr being in the same, like, or being in different locations at different times? So it's like, oh, maybe he can just, like, astral project or something, where it's like there are so many, like, fantastical justifications for like any any potential issue that you could rise that allows them to kind of get away with it but i feel like it it, it does feel a little bit too convenient in that like so, it's something like the raven's feathers it's like you kind of don't know if that's just a thing a tier thing right? right where it's like technically i guess maybe maybe i'm not as you know brushed up on norse mythology maybe like t uh, ra uh, like ravens are also uh, a tier thing or maybe some other kind of bird right? or the ravens so, like you know or they Odin visited the prison, yeah. which seems very logical, and then yeah. would warp back, and there'd be the feathers there for that. Um, yeah, and, and I think it, it almost... It, I, I don't think it works because it's like, we don't have any other reference for Tyr also. For it's yeah. not like, oh, he's acting... Like, if someone had said, like, if if a character had suspected or something, where it's like, oh, no, that seems odd. Like, it maybe would have given too much away, but the fact that there's nothing, like, the fact that Brock only, as, you know, right about he's, as he's about to reveal, is the only person who sees through it. It feels like, I guess if he wasn't acting 100% like Tyr, I feel like people would have noticed earlier. But then, you know, again, it speaks to like, oh, maybe like Odin's impersonation was just so good. It apparently was yeah, spot he, on. He killed an yeah. elf and like felt really bad about it and dragged it away. Like that was Odin. He's just like Oscar caliber <laughs> acting right there. <laughs> I think too, it would have had more of an impact on me if there had been more consequence to it because right. yeah. essentially it's like oh no he knew the plan all along but he still wasn't able if this was the like mm -hmm. 
rock bottom. Oh no, all of our plans are completely gone. Now we have to do something completely different. We can't use the spear. We can't use the yeah. horn. Like that. Then maybe it would have had more impact. Exactly. But yeah. it it's seemed really- like it was just a, a convenient moment to kill Brock. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's also not not totally clear like. I get it, it. It's hard to know, like, how much does the fact that I don't know, because it, it feels like after this, their whole thing is like, well, now I guess we have no choice but to follow the prophecy. Right. And then but like we don't necessarily know how that fits into Odin's plan because we're not totally clear on what Odin's plan is of like, well, now we're playing right into his hands. But then it's also kind of confusing because it's like, doesn't Odin want to stop Ragnarok from happening? How is this playing into his hand? Right. And I feel like that's also, yeah, another consequence of like, we're never totally sh- like he, I guess it's good in some sense that he never reveals his like mastermind plan in some like weird speech. But it also means that like, we don't know to what, like, we don't know how, like what the repercussions of him having been here the whole time. Yeah are right so it feels a little bit like it dulls the impact of that moment and so i I, let's so the whole thing to me felt a little bit like less like oh you know this is like this big shocking thing of just like wait now like it's like you start again double checking of like wait so what is what does that mean yes also it's just it's silly that in this room filled with the most powerful gods in the world it comes down to Odin holding Atreus with the knife to his throat, like, ah, like some back alley, you know, mugger or something. It's like, what is this? It just feels so bizarre. And, you know, uh, they pointed out, uh, Eric Williams said that it's like, oh, he stabbed him with the cooking knife because like Tyr would never hold a weapon. So it's the one thing he had was the knife that he was cooking with the entire time. It's like, okay, I guess that's kind of interesting. Um, Ramen Taco writes in and said, we said his cooking was good. That bastard. Also, on a lighter note, uh, just to derail from this tiered Odin stuff for a second, um, I read some runes on a wall, and Kratos just said, It will not. Upon reading his journal, I found out that the rune read, Valhalla will rise. <laughs> and I get, that got a nice giggle out of me, the fact that this go backwards with them. I, I almost feel, I wonder if, I think I might have read that after post, in the post game, and I think he does, it did not. So I wonder Ooh, if they have interesting. Reaction. Oh, I yeah, love that. Awesome. There's so much but writing in this game. game. Man. Yeah. Uh, Skylar Timmons says, here are uh, two fun facts I saw from the game's director and some spoiler casts. They hinted at the reveal of Odin in disguise all the way back in the dwarf world in the first part of the game. When you first enter the dwarf town right before the alarm is sounded, you see a dwarf spit over the edge of the bridge at you. And apparently that's Odin. And the idea is that that dwarf's model is also one that's in the prison in the post game in Niflheim. So everybody in that prison that was like a prison for the forms that Odin would take. Have you done this, yeah. Kyle? Sorry, I love this. This is like Hunter Hunter. If you have a crazy magical p- ability, it needs to have some sort of rules behind it. Okay. So I love that everyone he copies has to be alive. That's a cool rule. Yeah. Why is Odin spitting on you? What is it? Why? That's, that's, what is he doing that for? Just to. Why, why are we like pretending you? that makes sense? <laughs> that's that's the thing. It, it's just it's a cute little <laughs> something, but it's not an epiphany moment. I don't think. Um, well, we, the second you see that dwarf spit, you should have thought that's not the real tear. Then, I know where this is going. <laughs> Game if he had set spit match. like a raven feather, maybe we would have got it. <laughs> he's choking on a why, raven's why, feather. Why is he even doing that? Why is he, <laughs> like, is, is he that like? Why is he spitting at himself at this point? Wait, he's no, no, that was that was before you found tear. Before we rescued. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Technically, oh, technically, way technically. In. that's right. Uh, then also, apparently, when Kratos and the gang first meet tear, the captions specifically have the accent mark over the Y in tear. But when Tyr speaks, it doesn't have the accent mark in the subtitles, indicating that he's an imposter. When you meet the real Tyr after the game, the accent mark is present again. So that's another hidden detail that apparently he wasn't real, which again is like so subtle. Very like, subtle. My, my God, yeah, you guys. That could just as easily that been like, that's, yes. Uh, uh, that could have just as easily been a typo of like, you know, yeah. they, they were using their accent marks properly right. one time and then they just didn't do it on their keyboards. The but that, that's something. I think it's, well, it's consistent. It's good. Now I have a, a head cannon that uh, Odin just likes to head to dwarven inns and like drink as a dwarf, and it was complete coincidence that he was there at the time. Yeah, I like that. That more. makes more sense. Yeah. Um, the, the idea of finding the real tear at the end, I don't. I didn't hate this. I didn't hate the twist. I didn't hate all this stuff. But it was just, I'd prefer it didn't. Like I like that idea that 
Tyr was actually dead. Because that actually sure. does help fuel the idea that Odin could pull this off. Because when you talk about Tyr throughout this entire, entire game, people like Freya and Mimir, they're like, what? Tyr's dead? What are you talking about? Wait, he's actually alive? Like, they're confused about that. And now for it to be like, oh, no, no, he actually is alive in reality, too. And also, it kind of bummed me out. I know it's post game stuff, so how much lore can they pack in? But you find the real Tyr, and you have like a 30nd conversation with him and then you run away from he that shows, he shows up in other realms he does but it's there. still it's like a, a couple sentences here and there he's, as like, he's doing yoga yeah <laughs> yeah it, it doesn't feel like it's as big of a yeah a, a big of a thing as you maybe want it to be yeah well, it, i think it i think it is because he says kratos i remember that name maybe i'll remember why later yeah right so they're like they're really teasing at some you know stuff after this but yeah it it's weird. that's that, not even a cutscene. yeah it might be that he remembers because Tyr definitely went to Olympus at some point. He had the pot, right? Yeah. Oh, so okay. He, he probably remembers Kratos' name somewhere in there. I right. also, sure. I like being able to find the real Tyr. You like it? Just because, like... It's shocking, yeah. Yeah, I, I had kind of lived with this character for a long time, and even though he wasn't doing that much, I'm like, oh, he's, you know, cooking the food, being a little home treehouse god. <laughs> um... <laughs> And I was kind of sad that I was like, oh, he's not he's not here anymore. So I was kind of happy to to yeah. see him again. That he'll, he will exist on. Yeah, it is just that confusing thing. It feels a little bit like, you know, vision to white vision or something, I guess, like in Marvel. You know, it's just confusing to be like, OK, all this attachment I have to the character of Tyr. I guess I just need to transfer that one to one to the real tier, even though it doesn't really make sense. But yeah. it's just Odin was so good. That analogy. That. that one's excellent. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it feels a little weird because it's like, does he have that character development <laughs> or not, you know, of like, right. I guess he's kind of ends up in the same place anyway, but like, <laughs> it is the idea that he also had some degree of learn helplessness and then we kind of helped him overcome it. But I, yeah, it's, it's hard to know. Like, it feels like it obfuscates that a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but believe it or not, a lot of people love Brock. They had a tough time with this. Uh, Jiren writes in and says, Brock is a national treasure. He's the best written character in the game. Uh, the two lines that really stood out to me on Heimdall's death, he said, Heimdall was a prize-winning taint stain with a capital stank. <laughs> it's just good. And then after after Ramirez commenting on the Norns, the opinion of them three shut-in spinsters ain't worth a goat fart in a hurricane. What a legend. Rest in peace, says Juran. Yeah. What's he say? Or like in his death scene is great. It's just like, I forgives you for what you've done or something like that. Yeah. Oh God, I forget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Kevin Anderson says, I love how they treated Brock's death. In many games, characters move past deaths really quickly. I really liked how much it affected everybody, especially Sindri. It ruined his friendship with Atreus, and he lo no longer cares about the things he took very seriously in the past. Um, yeah, this is probably my favorite part of this final section was just Sindri's reaction and how much it just shattered him as a person. I thought that was a really bold move overall. Just like when he immediately like warps out of there. It's like, oh, okay, what is First this? First time you get to see it. Yeah. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah, it's kind of confusing at first, yeah. Um, Jonathan writes in and says, I absolutely love the heartbreaking moment of Brock's demise, his death being the ultimate reason Kratos is willing to go to war, and Sindri's character doing a complete 180. It was masterful. Seeing Sindri both serious and dirty hit me harder than I thought it would. Props to the voice actor. Their performance was incredible. Yeah, uh, that one hit me really hard, too, when we find him in the temple. And I'm looking at him, and I realize he's just covered in blood and dirt and muck. And I'm like... Oh, he's not okay. He's right. not him anymore. He's whatever this is. This is not Sindri. Well, Uncharted Wolf here says um, that he calls him punished Sindri. Uh, he okay. says Sindri doesn't come off as annoying and instead understandably angry and doesn't just go away immediately, but becomes a part. Oh, hang on. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll start again. He says, I faulted God of War 2018 for what I called the edgy Atreus section, where Atreus mm -hmm. becomes extremely confident after learning about his godhood. Well, it seems they learned from the mistakes because punished Sindri was executed much better. Sindri doesn't come off as annoying and instead understandably angry, and it doesn't just go away immediately, but becomes a part of Sindri's character development overall. Uh, Jacob Hubbard says that he thought that Sindri was a little heavy-handed, especially in that final sequence, in the um, funeral sequence, which I assume we all saw, right? So the, These are the the real credits. Yeah, the real credits thing. Um, he says, yeah. Odin clearly fooled everyone, and Sindri's resentment was a huge damper on an otherwise very exciting finale. I, I hear you, know. Jacob, like, I but I get I it. I feel like I totally understand his resentment, though. Like, the yeah. idea that, you know, that it, it, it's just like he's, he's seeing almost like all these other characters get kind of like their 
like having their arcs completed and saying like, well, now I'm back to where, you know, I, I've, I've improved as a person and for him to like have his turn at like, now you have to lose someone dear to you. And like, like Brock had, like he's, he's upset, may, like not necessarily justifiably so. In, um, but it, it makes sense for him to see, like, I don't think it's fair that Brock had to die for us to, for us to final for that to finally be the thing that, that brings everyone together. Like you, you can say like, like you can be mad at things and know that you're wrong and still like say like I still hold this like yeah in my chest and not like I know that maybe I'm wrong but I'm not ready to get over it like I'm not going to get over this say a person who was willing when his brother died the first time to go collect his soul to bring him back right like he would literally do anything to make sure his brother wasn't dead and now his brother's super dead like it well, is it, funny it, they didn't have to make him it. super dead but they went out of their way to make him super dead mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and like but i think even like the thing that drives it home more is that like even if there were a way to bring him back the fact that brock is like don't don't bring me back this time of like just let me go mm -hmm. uh, i i think that it can also compound like the pain of like not only is he dead for real this time but like you were almost wrong to bring him back the first time like the like all of that coming down on him at, like at the same time for something that he feels like he did right and then or, like yeah just the feeling of he did everything that he was supposed to and suffered more than anyone in the over the course of this game of just like, yeah. you know, like every, every everyone's obviously lost someone, but they are all getting their redemptive arcs for having made mistakes. And Sindri, like Brock's death feels like the thing where it's like it doesn't feel like comeuppance to, to Sindri. It feels like a thing that is was totally unfair and unfounded for him at, in that moment. Right. And to be fair to Odin, which I'm very interested in being, I, I do love that even Odin's like, hey. I didn't want this to happen. Like you forced me into the situation. <laughs> like I was just going to leave with the mask and the fact that he attacked, not attacked me, but he hold me up, held me up as the reason that he had to die. He could have, though. he could have, though. he could have, that's, that's a very, he could have come up with a lie and went to the bathroom with but, the mask. But I think but like, he's like <laughs> now, and then he just suddenly trans just starts stabbing and transforms. Like, that's right. What? But he does say, I forgot that he does say like, you know, I didn't want this to happen, but like, you know, it, fair is fair. You killed my son with Heimdall. Like, you know, yeah. it's like, what are you going to yeah. do? It's like, everyone's getting vengeance in their own way. I think that line very much rings similar to when Odin kills Thor. And mm -hmm. says like you guys made me do this. Right, yeah, like right, what you right. made me do is like mm -hmm. a pretty typical like. I think the th I thought the line. Thor murder yeah. was more evil than the than the Brock one, uh, but the uh, the the scene with Sindri right after the death where he's at the workshop, um, it's a big emotional scene. He's like, you just kept taking. Like I gave everything to you all, and you just didn't stop. You just kept taking and taking and taking until eventually you took my brother. Like that is. A brutal sentiment, and I love that idea of just like, yeah, these characters you don't think about, they're just going to keep helping me out for two games, whatever, it's all good. It's like, no, 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 like, that, mm -hmm. it's taking a lot from them. You're, you're actually not just getting these gifts for free. They are volunteering their time, at the very least, uh, to help out, let alone, I mean, their home throughout this game to just, yeah, have all these gods, some of whom we have a complicated history with, just walk right in our house, and it's like, they're... They are noticing, and now they are pissed. Um, or at least Sindri's pissed, because he's the only one left alive. I mean, that's a really good take on, on this, too, later. He was like, you know, he said that in grief, and he's not wrong. It's got to, like, even though it has the ring of truth to it, it's not entirely correct. Don't take it to heart. Because it's like, yeah. he is grieving. He is saying the thing that's on his mind that he wants, that poison that's in him he wants to get out. Uh, but I don't think that I mean, obviously we're setting up some, like, in the future there's going to be some animosity if these characters kind of cross paths again. Yeah. Um, but I also think it's a really cool way for the game makers to, uh, again, kind of comment on video games in general. Like you were saying, just the whole, like, video games are built on characters that are doing things and characters that are helping and the helping characters very rarely ask for anything in return. And mm -hmm. they're constantly like, you know, like the dwarves up until this point, you're like, here's the magic ring I've been protecting forever so that you can have a spear to do your thing. Like right. here's, you know, all this armor and all this help and all this magic. Here's the way to get out. If you have to throw, throw on the ground and say the magic word and you can get out of your troubles. It's like, why? Why? Why are they helping so much and not asking? They're not getting anything out of this. They're just getting hurt. And usually you don't look into that. But for here, it's like, yeah, there are real consequences. Yeah. So I it's think... not being video gamey in that sense. It's like evolving into actually having 3D 
characters. Yeah, in one of those interviews, Eric Williams said that the analogy the team used was that Sindri was the giving tree. And then by the end of the game, it's like, yeah, he has nothing. There we go. There's your story, everybody. That's the story of Sindri. And it's it's really beautiful. I I, I think it's an yeah. incredible move. I'm I'm curious as to like when when Corey made that told him like that Brock has to die. Yeah. Did he mention like what the reason behind him? Like I need Brock to die because of this or like this is a thing that I set up or like did he have a reason for it that? They just said because he's the family dog. And I think it was just like they need the catalyst to kind of jump into vengeance mode for Kratos and that was it, right? I'd ima- he didn't say that, but I'd imagine that's what I think it was. It was, which is funny because the audience is well motivated at that point. That's, yeah. that's, I think, it, you know what I mean? We're so, that's a moment we're supposed to be like, oh yeah, Odin, you're going down now in our minds as the audience. Right. But it's like, we are, we were already with you. Yeah, man. we didn't need to be convincing. <laughs> you know what? Yeah. Look, I know this is a complicated thing. I don't think I was there. I don't think I was ready to kill Odin. And I understand he's manipulative and he's a dick, but mm-hmm. I really think the game did a good job of always explaining things a little bit from his point of view and the fact that he's so nice to Atreus. Then even beyond that, I love there's that line where I think it's this entire sequence where Atreus just mentions quickly like, what, what, what? Like he could have poisoned us at any point. Like he's been feeding us the entire time. Mm-hmm. So again, they're still going out of the way to be like, is Odin all bad? He could have killed everybody. And I feel like it's, it's, I feel bad trying to defend Odin anyway, but I do think the game does a great job of setting up like, Incredibly crappy, manipulative, terrible father, terrible, terrible man, all this stuff. But for all around the corner, around the edges, he is checking the boxes that like he's not going out of his way to be too much of a dick if you haven't crossed him. You know, it's just if you're family, he'll be a dick to you at the dinner table. Is that right? <laughs> okay. Um, well, let's I am see. sort of sad that Kratos doesn't get killed because that would have been a really good motivator. Yeah. Yep. I agree. Uh, Beating Down Brian says, How mad do you think Odin was after he pieced out of the treehouse only to discover Kratos had no scope the mask out of his hand? Or do you think he just quietly said GG? I thought I thought he was like, I thought he was not even like GG. I thought he was like rubbing his chin saying my plan is going up perfectly according oh, to my plan. Oh, interesting. I was that sold on Odin as the genius, the tactical <laughs> genius where he was like, okay, now I have them right where I want them. But no, he just dropped the, he let the mask fall out of his hand. <laughs> he like one thing he wants more than anything. He's been alive right. for hundreds of years. He's never wanted anything more than this complete mask. Yeah. And then it's just like, oh. It, couldn't he make like a really small raven tornado just to fly right behind Atreus and just reach his hand out and just grab it real quick? There has to yeah. be some strategy for this, right? I really love how Kyle experienced this game on a real, like you were one of the characters level. By I was just in how such much, denial, yeah. Yeah, how much Odin is abusing you mentally right mm. now. <laughs> That's twisted. Uh, Steve Bellegarde writes in and says, The scene where Kratos and Atreus go hunting after Brock's death was where I finally decided I want Santa Monica to drop the one-shot camera thing going forward. They abandon everyone and return in less than 10 minutes? I wish we could have seen some cuts showing multiple days go by on their hunting trip. It felt so rushed, and while I love the mirroring of the first game, the execution felt awkward, ultimately. I think the mirroring was a little dorky. Yeah. Yeah. In which direction? The direction of deer. Those right. are lines from the, like, the last game. Directly you know what I mean? Right. Like, right. Yeah. But um, uh, I, th- I thought about that out a bunch. So you talked about it in the first song we recorded, Ben. Yeah. It's like um, this idea that you have to walk back home. Yes. And you never show that in movies because that's the boring part. You do up to this thing, the exciting thing happens, and then you like you film the people walking back home the whole way. Yes. But like the way this video game is, they kind of have to many, many times. Um, but uh, it's not. It's ten minutes to us, but not ten minutes to them. Like I, I feel like you know that time can be extrapolated a little bit in that case where it's like. Everybody needed a good long breather. That's interesting. So even though we literally saw every second, it's still like, I don't believe it. Emotionally, they needed more time here. It's like, uh, yeah, it's like, do you consider everything that happened in God of War to have happened over 24 hours? I do. Oh, all right. <laughs> oh, well, I guess, yeah, I, I, I guess like sleeping, well, it's not like, you know, when they have that dream with Faye, it's not like they took a three minute nap. So I guess that's a fair point. I also, I, I guess I, I disagree with the idea that like, the cuts I think at that point would have been preferable because it's like the whole point of the game is that you're seeing it through uh, Kratos's eyes and that like you know and then in this game Atreus is as well which I think works for what like I think at the end when you know Atreus disappears off screen and then like that is you know the metaphor for his like finally not no longer being Kratos's life I think it I think 
I, I don't know that cuts would have made it better because it, it gets to the idea of like Atreus is trying to escape. He is trying to like visually no longer be involved in this conflict. Yeah. And then you get to be away from that for a while and you see like why uh, like you you that entire section rings false because you know that there's that he is hiding and not necessarily actually doesn't actually want to go hunting, but he's using it as an escape mechanism uh, right. and like. And like it doesn't sit well with you the entire time, and Kratos eventually brings it up and says, "Like, no, we have, we have to go do the more difficult thing. Like, if this is we can't, we cannot retreat here, and for that, yeah. and they need to have that moment." It is very much the like grandma taking the the souls from people and like living in other people's happy memories. He was trying yeah. to like replicate that sort of thing, and I also really love Kratos and how he handles this with such sensitivity. Because I think there is, with the mirroring, it's kind of silly, but at the same time, it's the Kratos that was that Kratos in the beginning, where he's like, we are going to have deer. Like, <laughs> right. go, like that Kratos couldn't even hold his son on the shoulder to let him know, like, hey, everything's okay. Whereas the Kratos, who is now in the exact literal same moment, is like holding him, physically holding his son and saying, like, you know, I understand where you are. Your your feelings are valid, but also we need to do what we need to do. So let's go. And like that is right. such a turn for his character that I really liked this scene. It is an inversion of their previous relationship where like Atreus was like, I want to go out and see the world. I want to see what happens. And then Kratos was like the person who wanted to kind of stay in his lane. And then now the roles are flipped where Kratos sees it as like, OK, we're right now. The best thing, if I had prevented you from doing that, it would have been a whole thing and you would have gotten run away. And that like that wouldn't have served anybody. So I'm going to let you have this for now. But you and I are both going to see how hollow this is because I already yeah. understand that like we cannot continue to in this. We cannot just like hide up in our little shack and like right. retreat from the world. And I, I am at the point where I see that. And I know that you do too, but you are trying, you are in denial of that fact and we need to go, you know, save the world. Right? Yeah. And I love his line and too. And he doesn't yeah. do that immediately. He doesn't immediately go, no, we're not going hunting. You need to stop. We need to go. He lets his son do it. Cause he's right. like, he you need he, to, you need this moment. Yeah. He intuits that he needs the break, but he like, he also wants to be there to to say like at some point you know we're gonna have to go address this. You cannot just hide forever. Yeah, right. we're we're bleeding right now. We need to stop the bleeding. I think is the line yeah. he uses, which is great. Um, Tactical Dreamer writes in to say Kratos sure got used to putting his hands on allies' shoulders. It made me chuckle when he did it three or four times in quick in quick succession during the trip to Vanaheim. <laughs> Yeah, he's a bit touchy now. Uh, it's a lot of weird <laughs> shoulder rubbing and stuff from Kratos. He's really crossing the line. Uh, let's see. We got more thoughts on this section. Uh, Dennis M. says, Hanson, I hope you didn't give up on visiting Atreus's wolves, Specky and Savannah. Uh, this time there was optional dialogue. Apparently this time as well when you went back. Uh there was optional do dialogue both times. I'm sorry, both times you had the chance to visit them with Atreus. The scene where he says goodbye to them was really sweet, and you learned that Svana peed inside the house once. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Joe Dean says, One of my favorite small things was the description for the quest when you're going to recruit Surtur. It's written by Kratos, and it says, Surtur is a blacksmith, like the dwarves. Ellipses, dwarf. We search for a forge. It's a really small touch that gives some nice insight into how Kratos is also struggling a bit with Brock's death right now. Sure. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, so everybody's going off on their mission. It's like, okay, you gotta go... I mean, Freyr, you seem to have a relationship with the elves, so you go recruit the elves. We're gonna go find Surtur, track him down, and then Sindri's gonna go to Svartalheim. It seems like he's a little reluctant, but he's like, yeah, I'll go. I'll go to Svartalheim. And then he... What happens there? He... It seems like it doesn't work out, or he just didn't recruit the dwarves after all? Did I miss the conclusion? There's a cool device that shuts yeah. down all of their laser beams. So he just got that, so he didn't need to actually bring the dwarves with him. Yeah. Okay, the hammer, gotcha. Or the hammer that we got for Durlin, did he pick that up? Oh, was that the hammer itself? I don't know. Well, uh, probably not, because that was, like, was an optional quest. Yeah, I, I, so. I don't feel like it would have okay. been that key, but maybe. Right. I like that idea. It's kind of consistent, right? That the dwarves build these things with, like, little Death Star weaknesses. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, that so makes sense. So the wall sense. has one. I mean, he does it right afterward. He uses the wall He uses the wall one. But, yeah, the idea that, like, we, we saw them. We saw them building that laser. They made yep. a whole scene of it. 
Mm -hmm. um, and then you see Durland, you know, yeah, yeah, we're building these for you, Odin. But like the idea that it has easy weaknesses, I think, makes sense. Yeah, I guess that's kind of the payoff to a lot of the Durland stuff there. Yeah. And I think too, for uh, for what you were asking for Sindri, I Sindri volunteered. Like, right. He wasn't part of that, and he just popped up. Like, yes, I'm gonna go. That's right. I think his intention was never to like bring an army of dwarves to fight for everybody. His intention was to show up and be like, you guys are just taking from us. We're not going to keep doing this. Like everything that has connected to you has ruined our home, has ruined our economy, has ruined our way of life. Like I'm not doing anything for you guys except destroying these things. And I think that was a continuation of him just being real angry at everybody. Right. I, I think the oh, dwarf army would have rang false because like, I don't yeah. think Sindri was in a position to rouse anybody. And like, it's not mm -hmm. the way that dwarves would have done it. So for him to bring, like, we're not going to help you because we're tired of being on there. Uh, like we're, we're tired of being resources for other people to mine basically. Yeah. And so like to say, we'll give you this device, I guess, but like, that's basically all we're going to do. Also. Yeah. The last thing I think he'd want to see is a bunch more dwarves die uh, because of his decisions, you know? Uh, Jake Dye writes in and says, I'm super disappointed that Surtur didn't have any lines about us finishing his trials. Canonically, twice, I finished all 15 Muspelheim trials 20 minutes before meeting him, and he didn't say a word? Rude! <laughs> <laughs> wow, you did those early th then, too. You yeah. finished those trials early is what that meant. That's impressive. That's it, a GG. He's kind of <laughs> such a sad sack of a character, though. It would have been weird for him to be like, it's pretty sweet, though, the way you killed all those things. I, I don't think I it love. Been. I don't know if we're you, skipping you really the I love his personification. Yeah, yeah, I, I am totally with you, Kyle. Where it's like right away, it's like God, this feels like something is taking me so long. It's like Jeff Bridges. It, there, it has like a Jeff Bridges sad tone mm -hmm. to it, which is amazing. The, the stone beard. I thought. It was okay. Maybe okay. A little much. <laughs> Can we give him some praise before we critique his stone beard? <laughs> <laughs> the portrayal's great. The idea this guy's been around since the beginning of time, yes. and he speaks so casually. I just, I really do. He's just so comfort, and but like deeply pained. I just really did love the the way they put, played this character. Yeah, and it, it kind of you know, it's it's fun to meet a new character this late in the game, even though we kind of trashed the boar man for being like, who is this? It's so late. We don't have time to learn you. But then when somebody's compelling a surter, it's I'm all in. I wish you were my companion the entire game. Um. And his big theme is he does not want to hurt his partner, who they know that if they touch, uh, if they form a union, then Ragnarok will kick off and uh, this whole thing will happen. Is that right, Jill? Yes. Okay. If he combines with Samara, they will create a monster that will dis help destroy Asgard. Yeah. And then in uh, mythology, yeah, yeah. Is, it, is it combine or is it bone? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. I think it might be kind of a biblical combine okay. situation. Okay. They know each other. Because uh, like in, in the prophecy, it's like they just start making out. And it's like, yeah. whoa. Okay. Whoa. Uh -oh. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, the, him and Amber go to have to cover the rest. Um, Mackenzie Adams says, I was blown away by the visuals in the spark of the world. It really felt like the yeah. end of Final Fantasy VII Remake or a Destiny raid. I was disappointed we didn't get to spend more time in that location. I hear you. It looks so cool. And I love... Okay, so the idea is Kratos can... Because his blades were forged in this primal fire that he's able to shove the blades into his heart. But I love Surge has like this kind of wild laugh as he's like falling yes. back into the void. And it just... It hasn't really lined up with that character so far. So it kind of, I guess, is hinting at him transforming into something else, I guess. Starts with pain and then kind of goes to joy. Yeah, that's a, yeah. That's a cool, man, really cool performance. I love it. Yeah. Absolutely. I uh, was like convinced at this point that somehow Odin had like turned into Surtur and like had convinced <laughs> them to do the wrong thing and now it wasn't going to happen. Like I was you still, still believed in Odin too. I, yeah, I still was not 100% convinced that Odin had just dropped the ball. Yeah, right, hard. right. Like, oh, he just sent a couple of like valkyries to attack you after you'd already done the thing you needed to do i was like no there's no way because they didn't show it happening they've they've screwed this up somehow they do talk about that too about like odin knows our exact plan but what else are we, we gonna do, do i guess mm -hmm. let's just go to surter and hope it all works out it's like maybe it would have made more sense if you'd had the big valkyrie fight first yeah hmm that's interesting yeah, Luca Fire says, uh, shout out uh, to the Hrist and Mist Valkyrie fight because the battle, the epic music, and the beautiful space setting had me so hyped. What a game. Yeah, that was so cool. Yeah, like, it's a fun fight. And then I, just I, the ending of having the kind of 
Trapper Keeper, Lisa Frank style splash screen of like the bear and Kratos with like the purple cosmic sky <laughs> behind him. It looks so sweet. I like the tiny thing of every, like so they have like multiple health bars, but every health bar they have is a, is like because like in the game when you're a when you're a higher level than someone their their bar is green and when you're at level it's yellow and then from there it goes to orange and then purple. Uh, and then red and so like every time they come back their health bar is like a, an increasing color on that scale mm. so by the end oh, in the cool. in in the last phase of their fight their bar is purple indicating that they're getting stronger every time even though it's not like not you don't feel that in the actual fight it's a it's a slight touch that i think works to say like oh they're getting like they're coming back strong like odin is bringing them back stronger every time right right i took a screenshot during that bear pose it was just a wonderful composition yep and yeah. you mounted it on your wall I want to. I don't even know how to print those. But yeah, yeah, I just use the screenshot button all the time. I was like, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's see. Then um, there's a fun thing where we're like, okay, well, I guess I finished this section. Now you got to do what you've done the rest of the game is like go to Sindri's house and kick open the doors to have a cutscene and kick off the next mission. And then you go there and it's just kind of Lunda sitting there banging on the, the blacksmith stuff. And she's like, oh, I kind of figured you'd show up here. Uh, remember, you actually have to go meet everybody at Midgard. It's like, okay, that's nice that the game actually factored in this stupid kind of yeah. muscle memory that I would have. Speaking of which, in terms of like, oh, this thing, obviously signposts, lamppost said this other thing is going to happen. I feel yeah. like we all should have seen. The moment we saw Linda, we should have assumed something was going to happen to the dwarves. Right, right, mm -hmm. right. Uh, it, it, it's that's funny. funny. Early on, um, I did some quests before continuing on, like at the very start of this whole section. And uh, it was funny because I had the spear and I saw Sindri at one of the outposts out there, the blacksmith outpost. And he's like, oh, did you get the weapon from the yeah. lady? And then he's like, actually, I, I, don't tell me. I don't want to see it. Uh, I want uh, my brother to tell me everything. So uh, just pretend I wasn't here. <laughs> and I love it. So then that makes sense why they have the cutscene later and he gets I, to have the big reveal of him seeing the spear for the first time. And I was really interested too if the dialogue changed because I had done that where he was like, don't show me this beer. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards I was like, is Sindri sort of pretending he hasn't seen it already? Right. Some of the right. acting kind of felt that way to me, but I'm like, I don't know if they have whole different versions of this dialogue just in that case, but maybe they did. Yeah. I doubt it that we just kind of probably just read into it differently, but it is sweet to imagine him acting really impressed around his brother and stuff. Cause his brother put his heart and soul into that thing. Um, all right, let's see. We are kicking off the whole thing. I mean, this is kind of, we're rallying the troops. Everybody's gathered around. Freya's setting the little tents out. She's truly the worst at making a tent look cozy. I don't know why they would sleep there. It, their house is like two minutes away. We could get there so quickly. The idea that I'm going to sleep in this tent with a flapping open front door as I prepare for the greatest fight of my life Terrible, terrible planning from Freya. But she's not the general, you know? She put Kratos in charge in this whole section. Uh, what do you think of this chunk, everybody? I wanted uh, Atreus to bring his bedroll. That really bothered me. I'm like, mm -hmm. at least give yourself a pillow. Yep. Um, I never wanted anyone to finish a story more <laughs> than that story. I was like, story? oh, no. He seems so resigned to the fact. And now if he dies, I'm going to feel really bad. Um. It's, yeah. this whole, it's the story about the old man and the logs uh, and wondering whether or not he wants to die now that his use is not, he's not useful anymore. And it's just like, dude, just, just take a pottery or something. You don't have to like <laughs> be the log guy. Yeah. Well, I it's think Kratos, it's, right? It's a story about Kratos. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, like this is, this is the point where I thought like, oh, okay, he's not, he's not going to die. And I don't want him to at this point. I don't like, I, I think this is kind of the turnaround point of like, he's come to, ex he knows that full story, obviously. So like, he's come around to the idea that he needs to, he can't just give up on life and say like, well, once, once you're out of, once you're no longer useful to society, just, you know, quietly go away. Uh, I, so I think this is the kind of thing that clinches me, clinches it for me. That says like I think it's it is better for this story that he not die versus like the like tragic. Oh, I gave my life for this thing because I think again he he tells you like there's that line later on or I don't yeah I think it's later on of like do you are you afraid to do it so like do that thing of like do the more difficult thing uh, and like give continue giving it that effort. So I think I think this is where I kind of turned on that of I don't know that I want Kratos to die because it would be too easy. Yeah. So my delusions ran so deep that when Atreus suddenly showed up to get in this tent, I swore that was Odin. 
Oh wow! Wow! And I was like, so when, like when Odin was like snuggling up, I was like, this is so good. He's such a great villain. <laughs> he will snuggle up with his uh, snuggle up with Kratos, and then when Kratos falls asleep, he's gonna take the mask. Right. And I'm like, that was well played, Odin. That's how like I was that on like on edge the entire time. I was never comfy because I was always so sure that Odin was about to, you know really enact the plan it is tough to introduce something so powerful that you know odin is the world's greatest shapeshifter and actor i mean it's like yeah. the mission impossible mask situation it's like once exactly. that one mask happens it's like okay now i think every character is just another character in a mask it's tough mm -hmm. but yeah i don't know i don't know why i was that confident that odin was just being odin far away i should have i should have expected more of him i i mm -hmm. guess it's interesting um, Cyrus says, can we talk about uh, Kratos being the worst bedtime storyteller? No. His, his kids can't sleep and he starts telling a story about an old man who just wants to die. Take this man's father of the year drinking horn away, says Cyrus. He's, tell he's telling his story. It's a sweet moment. <laughs> no, but it's, it's sad though. Uh, let's see. Uh, Ryan Butler asks, did Kratos changing his mind from not wanting war to ready to start Ragnarok after Brock died seemed too sudden for anybody. I get that Odin as Tyr was trying to manipulate Kratos into not starting war, but he made pretty good arguments against it, especially talking about the war between the Light Elves and the Dark Elves in Elfheim. And ultimately, he was right. Kratos didn't want Ragnarok. He just needed Odin dead. Um, were you all fully on board with the, uh, the blowing of the horn and the full flip for Kratos here? I am of mixed emotions yeah for kratos like i think a lot of what's happening to get everybody to ragnarok is sort of like okay you said you didn't believe in destiny but now we're doing it just because that's the only thing we can think to do but also like kratos isn't just gonna sit around atreus isn't just gonna sit around it's kind of the people they are they're not just gonna let like freya and freya go to war so uh, yeah, I think there were a lot of things going on there that pushed him towards it. I think they might have done a better job showing it, like he was thinking about war more and more as we were going on. Um, but uh, yeah, that's sort of where yeah, I'm. I, 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 I feel like yeah, there are some mixed signals here that I feel I, I still need to think about. But like the idea that, you know, he has found his purpose and that happens to be like the end of the world. But I think there's also this kind of, you know, with that story that he tells, there's this like coming to terms with like the idea that like Ragnarok doesn't have to be the end of the world for them, you know, like the, which they kind of see earlier by saying only Asgard would die. But like, it feels a little bit like he's welcoming the end of the world, but he's also trying to like circumvent it or like embrace it. It feels like a little bit of like the, this is, this just happens to be the way that they can have their cake and eat it too. Like we have a resolution for Kratos in mind, but then also we get to make good on the title of the game. I think that one thing they do is during the war, they make it very distinct. How Kratos, Kratos is policies, right? Where it's like, uh, the people who were the humans who were next to the cannons that blew up. It's like, we got to go take care of those people. When the wall finally comes down, he's like, it's just me and Atreus because all of these people don't need to die needlessly. So like he does draw the line in particular places. And I think that's just to show where he is a different <laughs> creature of war. Uh, yeah. but yeah, I mean like it is so silly because there are so many elves who did die needlessly That's, they yeah. didn't need to show up it would have had the same result regardless whether they really did unite the other realms or not and so like the idea of like we're, re we're uniting the all the realms and we're all gonna get in this big war together it's like none of you were important well, yeah. all they needed was the big old ragnarok and they needed sindri to blow the door open and then they needed kratos and atreus and then they would they win either yeah. way and yeah. a wolf to leave but like so everybody else was like entirely irrelevant yeah, but he's going with his heart now. Uh, yeah, it's like, it's like they want to get like it, they almost feel like the what they're trying to get across is that like oh when you embrace that kind of thing, you you like when you embrace the inevitable you it, you allow it to happen on your terms, mm -hmm. but then like yeah they 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 like the game then ca gets caught up in the like the the Ragnarok of it all and says like well it, we we want to have this like resolution but then also we need to have like the big scale epic mm -hmm. end of the world fight. Yeah, absolutely. And 
And I don't think they did. I really don't think they needed that. I think they. I think we were meant to have a like an intense feeling seeing the realms unite, and yes. like I think we were meant to have this like heartbeat of like seeing everybody unite against right. Asgard. It's, it's and it the end really feel game moment where everyone Absolutely. steps out of the portals. So you're supposed mm-hmm. to feel that. Yeah, yeah. I, I eat a bloody squid writes and it says, yeah, I was wondering how this game would be if it was a little more like Mass Effect 2, uh, not trying to avoid Raid or Ragnarok and then suddenly here it is instead getting all the realms together to fight and actually fixing the elf problem. Um, I, I think you're getting at what I was thinking too, bloody squid is it kind of felt like this is the culmination of a different game. Like that end game moment of blowing the horn, which to be fair, Muffin Crumbs wrote in talking about how they got goosebumps, and the music is incredible during that sequence when all yeah. you know, the realms are opening up and all that stuff. But it does it's feel just... like, yeah, it feels like it is from a game where the crux of the game has been you going around to all the realms and be like, we must take down Odin together, and then finally they all come through. But instead, it's been a game of been like, let's go home, let's go home, let's stay safe, and then to shoehorn that with. Huzzah! Everybody's here. It's it's an odd pairing, I think. Yeah, I, I, and I think like the the more maybe the thing we're alluding to, right? Of like maybe like if you do just send Kratos and like have all like all the key components in place and not necessarily bring in like the giant epic scale battle, it almost reinforces the theme of like okay you know what you, like you know that this thing is inevitable but it doesn't have to happen the way you imagine it right it doesn't have to be like when Ragnarok happens it, it is mm. you know the end of the world but it doesn't necessarily have to happen according to how you imagine it and it can be very like this is the all of the things have lined up but not in the way you expect and so I think for them to just say like if it were just like Kratos else standing outside the wall and saying Odin you coward come let me kick your ass or whatever I think it <laughs> almost would have been a little bit like this is very different from how I thought this was going to go I, and I think that would have maybe helped the idea of like it's okay to kind of embrace that kind of thing as long as you get to do it on your terms, which would be very different from what was expected of you. Well, I think yeah. it kind of was trying to have its cake and eat it too because you want to have the big climactic right. epic scene where all the action's going right. on in the background as you're running through it, but then to have that pivot of Kratos saying, wait a minute, no, these people don't need to die. We need to play with our heart here, Atreus, and we need to actually change up our strategy here in a big way. So I think they're trying to get to that and that is the change right. from the prophecy. Um, uh but uh, for me, I don't know if we're actually talking about the war or not yet, but the action was really fun. Even though you're basically doing the same thing you've done forever, you're just going through like enemy room to enemy room. It's just like the things that are going on in the background and the it, it felt chaotic, it felt urgent, it felt epic kind of going through. So like I, I really enjoyed the energy of that moment, even if the context of it wasn't coming together in that way but yeah. just running through and like suddenly there's like oh there's a big wyvern thing trying to eat you and you have to get rid of that before you can go and i was super lost i was just like running uh and like there's so much noise and energy and explosions the music's and incredible. incredible yeah soundtrack's music. going off incredible, at that point yeah. yeah this area of asgard is is one of my favorite like locations in the game it's just it's basically just green uh, but I love it. So, yeah. uh, and seeing it kind of be torn up and exploded and everything is like, oh, I actually do kind of feel bad about this. So, I was feeling a lot of good emotions. I think that's what they wanted me to feel throughout that section. But the things that pull it back, all of the narrative stuff that we've been praising for a lot of its nuance and everything, it's just so, um, it's, it seems like it's coming together in a way that maybe would have worked if it were three different games um, versus like two. Um, but like the, the, the speech before they go in did nothing for me. Like mm-hmm. it was supposed to be that rallying cry and like people are stepping up to be like, and I'm going to, and you know, and, and you have my sword and my bow and my ax, but it wasn't that feeling at all for me. Yeah. Uh, also, I, I kind of mentioned this earlier. Kratos did not earn the title of general to me at all. I have no idea why Freya would point him and be like, we need the person with the most, uh, like, generalness in his background. And I'm like, hasn't she been fighting for a long time? Thousands of years. I think that's just them trying to connect to the, the earlier God of War games where he right. was the general. But like, he's got a origins. reputation. Yeah. But that's, he's a God killer. that's what I felt they were doing. It's like, oh, they're right. connecting to the games versus it being a natural thing that came out of 
the story yeah, or the narrative. He also does not lead necessarily. Like he, yeah. he he gives everyone kind of like overall instructions, but then he works more as like a covert agent, right? Of like, right. oh, like I'm sending here are all the massive armies. Meanwhile, I'm kind of like going around and kind of threading the needle to get to the core of like the, of Asgard, which is not a thing that generals typically do. But <laughs> so the whole the the whole idea of him as a general feels like relatively flimsy and yes just uh, as like a thing where it makes the most sense for gener- for for someone with war experience to command here but that's not necessarily the role he fulfills right i think they're trying to build him up to be a hero again by the end you know uh yeah. siddhartha gupta writes in and says it seemed to me that kratos went as a general into war without knowing his own armies the enemy's mm-hmm. capabilities or the battleground yeah. Fully expected them to lose, and then when they kind of succeeded without any noticeable losses, it felt too easy. I love so much about the game overall, but the ending felt rushed to me. And That's Mark- the thing is, like, there's, like, hundreds of deaths that yes. just happen from those lasers. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And he does get to have that, that fun moment, like, you know, talking about this, the spectacle of it, Joe. Like, I love seeing... Thor and Jormungandr fighting in the distance. Yeah. Um, and Kratos just has some line where he's like, the snake got big. <laughs> like, that was yeah. about it. Uh, he looks a little different. Yeah. Uh, Mark Varley says, I was very disappointed with the final act starting from the tear twist. Uh, Ragnarok itself was rushed and underwhelming and too many characters weighed down any emotional involvement and I simply didn't care about a lot of them. Danny Yorkus wrote in a similar thought, said, did anyone else feel like the ending came out of nowhere? I thought that the game was pulling a fast one on us and no one would show up for the rebellion and our small group of characters would have to figure out a more clever way to defeat Odin together. Yeah, that's a big recurring theme for a lot of comments. It's just kind of... Which which is what they end up doing anyway, right? Like they find a way of like, ah, we didn't have to have this this, battle this whole time. Uh, Right, right. But, you know, I guess you could always make the case as well. If they they didn't have the armies to kind of uh, push back against Odin's, then they would have died before they could have set anything up, right? But it, it does feel a little bit like... Like yeah, like what we said earlier, they're trying to have their cake and eat it too. Of like yeah. we need it, we need an epic grand battle, but we also want to have the more personal resolution to everyone's arcs. Yeah, sorry, the snake looks different was the line, not the snake looks big. Oh. That was from earlier in the game. Um, yeah, the Norman Gonder Thor fight and him getting sent it back in time. I th- again, it's cool. It's cool. I think this is just my mind running wild for four years before this game came out about what that time travel would look like, and I was a little bit underwhelmed. There was kind of like a, just kind of a, a blip. Of him going into the past. I thought it would be like this huge collision and the two of them would like, get tossed back in time and we get to see it. But I guess they can't really do that in yeah, a big way with the camera, that, right? That it's almost like maybe them being a little bit too slavish to the lore where it's like, yeah. well, we have to have this thing. Like it's Ragnarok. These things have to happen. But it definitely feels like eh, we're not super interested in following, exploring that thread too much. So we're just going to have it's going to be an event. It's going to be the thing, you know, if you follow Norse mythology. But we're not super interested in like tying it thematically to the rest of the story that we're trying to tell. Here. It's still a really cool thing. And, you know, Mimir talks yeah. about it, about like, oh, yeah, when we first saw the, the snake, he recognized Atreus and. Now we know why, because Atreus right, made like, him, and it, it, that's fun stuff. And, that, and that's what it, that's where it begins and ends, right? It's, it's yeah. a cool thing versus like being one of the key part points of Norse right. mythology, right? Sure. Um, Leviathan, 765 writes in, um, but before that, um, beep, beep, poop, poop? Sure. Go for it. Great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. I could use a coffee okay. refill, too. Let's okay, do it. great. Let's kill two birds. Let's go for it. Leviathan, 765, uh, they ask, Hey, were you all disappointed with the last confrontation with Thor? The first fight, he was knocking you across Midgard and wrecking landmarks, and the last one was in a tiny little arena. Didn't even do the frozen lightning bolt. Yeah, I guess I didn't it do It is kind of a de-escalation. I didn't think about that. I, I liked it um, just because I love how fast Thor was when he's like, all right, game on, now we're fighting. I felt like he was appropriately ruthless just with the speed of that fight. Um, not that it was the most challenging thing in the world. Like we talked about the kind of the story centric fights aren't going to be the challenging ones in this game in a big way. But I, I, I got the impression that Thor was going all out at least from his movement. So I, I appreciated that. Yeah. Uh, I, I found that fight better than the, the one that follows. Uh, sure. But it definitely feels like not, not necessarily the fight that I imagined us having by the end of it, but it does feel like in line with it, you know, it gets cut off by the end and it, it you know, when, when Thor finally starts to kind of waver in his resolve is when he finally ends up dying. So it, it felt appropriate, but yeah, not, not necessarily my favorite fight in the game. Yeah. Um, I did like, uh, there's a line earlier where 
Atreus runs into Thrude up there. And she's like, no, no, no. Or he goes like, no, 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 we're friends. And she goes, friends don't bring the end of the world to each other's doorsteps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is a, a good line overall. But uh, yeah, they talked about, um, Eric Williams talked about in the spoiler cast, that idea of how they really wanted to mirror the game of having the opening of the game be Thor and Odin come to uh, Kratos' house and knock on it. Uh, right and then with the end of the game now they're just fighting outside of odin's house and whatnot so i think they wanted to have that little arena be a cool mirroring over all the structure it's like poetry it rhymes um samuel writes in and says i felt bad for thor at the end sure he was an ass and i loved how kratos and thor realized they're not that different um they have both killed many people and can be called monsters but the reason thor attacked kratos at the end was because he thought kratos was going to hurt his child and it's the same thing kratos would have done like I said, I, I think it works as like, you know, this is why they set up the, the previous scene of like, you know, your your alcoholism is hurting us and uh, that kind of thing. But it, I, I like that he kind of comes around and they have that thing. It's almost I, I would say it's like the like the um, the Martha moment from Batman. Versus a little, Batman, little. Yeah, but, but not terrible. Uh, yeah. So it feels like, okay, we have this common thread that unites us because it, and it works because it's being reinforced elsewhere. It's not just like, for one, that's just a coincidence and it doesn't mean anything in the, in the Batman versus Superman thing. But in here, it does have like some amount of residence. So it does work. Uh, and you, and like you, by have, by displaying him as, at his worst and being, you know, a drunk, it, it does kind of get you to, it makes you more empathetic towards him where they're like, okay, you kind of want to root, you want to, you, you root for him to turn it around because it would, if nothing else, a benefit through, which, you know, they're, I was totally all in on. So like it, it works for him to have the, like, I guess maybe it's not so bad. And then to have Odin be the, the kind of force that says like, no, you should have been doing what I told you the entire time. Um, I think it works as being like the fact that Odin is the one that cut that fight short, I think is, is good. I think for me, um, I think I would have liked to have seen Thor come around quicker. I think the fight went on a little bit to the point where I was like, come on, Thor, just think this through. Like, obviously your kid's not harmed. Like, she was obviously yelling at you not to do anything or that you're okay. Um, maybe if we had had that moment between him and his daughter where she, like, explains she's fine or whatever and then have the odin moment like maybe that would have been more impactful but yeah i think thor was done a little dirty here because i think he could have come to his own conclusion about what was happening before getting beaten to a pulp yeah like and then stabbed with the spear yeah um yeah and then through trying to kind of just gets thrown away with mjolnir she kind of just goes flying off in the distance and like at the end of the game i was looking around to see if she had me on there by the table with her mom or anything but i couldn't see it but i think the implication there's there's oh, a moment log stuff yeah, go yeah. Ahead. oh yeah there's yeah. a moment in there's a moment in the post game where if you go to alfheim you see her like basically talking to it and saying like oh. all right here we go i'm gonna start using majolian and then she like grabs the hammer and flies off oh geez all right yeah i missed that completely that's awesome yeah lunda they, tells you to go see it Okay, you gotta check. Luna's this out like, "Hey, I got a shop in Alfheim. You should, you should really check it out." I see. She sounds like somebody on the internet. She sounds like <laughs> Kyle Hilliard in your Slack. Um, she like just straight up says, "Like, go, go, check this thing out." Oh, okay. Damn it. Yeah, sorry, I missed that one. I thought that I was expecting a little bit for them to be more in mourning. I think when you're walking by and you see Sif and Thrude, like the fact that Thor just died. I think everyone's a little bit cheery on that final march I and mean, we don't have to unpack everything about the final march up the mountain and whatnot but they really stood out to me of like oh they, they were so tight as a family unit with their troubles and everything like that but I was still kind of struck about this them in the wake of Thor not being sadder about it I guess but more just like well Odin was bad thanks for ending him goodbye yeah, it seems a little like the the post game stuff. They they handle it a little bit weird, but I think in the moment it works. I almost I think maybe the one thing that uh, that I think maybe would have driven home the point of like Thor coming to terms with it is if Thrude had like kind of switched sides and stood up to him earlier of like okay I, like there's a whole cutscene fight at the end or whatever, and then like Thrude intercedes and is like why are you trying to fight me? And it's because you know you're like working against our interests at this point and then Thor would realize, oh, maybe I should join you guys and then he gets got. Then he gets got. 
Uh, Charles Bean writes in and says, I didn't expect Odin to be a traditional final boss fight. I feel like it was rushed from him being more complex and then devolving into, quote unquote, a bad guy. I I like that fight. I thought it was cool. I like the second phase of it where he had his, you know, kind of the, the rope on top of his staff and stuff like that. I thought that was a, a, a cool, unique looking weapon and the fact that it like changed arenas throughout the entire thing. But Surreal, were you disappointed in the Odin fight? I'm not was like not like I think it's a it's a well designed fight. I just think that like thematically I almost would have wanted it to be more of the like you know, negotiating with, or like some sort of mastermind esque moment. The fact yeah. that he's like, I'm going to use my powers now versus like, I'm going to use like a series of tricks to like fool you. And like the, the thing that the fact that the big mechanic is like the Bifrost, which is the thing that he's known for. Uh, and like the thing he's kind of been imbuing is so just the whole time, I guess it is like, it works there, but it, it like the fact that it, it's even a boss fight at all is maybe the thing I'm, I'm most disappointed by. Right. Yeah. We wanted a, a discussion or something like that, but it's like, you know, it's got a war. Uh, he's got to kill a God. You got to have a big fight. Like I think- the other side is like, if it's going to be a boss fight, he's got to like put on the mask and grow 18 wings and like Interesting. go naked. You know what I mean? Like, I don't like he's just a little old man where the three of us are fighting. <laughs> yeah, Jason Wojnar wrote in and said, imagining Richard Schiff as Odin during the final boss fight was pretty hilarious. You'd have to imagine yeah. it. It was just Richard Schiff jumping around an arena at times in there. Yeah, having yeah. a mocap. All right, Richard Schiff, do a combat role. <laughs> <laughs> which, by the way, Serial, you watched uh, Wakanda Forever? Yeah. Uh, Richard Schiff is in that, which I wasn't expecting. Yeah, that was bizarre. He's having a year. And he, he's got the, a couple of lines. Yeah. In the credits, it's weird. He's listed, he's the only actor where it says special guest star Richard Schiff. But everybody else <laughs> is just listed as like actors. And like, I was trying to Google like why that is for a Marvel why film. Yeah. yeah why I think that's his agent really putting yeah. in some work for him. It's a good thing to be a guest star in a film compared oh, to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Special oh, guest yeah, star. Baby. He's not just guest star, he's a step yeah. above. It's very special. odd. Very odd. Uh, I it think it means know. like this guy's too high profile to come in and just do <laughs> uh, a see. couple of lines. I, you know like, what I mean? yeah. That could it's be not it. A cameo. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for the Odin fight, I think what we had been talking about last week about something to do with getting the mask away from him or sending him through the, the crack to do stuff or that's what his obsession is the thing that ultimately destroys yeah. him. Like, I think that would have been thematically cooler, but I, I think they might have run into the issue that they were kind of bumping up against before, where they were sort of trying to figure out how to make the mythology work, too. Mm. Um, so, like, Fenrir has to kill uh, Odin. And in this way, he sort of does, because he brings the the marble. Oh, interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Do you think that's yeah. what they're going for? I think so. Why else is the Why else does the dog need to show up? I really guess so. Also, if, if 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 Odin's not technically dead, then uh, I guess Fenrir could still technically kill him somehow. But I think he's dead, right? Well, yeah, Sindri yeah. shatters the hell out of it. Which oh, I, th- yeah, I love that true. Sindri yeah. technically is the one to kill Odin. That's such a cool detail. Like, well, someone's gonna get the vengeance. He's just gonna be fed up with he's it like do it. this. And he just like pops fun. up with no fanfare and it's like boom, yep. dead. Yep. Because they pass the marble around very dramatically. Yes, yes. They're sensually. Like, they pass around do? Odin sensually. That yeah. was sensual. You're right, yeah. man. It is romantic. The way they <laughs> but I do love, you know, Odin during this fight where he's like, what's it all for? Launching into it. So he's trying to tie back to his themes of, you know, his life is meaningless. And then I love to when Freya uh, is pulling up the vines. He's like, oh, you and your little vines. Like, even as you're killing him, he's still just condescending towards his ex-wife. Like, mm-hmm. you always What were- does he say? Like, you know I love you still? Like, when she's about to cut him down? Right, yeah. right, yeah. I gotta go really back and watch stuff. that again, yeah. Uh, My name is Dan says, I think I would have made the same choice as Atreus at the end when he broke the mask, and I'm happy with the decision. But isn't it just a little bit of a bummer we're not going to know what's inside that tear? So, you all seem like we you will. think that's going to be a thing going into the future. I feel oh, like... Yeah. I don't. I think there's going to be a lot of new mysteries with the giants and other mythologies. I don't think the tear is coming back. I think the lesson is leave well enough alone. You don't need the ultimate yeah. answer for life. Yeah, I, I think that's totally what they were going for. I don't think they're going to necessarily bring that back. But it did like that whole thread of be like, oh, I'm so obsessed with like knowing everything and like I have to get answers. Like that feels like a little bit under. It doesn't feel like it ties into the rest of the story super well. It just feels like a running thread. Of, we need to give Odin a motivation for like being who he is and like this whole obsession that he has with the mask. It feels not totally in line with the rest of the game to me. Mm. 
the mask's introduction was the height of my intrigue yeah. in God of War Ragnarok because mm-hmm. it was something so it was not part of the mythology it was not part of God of War history it's right. like here is a brand new element that's really going to throw a wrench into everything and then it totally didn't yeah um so i'm i, I once more i'm my faith is in the narrative design here that it will pay off eventually cuz it's way too disappointing for it to just end there yeah yeah uh, well, here's something. Zelda fan 83 writes in. I say, um, oh, I'm sorry, not Zelda fan. Uh, Nick West writes in and says, since her death, Athena has returned to Kratos with a light green aura slash glow, and said that she has ascended. So, are we all on the same page that the rift Odin found is a gateway to the God of War universe's multiple pantheons? That'd be cool. Yeah, maybe. we're not all in cool. agreement, but that would be cool. Agreement. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't talk I about that. Say, that feels like more coincidence than like. Because then the, the right in Odin's ravens are also green, so it's like, are they also Athena yes, secretly? Yep. Uh, okay. All right. No, they're like children too. Is is Helheim's also a lot of green, so is that all Athena? Like, yes, it, it is like, Athena. Come on, sir. Oh, what are you confused about? Okay. Uh, Levitian writes. Wait, in, what about Zelda? We got to read Zelda fan because they're probably going to be feel let down. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Zelda fan. You, you do not want me to read this. It I is. want for Zelda fan. I do. It is raunchy. Okay, sorry. It's just it was just out of order, but let's do it. Zelda fan okay. says, "Hey, the quote from Faye to Kratos is the most profound thing I've ever heard a character speak in a video game ever. The culmination of love is grief, and yet we love despite the inevitable. We open our hearts to it. To grieve deeply is to have loved fully. Open your heart to the world as you have opened it to me, and you will find every reason to keep living in it." Yeah, this is the thing that we kind of missed uh, talking about is like yeah. that other Fey dream right before the third uh, dream. Yeah, I'm glad that that spoke to that person. That's fantastic. But Uh-oh. didn't um, Vision say that exact thing to um, Scarlet Witch? Well, he says Vision what, was more succinct. What is grief if not love persevering? Yeah. Is what, uh, All you need is one sentence. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's a, that's what I really love, though. So like that that line stood out to that person so much they transcribed it and love it yeah. to death, right? Yep. And yep. then like right. to me, really, like I felt like she's not in love. She's just doing a monologue to Kratos to make him like convinced of something. And so <laughs> it really so is interesting how like everybody just reads these I, things. I differently. love that you are committed to that to the one thing of like the Odin and Faye being like an agent. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, yep. I like that. You, like to the end, you were convinced. In fact, we've, oh, ne- we've never yep. seen him in the same room together. Mm. Just mm-hmm. saying. Whoa. Uh, let's see. Leviathan uh, says, I love the fact that all Odin wanted to know was basically what the afterlife for gods looks like, or even if there is one. But instead of killing him and essentially giving him a one way ticket to finding out, instead, Atreus simply traps his soul in a giant, giant marble. Uh, poetic justice. Yeah, so the assumption then Wait, is. Wait, did that person just stop playing at that point? <laughs> Shutting <laughs> off. Well, I wonder if the marble nullifies the afterlife. Maybe that's what Leviathan is going for, but I do like that idea. He was at least frustrated, probably, when he went into the marble. I, yeah. Okay, so so now hearing that, it does make me think that, like, the one way that it could tie into the rest of the, like, themes of the game is that like Thor or Odin is so obsessed with death because maybe he's afraid of it right of like at some point even though I'm a god at some point it, like yeah. Ragnarok means that I'm going to die so then like I am afraid and want to reject the idea of passing versus Kratos who eventually comes to the round of like it'll happen I'll accept it it'll be okay but until then I'm not going to worry about it whereas so then so then the inverse is Odin basically using like I have to know as like a way of harnessing his panic about death right yeah, yeah. That's that's maybe where I would say like those those kind of lines converge. Sure. Uh, Chris Martin says, "So who else cried when the best character in the whole game died?" Yes, I'm talking about Ingrid the Sword. I was the weird kid whose favorite character in Aladdin was the magic carpet. So yeah, I fell in love with that sentient sword and was genuinely sad when she was presumably killed at the end. She did so in the, she did so great in that bar battling Mjolnir. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, th- this was another confusing beat of Freyr being like, go on, I, I've i got Surtur's sword here and Ragnarok's sword, go on without me. Um, and then he died, and Ingrid was his sword, apparently, the whole time. That was a cool mo- moment when he calls it and it summons cool. it and it goes flying around. But um, it felt odd, uh, that entire death scene. Sad to see Ingrid go, but uh, Jill, somebody else wrote in about it as well. I guess it's just that idea of you have to fulfill the idea that Surtur kills Freyr in the mythology, so that's I what... Guess, but- I mean, they didn't do that for anything else. Like, Jormungandr doesn't kill Thor. Fenrir doesn't kill Odin. So, like, it's sort of yeah. weird. 
that whole thing too. Like, first of all, we don't know that Ingrid's dead. We didn't see it. Interesting. She, she could have flown a, away. She could be fine. Yep. She could be on a floor somewhere. And then <laughs> living the her best whole, life. This whole scene with like everything falling apart and then Loki throwing his dad. I was convinced that Loki had died because everything had just gone blank. And then I was like, this is some sort of dream or afterlife or something is not right. Oh, in here. the middle of the fight? No, like at the very end when okay. everybody's like when jumping out. White, the the, yeah. Everything oh, after that is like some sort of like dream. Some sort of weird like, dream. The first cut like, yeah. you talked about, yeah. Mm. Yeah, because like he sees his mom who kind of drifts into being a Valkyrie and I'm like, is this another dream? Is this really happening? Is there a situation where we're going to wake up and we're going to still be in the middle of the battle and Kratos is, is actually dead? Yeah, yeah, like is something going on here? But uh I, I I just kind of had to accept it. Like I didn't accept it until the credits, and I was like, "Oh, I guess this is really what happened." But that's so weird and confusing to do it that way. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess that part didn't strike me. I had the weird moment of like halfway through the fight when you crash down into the cave area, and it's just Atreus talking to Odin. I had the weird moment of like, "Yeah, is this a dream? What's happening? Why aren't Freya and Kratos jumping into this?" But I guess they wanted to have just kind of that one-on-one -on -one interaction. So that struck me as a little bit weird. But it is it is an odd ending here. Um, ben E says, "I felt the ending was sloppy and left too many questions. Why did Kratos summon Ragnarok when they could have used the little dwarven box instead? Why does oh, they didn't they didn't know they had the dwarven That's box? True. Uh, why does Freya not blame them for Freya's death after they needlessly caused Ragnarok?" She, uh, Freya was all in on Ragnarok. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think, like to some degree, yeah, it is her fault as much as theirs, right? Where she's like, I need to kill him no matter what. I don't care. Right, right. If my dopey brother goes, he goes. Uh, Wyatt writes in, and this is this is the biggie. He says, so there were two giant prophecies, and supposedly Faye wanted to keep one from Kratos and Atreus, but she led them right to it in the first game, and the one Kratos found at the end of this game was the real one but they couldn't know about that one. The prophecy stuff got very muddy for me by the end. Was Surtur even needed? And I'm wondering if y'all had a better understanding. This, this was my struggle here, is trying to just wrap my head around fitting the prophecy and the overall story of the prophecy and what the Norns were saying with this ending. And specifically, it's that idea of the giant's prophecies <laughs> before getting to the specific of your question, Ryan, Wyatt, which are, which are good, and I think there's a lot there, but it's just the idea of, like, the giants and the Norns, they're Did working... They the same things? Yeah. Right. It seems like the giants are working kind of in a different arena than the Norns, because the Norns say, we're just basing it off your stupid yeah, it's algorithmic. human instincts. Their thing is algorithmic, whereas the giants, it seems more like, this is, no, this is, like, fate. Right. But then apparently it wasn't, which is the confusing part. So which yeah. which parts of the giants uh uh predictions did not come true? Uh we definitely Kratos died. Kratos didn't die. Was that Joe? And it's not even like we can reinterpret it as like, oh, he passed out and then we no. interpret it. It's like literally nothing happened to Kratos unless you want to get really metaphysical and like the Kratos that was is now dead and it is now a new Kratos. But like right. I, the illustration I, shows like a gold like snake coming out of his mouth. Yes, I'm not is, sure what it's meant to interpret, but there's no even point where he's lying on the ground and Atreus is holding him. Like we don't even see that. Moment. Well, it's just it's Odin. He holds Odin, um, and you see the soul of oh. Odin fly out and go into the marble. And so that could be kind of the snaky thing, but definitely it looked like Jormungandr being birthed from Kratos in that original art. And like I went back and looked at it, and like. Kratos kind of has like a black thing over his eye where it's like, oh, is that supposed to be a patch even back in the 2018 game? But like, it is very clearly Kratos. And so clearly this has been a deviation and I I'm still trying to wrap my mind around it. Okay, so that idea that why it's unpacking here of there are two giant prophecies and yeah, right. Faye destroyed... Giant prophecy that we see at the top of the mountain at the end of the first game. Right. Is that whole thing that they show them getting to the top of the mountain and then Kratos looks behind a carton and sees himself lying dead with Atreus. Like right. maybe that's a, uh, yeah. So that's one. The, the, there's another one that supposedly existed where the mother Faye had a shrine, like a wooden shrine that opened. Right. And she destroyed it purposefully. Yes. So that they wouldn't be able to see 
the future so that they could make their own pathway. But then she led him up to that place where they did see their future. So we, right. That's, so but I'm, that's not the one behind a wooden door. That was the one that's like on a wall. On a wall. But yeah. she knew that that was going to be there. So I'm like, what was in her specific? Was it showing that, oh, you're actually going to. Was it the thing that we saw? Like Loki's was the third one, right? That we saw? Yeah. What Was it the one that we saw where they actually show what happens? And she just didn't want them to be influenced by that because it would mess with their head. But it seems like all she's doing is messing with their heads. And so uh, my entire read of this is, okay, there's the prophecies and they're going forward, but they can change their fate and they can quote unquote choose to be better, which is the big theme of this entire ending section. And because Atreus chose to be better by not putting on the mask and because Kratos chose to be better by caring about the people on the ground and opening his heart then that changed the fate overall and that's why yeah i I think they are trying to like tie it in the idea of like your future is only as you know uh, bound to your nature no fate but what we make yeah right so like the idea that like the only reason that this seems inevitable is because it seems like it seems easier to accept the inevitable than it is to change to to kind of to change fate right it seems easier to accept the idea that well everything's just happening on this course there's nothing we can do about it versus like actively bettering yourself to make the change but then yeah the the idea of like well she had the prophecy and then when this happens it feels a lot like time travel stuff of like at some point you just kind of learn to accept it and kind of you, like those are only vehicles to kind of relay ideas and themes so what the literal ter- interpretations of that stuff. I'm always, I'm, I'm a really bad at like figuring that stuff out. Yeah. And B, it's easier for me to maybe just let that stuff slide, I guess, more often than not. And so in the, the idea also was, okay, clearly what they thought was tear in those early secret murals from the giants, like the behind closed doors, the yellow one that, yeah, Kratos was the champion and he was the one with that spear the whole time. Got that. But I'm with Wyatt where I feel like the whole prophecy thing, it didn't stick the landing for me. I didn't have a clear sense of like with the big question being the prophecy throughout the entire game. Then it's just kind of like, and then different stuff happened moving on. Yeah. I think this ties into wanting their cake, have it and eat it too situation and trying to make the mythology work with the story they wanted to tell. And the story they want to tell is that destiny is not a thing that defines us. We right. destiny is literally just a thing that you can tell is going to happen because like we're predictable human beings and we're going to do the things we're going to do, but also you have to tie in the mythology, which is prophesized to happen. Yeah. So they're getting both and they get kind of messed up. So you have to say like, Oh, there's a reason why you're able to not have this this fate. But I, I think I think the why it kind of doesn't hit for me, I guess, and it's a tough thing to convey. It's this game is impossible to write, and overall, to be clear, I love it, and I'm sorry to dive into the weeds in such yeah. a negative way here. But I think it's just that idea of like I didn't have a sense of any path that would have led to Kratos dying in Atreus's arms and his soul being sucked out of his mouth. Like yeah, it's it not seem like how would that have happened? What, what is kills it, yeah, how are they avoiding that? What did they right. do to avoid that? Yes. Right? Like specifically, like besides like the overall theme of like, oh, we we decided to do something different. Like, is the idea that like by caring about other people that Kratos somehow circumvented that fate that we didn't it's even yeah, like you said, you yeah. didn't even get to see what would lead up to that. Mm-hmm. Um so and the other thing is that like now that I'm thinking about it, like did the idea that Odin would be would pretend to be tear, not rate for a prophecy. Like, is that, is that not part of face prediction? You look back and you see like a tiny little raven feather, and you're like, oh, I should have known. Yeah, <laughs> that's a that's a great point. I mean, they say it's a broad brush that they're painting with. Mm-hmm. They say they can't get into all the details. That's kind of the fine, fine stuff. They, it's much more the important to show. They didn't even hint at it either. They're not even like, oh, someone in your midst is not who they say. They're no, like, they, no, they no. didn't even. They because you would think that of any character, they would say that because they're like they're trying to be. They're like nothing if not cheeky about it the entire time. Right, right. Yeah, that is weird. It's much more important to have the picture of just Odin standing next to Atreus. That's a story they need to right. tell compared to, yeah. It's not for them, um, man. I did think of one important detail, too, is when they, um, in a, it's the painting in the middle of Angraboda's house where you do see Kratos dead and uh, Atreus holding him, is that there's a Thor standing right there. So we can right. officially say that like, that scene won't happen. 
Right. You know right, what I mean? Right, like right. you can maybe say that like, well, Kratos could still die later on oh, with sure. Atreus in his hands, but Thor won't be standing there. So like, yeah, like you can officially say that prophecy is broken, which I think is interesting. Which, so maybe the entire thing they're saying is that like prophecies are like they're the like New York Times election needle. They don't mean anything. It's like, <laughs> that's just people messing around. It doesn't like prophecies but, have no power over us. So but like you're all saying is wrong. like I, I, I would love the distinct thing of like this is what changed yes. your destiny. This is right. this is the decision you made that will actually change it. Just like it's a nice thing as I think an audience member to know and like I, what they actually right. did differently. And I think like it was the, the outside the wall scene. I think that's what they were going for is that the, that was the moment of Kratos opening his heart. But then is that also, what we're supposed to take away from the the shrine that we opened? Because that would have been cool if it had shown what changed the fate. Well, so this is, yeah, MD Bat writes in and says, okay, was anyone else lost when Kratos opened the secret shrine doors at the very end? Was that another prophecy for the next game? Or was it just the ending of this one? What was that last panel about? Why did it make Kratos cry? And then Victor Pham writes in and says, does the final prophecy that Kratos encounters after Atreus leaves, showing an image of him being worshipped, mean that he's finally on a path to redemption? Can he ever truly be redeemed? Um, yeah, okay, so that final secret panel where it shows Kratos' journey, um, this is the one that uh, Faye destroyed, and in the back it shows his journey. I also was, it didn't hit me that hard. I was just kind of confused what I was looking at for the final thing where it's like, okay, yeah. now it's like Greek version of Kratos again. And I didn't even pick up on that idea of like, oh, he's being worshipped, which I guess is what he's looking for. Is that redemption that goes hand in hand I, with worship? That made more sense to me than all the other stuff because the other stuff was trying to explain what had happened in the game and I don't know if it was melding together. But this one is obviously something that hasn't happened just yet. So I think that's a hint as to what's happening in the next games. And the the image that's shown is it's not Kratos. It's a Kratos statue that is being all these little figures are oh, bringing really? offerings to. Right. Because there's, oh, the yeah, there's the thing where Odin says, like, you're not really a god. You're right. like, yeah. like, Have you ever been yeah, worshipped? Yeah. 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 Kratos is just literally a, a war. He's like God's in like most mythology are like servants of the people, not just really buff dudes. Right. And so all Kratos has done as a God is like serve his own ends. And so like the idea of like, well, on the back, like you become like what you say you are, which is a God, which means like you do something for people. You have like, you are part of the larger world, uh, which I guess sort of tangentially ties into like what you're doing in the post game, which is just like going around and like, fixing people's problems right um so maybe that's what they're alluding to but yeah, yeah it definitely feels like you are on the path to actual godhood which means something more than like you have right. divine strength and, and there are so, people who are offering things to you because they are grateful to you you have done something good in the world and that's what makes him happy i guess he didn't give up yeah. on life and now he's got something to live for I think a super important detail about it too is that it's in color it's angry about his painting over what was already there before like oh, you can actually you can see that there is like a okay. giant engraved in there and she talks about it in some of the other ones that she's painted over she's like yeah i just added on to my mom's um okay and so you can tell that anger boda did that final frame that final panel and it was different from what was there before that's a, okay that that helps a lot that's interesting it's a peer-reviewed prophecy they've yeah exactly, yeah <laughs> yeah i think i was just struck by like oh it's kratos without the beard though but i guess if that's the statue it's that idea okay or maybe in a future game he'll shave his beard or something i uh, like myself better without the beard actually <laughs> uh keegan mobley it worked for him he says when kratos saw his hidden story panel he saw that he would be loved and worshipped as a hero he cried a single tear and so did i all he wanted was to not be a monster and being revered as a hero was something he didn't think possible also, I joined the Patreon for this. You finally broke me, Hanson. We got you, Keegan. Thank you for your support. We appreciate it. Uh, Garrett Wainstock says, I'm glad that Kratos beat the bad guy and him and his son learned something along the way. Great game. Yeah, you know what? It turned out to be a much more happy ending than I Whatever ever when I felt was coming. Guy. Pretty simple. Yeah. 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 Uh, Piet von Rosmalin says, Atreus needs a bath. Yeah. It also, okay, I, think, I, yeah. I think most characters in this game could use a bath at this point. Mm -hmm. Nate, not a lot of bathing going on. Not enough. Uh, no. Nate Miller says, I want him to like, yeah, dunk Mimir into the bath too. Just, uh, do they have to clean him? Probably. I worry about his stump a lot. I yeah. do too. I look at that so much. I'm like, what is that yeah. texture down there? What's happening? How secure is it? 
Uh, Nate Miller writes in, Atreus not only abandoning his relationship with his father he spent all these years building and also not being there for Brock's funeral are all timer mistakes and very, very nearly ruined the entire reboot series for you. For him. Okay, the, 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 uh, Atreus not being there for the funeral. That's that. That that's I think is maybe, yeah, that's fair. I think the other one is like, I think that's the whole point is that like Atreus has been with you this entire journey and then now you finally have to see him off right like the whole thing about this game is that he has a son and now like a son mean like having a son means ultimately having to let them go and letting atreus go and but saying like hey like in my heart you will always be atreus and you will always be in my heart is like the finale that this game needed uh but yeah i could i could have seen like some sign of like atreus should have attended that funeral but i think maybe they they were more uh, it's just insistent that like when Atreus is gone, he's gone. Like that is a party yeah. that does not get to come back, but it does feel incongruent with like the idea that like me, even like I could see the, um, the Brock funeral happening, happening before their big like send off for him. But I think they wanted to have it be the ultimate, the post credits fade to thing, credits yeah. thing, you know? So that's a tough thing to square. If one of the core pillars of the game was Atreus needs to go off on his own. Like you got to do that a little bit earlier. Um, yeah. And there's that big scene where they say their goodbye. And then, Kratos says, Loki will go, Atreus remains. Yeah. Very sweet. Note. That hits. That's a good scene. Yeah, that was a really good line for sure. Um, yeah, it, I was I was struck by just him being so insistent on he had to go alone. I thought for sure Anger Boda would go, but it's a really weird detail that he's just like, I need to do this. And you know why myself. he's got to go? Prophecy. <laughs> That's right. He's like, I got to go because of prophecy. Bye. Like, <laughs> yeah, all right. Did you, did you pick up on any of them? All right. <laughs> well, what are you going to do? Was it, wait, was it, did he say prophecy? Uh, it was, I've, Ingrid Boda says like, did you tell your dad, you know, you got giant prophecy or something like that to, I forget what his, what, what her explanation of it was, but yeah, that's right. basically his, the reason why is like, does, I gotta go because it's my giant destiny. Does he have the sack of giant marbles or is Ingrid Boda so. still has that? Doesn't she? Didn't he gave it to her last, I think. Ren, yeah. Okay. So, so I think, uh, well, Hopefully she handed it to him at some point. It's weird that she has the marbles, but I think she last last we seen the marbles it was with Angerboda. Okay, that is odd. Um, yeah, and so he had that sign or that line or something where like, oh, it, it scares me, and Atreus says or Critter says that's why I need to go do it. I think so. Mm -hmm. He'll go off on his big adventure. Um, Nora Perone writes and says that final quote from Amir in the epilogue hit me harder than probably any video game has ever hit me emotionally. God damn. Uh, yeah, that entire funeral scene. How quickly did you all jump right to Brock's funeral? Did you do a bunch of endgame stuff and then get to it? Or what was your strategy there? I had a couple of berserkers I knocked off. Oh, you know, oh along wow. Along the way, you know. But, you Interesting. Know, like, was, it's very quickly established that that's a thing you should go do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I, yeah, definitely did that first. Yeah, and the big fade to black and stuff. But he finally answered Brock's riddle of what gets bigger the more you take away anyway yeah oh uh i so to me this is like a remarkable like narrative moment because that riddle pops up incidentally yeah. like not in the cutscene, you know just as you're wandering around on that first mission with like brock as your partner yeah and it's referenced a few times like they're still kind of trying to figure it out which is fun and like even when you're just like going back to the shop you can press triangle to like hear him like guess again mm -hmm. um and for that to be the final line basically of the script yeah it, it's like incredible to me because it, it means that basically all the lines are treated with the same weight whether right. you are just wandering around or whether you're deep in a in a cut scene where you can't control the camera at all and i think it's very different from like Red Dead Redemption 2, when you're riding on your horse and you're just hearing them just kind of BS filler dialogue the whole time that somebody else wrote. Uh, so for it to like, the idea that there's like this narrative consistency, like the, the script is always this strong and everything kind of like is important to these characters equally. Um, yeah. Really, really cool. Yeah, it's validating, I mean, what is a lot of people's favorite lines from the game, which is just the companion dialogue running around. And yeah, the fact that that can be yeah. so important is incredible. I mean, yeah, is that earlier part where they're trying to guess the riddle and Kratos is like, what gets bigger than where you take away? Nothing. And then Mimir is like, uh, I don't think so, brother. And then Kratos just goes, I do not like riddles. <laughs> and that's kind of the <laughs> end of him trying to guess the thing. But yeah, it's it's incredible. Uh, let's see. Yeah, the um, that final fade to the credits. Oh, this, again, incredible. I liked it. I love Sindri popping in. I love everything about that. 
it drove me nuts though that there was like a little technical hiccup right with the fade to credits like it faded to black and then there were like three frames of like my compass like popping back on the screen before credits oh, no. and it's like of all the things <laughs> to iron out like this emotional moment i don't want to be thinking about my compass popping and glitching through the black screen but should have turned it off i told you to turn that compass I know, off i know you're right <laughs> damn it you're right yeah I didn't use that compass, really. Uh, let's see. We had, speaking of incidental dialogue, um, Bino writes in, Bino, champion Bino, of trivia the tower. hero. Hey, oh, Bino. did you watch that, Kyle? I didn't watch. I, I heard tell. I heard. I wanted to know what happens. What? How did you? What your chat tells you? How did you hear the legend? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My live okay. chat was telling oh, that's me what was fun. going on. Your little ravens. Your live <laughs> chat there. <laughs> I had my ravens out there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Vino says. By the way, Bloodworth made it to the third floor. I'm. I can't believe that. It's very He's impressive. Good. Very Bloodworth impressive. Bloodworth is good. Uh, so Bino says, I'd like to highlight a piece of ambient dialogue that I thought was absolutely brilliant and sums up the combat in this game perfectly. Atreus says to Kratos, three legendary weapons. Do you have a favorite father? To which Kratos <laughs> replies, no, they are tools for specific tasks. A preference would be meaningless, which I think is the perfect answer to mentality I strive to maintain as a player. Atreus then says, I like the axe. And Kratos says, I too like the axe. <laughs> and it is the perfect answer. It's so good. Yeah. Uh, let's see. It's very, very sweet. It does kind of harken back to that moment where he like flings the the blades aside and then puts the the axe down sort of reverently and it is the weapon that he received from you know the woman he loves and and i was just looking over the, the god of war last panel thing because i had to check out everything that was going on and he is in the statue holding the axe instead of oh. any other weapon oh so that's, that's cool. nice that is really nice Good, great detail yeah jonathan mm -hmm. R. Writes can you can you oh. tell what's painted underneath what is painted over that's what i was like i was yeah. just Ooh. focusing so hard on that. oh that's really 100%, interesting there's something there's a big guy and then a little guy who is, who is it who is it who knows uh, Jonathan R. says, one thing that stuck out to me in the last portion of the game is how important all the spontaneous companion banter, banter really is. Other, yeah. than, other than the cutscenes and hub areas, the world consists of just the player character, their companion, and enemies. It's essentially a barren world, but it never felt like that because of how good all the companion interactions are. I think that's a great point. I mean, yeah, there's enemies out there and stuff, but all the towns are pretty much empty in most areas, so you it's incredible. You really feel their absence in the post-game. It feels to me like Kingdom Hearts 2. It's mm. it's like now that like the story's gone, now that there's no cutscenes in between and the and the incidental dialogue's all gone, every it feels like Kingdom Hearts 2 worlds. It feels so weird going back to a place yeah. where you've done everything. Interesting. Uh Zachary it's also very like uh, it, it is a fantastic feature of a game that people who are playing it are saying like I really liked my AI companions mm -hmm. yeah. that is yes. basically not how you feel about them yep for sure uh, Zachary Sweet says my favorite dialogue is Atreus saying hey guys what if I grow my hair out and Mimir says you want advice on that from us <laughs> <laughs> and then Atreus says, I guess not. Uh, and then Matthew Brown says, uh, there are a couple lines about him growing a beard, too. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I love that. So Atreus is like, I think my beard is coming in. And then Kratos says, is it? And then Atreus says, yeah, see on the jawline? And then Kratos just goes, is it? <laughs> he just says it again. <laughs> uh, Levi says, my favorite exchange in the game is when you're on a quest and uh, you come across a large footprint. And Ramirez says, big footprint. And then Kratos just goes, smartest man alive. <laughs> and then, then Mamir says, well, you I try. Yeah, they're really good. Mamir says, well, you try making conversation with you sometime. Uh, let's see. Oh, Felix Diaz says, I went to the entrance to the Norns after visiting them. And Mamir says, we can't go back there. And Kratos says, what? I thought Atreus would like to see the horse again. It's yeah. his most dopey out of character voice the entire time. Yeah, I love to when... Um, if you accidentally, let's say you hope that you're not good at playing this game and you accidentally like change the time the first time when you're changing it from day to night um, in Vanaheim and I accidentally went too far and made it night again. And there's that line where Freya's like, what are you doing? It was it was correct before. And then Atreus is, or Kratos has a quiet line where he's like, I wanted to see the wolves again. <laughs> he's kind of like mumbles it under his breath. That's very good. Uh, let's see, post-game stuff, post-game stuff, people wrote in about it. Uh, Mr. Buttons says, my favorite piece of dialogue in the game is easily missable, but it really struck with me. If you return to Atreus' bedroom at Sindri's home after beating the game, Kratos asks Mimir if he had done enough to prepare Atreus. Mimir naturally responds that if he survived Ragnarok, he's ready to go out on his own. 
But then Kratos quietly says, not to survive, but to love. The two then have a brief conversation about love that ranges from hilarious to surprisingly sweet. It's an excellent moment that further hammers home Kratos' insecurities when it comes to raising Atreus and the overall arc of Kratos trying to leave behind a life of violence. That is a very nice little scene. Uh, Joe Chef- Kefchinski writes in, It says, Upon entering the post game, I cleared out my first remnant of Asgard. Uh, quote, How many of these do you think there are? wonders Kratos. Freya responded with her best line, saying, There's only one way to find out. And then the quest log immediately popped up with one out of ten. <laughs> Do you think that's what Freya meant? <laughs> yeah, I think that's what Freya meant. She knew the UI was coming in, so she's just trying to mm-hmm. help you out, I think. It really, I felt the same way. I really did. It's like, okay, ten is doable. Okay, ten's, ten's all right. <laughs> uh, God's Garage. Have any of you found the mystical heirloom behind a breakable wall in Midgard? It is a relic that seemingly has no effect until you take it around the map and use it to trigger hidden boss fights. I love this game and I'm really enjoying getting the platinum. No, I did find the thing that has no effect. But they're like, it's for some sort of sleep spell. So I figured I'd go into a boss who's like trying to put me to sleep. Oh, sure. So it triggers hidden boss fights, they say. That's yeah, cool. That seems wild. Uh, it's very impressive. Uh, Daniel Ferris says, Finding all of Odin's ravens reveals some interesting and disturbing lore that is easily missed. From the eerie dialogue their spirits give in Niflheim, it is revealed that they are the souls of children sacrificed to Odin by their own parents and turned into mystical spies by the Raven Keeper, further solidifying Odin's desire for knowledge over anything and anyone. Yeah, it's... I think it is... Is it? Does it tie into actual Norse mythology, Jill? Uh, like human sacrifice was definitely a thing. Yeah. I don't know if they, children sacrifice in particular, but like there, there's definitely that history there. Yeah, that's messed up. And in video game fashion, once you find all the ravens, you get to beat the crap out of that raven keeper. <laughs> uh, Jose Arroyo says, "What are your favorite secrets that you've uncovered in the post game slash side quest?" Mine had been hearing Frey imply that she wants Bergier to retire his big sword at her old house with Charlie. I was so happy to hear our good boy get a happy ending. <laughs> Well, speaking, of, speaking of Charlie, like, is that the is the implication that Bagheera is like the, the replacement? Because like, if you bring Freya back to Charlie, she's like, oh, I really, you know, did wrong by you. I should find someone to, re- to like take care of you. That is the end of that exchange. They just you can just leave and like leave that turtle to like die still. Like, I imagine because it's like it's not the idea is that like that turtle's about to die if someone doesn't do something about it. But then it's just like, yeah, I should we should figure something out about this. Brigier's got Later. it. He's on top of uh, it. Definitely a real tear for me, but like yeah. one of the, like the craziest bits of dialogue is uh, Mimir's like, hey, Kratos, can you tell me about all the times you were in tournaments? He's like, yeah, I was in lots of tournaments. And he's like, yeah, I heard about one where it was like people from all these different worlds. Oh, yeah. And like there was like the world's greatest musician and automatons. And then Kratos says, best not talk about that. Yeah, I love He's yeah, like talking I, about PlayStation All Stars yeah, Battle Royale. It's so yeah. good. So I, the idea I is love Parappa? referring to Parappa the Rapper as history's greatest. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> it's so good. So cool. But like, don't do that. Don't, don't, don't even hint that that's canon, please. <laughs> don't even poke that little bear. Got, well, you don't want to know what was in the tear, baby. It's just the opening yeah. cutscene to PlayStation All Stars <laughs> Battle Royale. Uh, JKK411 says, Is there anything better than a meaty epilogue? When I stumbled into the real tier while cleaning up content for the Platinum Trophy, I literally did a double take. I love the amount of care that has been put into the post game. It is bananas. Truly bananas. Um, I wonder how long we're going to like have stuff coming out. Because I think for the first yeah. game, Corey Barlog was still like saying, like, Oh, there still hasn't been everything discovered for at least months, right? Yeah, I think in this in one of the interviews, Eric Williams said there's still a lot that hadn't been discovered, but that was so pretty early on. So who knows how long it'll be? And you know, it's I feel so sorry for developers when people force them in interviews to be like, "Do we 100% have everything? Can we check this game off the internet's list?" You know, it's like let there be some mystery left, everybody. But then if you tease it, then it's going to drive fans insane. They're going to treat it like the 17th Colossus or something, you know? Right. Uh, Joseph Stanichar says, is anyone else disappointed that there wasn't anything after completing the epilogue quest with the 10 Aesir wreckage things? I was expecting some cool post-credits teaser, but unless I'm missing something, there was nothing. Oh, bummer. I haven't done that. I haven't finished that one yet, but I figured it would be something cool. Yeah, maybe there is, and maybe just he didn't find it or something. I'm not sure. I forget what the resolution is to that, but I want to say that there is, there is a little bit of a note, but I don't, I don't think it's like, 
that crazy. Yeah. Okay. I'd say the Valkyrie Queen is worth it. Yeah. It's an insanely hard boss fight, but like. Gana and then like the Berserker King are probably the two like most like most gamey fights that I really liked. Uh, And they feel like those are like the two uh, fights that I think people should seek out if they like if they like if they like the combat. Yeah, Mark andre Dufresne says, The Valkyrie Queen in the first game was my highlight, and while very good, I didn't find the Berserkers to have the same depth. So the encounter with Gna and Muspelheim was a very welcome surprise. 43 yeah. hours to Platinum, what a great game. Yeah, I think I, I definitely prefer the the Valkyries to the Berserkers, because like they, they have similar things where it's like, they're basically all variants of the same boss fight. But in that, like, oh, this one has, like, this one's electric, this one's ice, but they both have, like, oh, I'm going to fire one fireball and then one another fireball, right? But what I liked about the Valkyries is that it felt thematically appropriate because it's, like, okay, all of the, the first eight are, like, they all have, like, two or three patterns that they 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 repeat. And they all have, like, oh, I'm going to do the attack where I fly in the air and then I come back down. And then Sigrun, who, like, who is the queen of the Valkyries after uh, Freya leaves, basically is all of those bosses combined, where she has all of the patterns from all of the other Valkyries and can and rotates between all of them. So it felt like, okay, she is the master of the Valkyries. Of course, she has all this. And the Berserkers follow that same rule, but they're not as like closely tied to each other. Um, but I, I like that that last boss fight, and I like Ana. Uh, I think she she like. I like that they see that thread at the end of the main game where they're like, oh, she's recruited a new Valkyrie Queen now that, you know, Sigrun is gone. And, and so, like, we'll, we'll have to take care of that. So it does give you some impetus to go back. And in, in, in Muspelheim, there's just a little crack that you find and then you fight that fight. Mm. Uh, another one that has a sweet little resolution is the uh, the recipe quest. Mm. What's this Finding one? the lovers, the ingredients to the lovers recipe and like making their stew. I thought that one was really sweet. I didn't do this. Whereas, like gathering the flowers has no resolution, so it is kind of inconsistent that way. Interesting. Uh, Edgar Vasquez, somebody you know, Surreal. I do know him. He's my brother. Oh, Uh, well, I found the combat pretty fun overall and serviceable for the majority of the game. Blades are best weapon. Oh, are you gonna let your brother say that, Surreal? Come on, man. I mean, I I got (laughs) use out of the blades. Like they're they're good for crowd crowd clear okay save it for but not good for bosses man they, they just don't do the damage yeah i just see like i was all fists like i was all stunned even against the bosses friends. yeah the, especially against the bosses wow like, cool. the, all right the, wow. The stu- feeling the stun bar deals a ton of damage to them and lets you basically fill it up again so like i was my my build basically was all based on how much stun damage can i deal to bosses i love that uh, so do you have lunda's armor yes yeah. because it okay. lowers their level and makes them easier to stun Cool. When I got them to like a hundred percent, they will never lower stun. I was like so happy. Like <laughs> you guys are in trouble now. <laughs> All right, cool. All uh, right. But Edgar says, uh, I found uh my love of the game hit a limit during two of the harder berserkers and Gana fights. When enemies move too fast and break lock-ons, it's a rush against time to find them again. Mm-hmm. When there are multiple bosses, it's a pain to keep track of what they're all doing. A mistake on either fight can end up with 65% of my health gone in a single attack. Ouch! And then Koshimitsu says, I love the game overall, but one of the more frustrating fights was the triple berserkers in Elfheim. How do you feel about the game and how it handles multiple enemy fights? If you're unable to keep all the enemies within view, you have to rely on sound cues and the off-screen enemy indicator arrow to know when to dodge incoming attacks. Is there a better way for games to handle situations like this? Yeah, I think this is the, like multiple enemies is I think where the game kind of reveals its big weakness, which like, yeah. they've they've tried to address with like the the sound cues are a little bit more apparent, the arrows are more prominent on the UI. Um and like they are like they're maybe a little bit more hesitant about attacking you if you're out of sight, but it definitely feels like in that three uh, berserker fight there's definitely like you have to learn how to like attack enemies from angles so that you can see other enemy like you're keeping your eye on one enemy while attacking another kind of mindlessly right and so like you're doing a lot of camera management which is like the thing like this game doesn't do super well because a lot of it is like most most in most of the base game you kind of rely on auto aim to just basically do everything for you of like i need to aim this thing and then it, it's not super hard it, the game does not require you to like move the camera a ton um and so like when you do finally get into bosses that want to test you that way i don't think it i don't think it measures up i think the gana fight is fine um because most of her like really quick movements uh like telegraph attacks that take a little longer to wind up but like yeah the, the hardest fights in the game were the three berserker fight the two berserker fight and this little like gremlin 
Bosfer, who is like who's like an evol- he, he's like a boss version of one of the lizards that with the with, that stick their tongues out. And the reason he sucks is because all he does is move around constantly, and he's like the boss that most reveals like this game has trouble keeping up with the action if you make it go too fast. Is this mm. he's next to where you throw the fireballs to make the walls explode? Yeah, he's like he's like in that same island where you do the father the father son yeah. quest, right? Yeah, mm. I know the guy you're talking about. Actually, he uh-huh. is awful. He's I killed me many times. Yeah, I was also under level that fight, so it's like yeah, yeah I was in, in like that. To, I feel like there are harder boss fights in the game, but I feel like that one was the most frustrating because it yeah. is the one that feels like I feel like for the most part they're able to design around their combat system, but like that fight and like the three berserkers, I definitely feels like they kind of push past the combat's limits. Yeah. Starkiller says, Lunda's armor set creates an insanely overpowered build, which you referenced a little bit. Oh, cool. Um, especially on bosses. The armor applies poison on punches and then deals extra melee damage when enemies are poisoned. Pair that with the enchantments that give you even more melee damage if an enemy has a status effect and you absolutely melt every boss. Thor, I gotta check this out. Thor and Odin it's, didn't stand a chance against my dirty fists. It's just Starkiller. Yeah. That, that combined with, like, I, I had every, like, arrows do max stun. Like, the, there's, you get the, uh, I don't know what quest it's for, but there's the the enchantment that makes for every, like, four arrows that Freya fires, fire three arrows. So that's, like, mm. a, a bunch of stun. And then, but I did stick with the, like, the gauntlets that slow down time because I feel like that that's just, like, a quality of life thing of, like, if you happen to dodge an attack really well, you basically get to reorient yourself, which is really good when the bosses are moving really fast. So it's, like, yeah, it's a, it's you're stacking all these effects to basically just, like, stun lock the bosses as much as often as possible. Yeah. I, um... I killed in like the Vanheim area. It was like the Craigshaw, I think was the name of the monster. And I got an amulet that regenerated my health. And I remember in that part of the game, I was just horrified by like, I couldn't use it unless I had a vitality of 60. And then mm-hmm. I looked at my vit- vitality was at 11. I'm like, okay, this is going to be impossible. <laughs> but at the end of the game, I actually worked my way up and actually unlocked that thing. Um, and that's maybe the most I really cared about the gear and stuff. But I do love people like Starkiller who are really into uh, min-maxing this stuff to really create this optimal build yeah. but i mean like all, the, the last yeah. two bosses like the the king of the berserkers and the and Gana are both like level nine enemies so you basically if you want to take on those fights at like an appropriate difficulty you have to basically do everything else you, you have to do a bunch of caring about the gear which involves doing muscle heim trials and all the other stuff but like yeah. i feel like that that it almost feels like a very different game at that point where you're just like like the whole game has been about very story focused, very narrative driven, very like we're going to guide you to really cool set pieces. And then there's this like separate game where you're just kind of hunting down like open world task lists. And I feel like that's maybe that that is like to me a, kind of mixed because like I like the combat stuff in those side pieces more. Mm-hmm. But like the overall structure of that game, I don't like nearly as much as like the, the focus narrative stuff. Yeah. Uh Olek Pychezek writes in and says, I love being able to use the spear to absorb Bifrost from the Einaryar and use it against them. Seeing their health bar quickly wither away was so satisfying. After dying to Bifrost countless times myself, all hail the spear. We're hailing the spear. We're hailing I absolutely the spear. loved it. That was such a, like, very petty moment for me. Anytime I would come up against the Einaryar, I would, like immediately just use their abilities against them. Like, ha, see how it feels. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bobby Corwin asked, did any of you find Asgard to be lacking in terms of access? You get a nice tour with Odin on your first trip up there, but after that, you're restricted to his house and a bar fight. For me, it would have been nice to be able to go outside, even if it's just like overhearing a bunch of NPCs conversations, but especially with the mid guardians, I wanted to hear more from. Yeah, I get that feeling. It, it is, uh, a pretty simple place overall. You just kind of see a lot in the distance that looks compelling. But one, uh, one thing I just reminded me of that I really love one moment is when Loki comes back to Asgard after Kratos has uh, killed Heimdall and you go up to, you know, where they have their like tables and everybody's chatting. Yeah. Um, as if you get close, they go, shut up, shut up, shut up. (laughs) So it's like it's actually like you as the player, you want to hear the conversations they're having. Right. But as you get close enough to hear them, as, as the volume goes up, they're like, hey, he's here. He's here. Cool. 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 Oh, Talk. I love that. So like you actually can't hear those conversations. It's like what a cool like uh, integration. I really love that. Um, and then, yeah, similarly, it is weird that I mean, that's that's your entire exposure to what as guardians are like. There's no human at the tavern. You just kill a bunch of, you know, zombies. Yeah. Yeah, that is weird. Um, yeah, it reminded me of there's that scene when you're in Vanaheim too, 
and Atreus is just like loudly talking around the fire about like, okay, so when we summon Galahorn and start Ragnarok, and then Chris is like, hey, 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 can we talk about this in private, buddy? Like, we're basically <laughs> going to kill a lot of people, keep it down. Uh, Patrick Henderson writes in and says, as Atreus, you can't shoot, as Atreus, you can't shoot the chime to summon Red Atasker directly, but you can charge a shot and explode it just behind the chime, hitting it and causing the red bitter squirrel projection to say, Oh no, I'm sorry, that chime only responds to the axe. Yeah, and people whose balls have dropped. Sorry. Uh, Bitter Squirrel has no chill. Uh, Who I believe is Troy Baker. I think he plays Bitter Squirrel. Anxious Squirrel is Troy Baker. Oh, thank you. So Bitter Squirrel is somebody else entirely. Um, Um, Pro ZD. Pro ZD? Yeah. Uh, Sungwon is his name? Yeah, he's he's like a... He's a very prominent Twitter oh, that's right. personality. Okay. You've seen his sketches. Yes, 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 yes. I have. He's yeah, like a uh, really good voice actor. He does incredible voice, but he's like does the sketches of like the card games and like, you know. Yeah, and I think what RPGs are like. And I think Kyle over at Game Informer interviewed him about this, so I saw bits and pieces. I I, I think the Red Tasker stuff, it didn't really land for me. I feel like every time there's a squirrel talking to me in this game, I was just not exactly feeling it. That's the thing. You're re- you're really rooting for the guy, but you're not necessarily l- laughing at that squirrel. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that's right. I, I hear you. Okay, thank you. This is, if we whisper, it doesn't go out to the internet. So it's cool. Uh, Matthew Because I love, he's like, he's just, he's hilarious. Yeah, yeah. The guy's hilarious. Yeah. I, and I just feel like every time, every once in a while, they would go for like an emotional note with the squirrels. And that's especially, yeah. I was like, I, I, I've got a lot, to, a lot of stuff to care about in this game. I just, I can't care about the squirrel projections, emotions. I'm sorry. Uh, Matthew Clark says, I'm pretty behind, but my wife pointed out that by breaking the curse on Freya, you completed your mission to free all the Valkyries, which you started in the first game, which I thought was a pretty neat idea. Um, Also, to add to the last discussion, Mimir confirms that he's from Scotland with a dialogue about a play from his homeland, which was Macbeth, as well as his favorite food discussion. No, he doesn't say Macbeth. He's very clear. The... uh, of a set of a certain play like he does, Scottish play. I remember this dialogue and I, I took it I'm like oh no that's very clever that they don't say it there we go bad luck. Uh, also olives says Matthew Clark there's that line where he says he's confused about what olives are uh, Villas writes in and says I certainly wasn't expecting to go through Ragnarok and have one of my big takeaways be wow that was a great therapy session yeah it it really was though I mean especially Vanaheim I feel like so much of that chunk is just people working through so many issues while running around the poison swamp but Mm -hmm. yeah but that's the thing like when i'm coming away with just like wow it's it's incredible that the god of war franchise suddenly has so many interesting characters yes i think a lot of it is that just so many of them are treated so real you know what i mean like thor was not a a violent cartoon you know that he just had this depth it's a really Um, it's a really emotionally smart game it's one of the emotionally the smartest games i've ever played altogether with the writing yeah uh, Nate T. Trees says, Crabs in Muspelheim have helmets over their shells, like there's some kind of warrior helmet crabs, and I think they're really neat. <laughs> I wonder if there's a creatures team. I wonder, because they're, they're like the, the, the natural life of so many of these realms is so nice. Yeah. So good. Uh, Francisco, the part where it has you rub the controller to touch Faye's hand felt a little too little, a little too late implementation of the DualSense 5 features. Um, yeah, where you're on that final dream and you like swipe to like rub the paint and all that stuff that did strike me as odd i I wasn't opposed to it but it is it felt like the rest of the game hadn't been pushing the dual sense in that big of a way uh the best thing that came to me was like when the sound came out of it for the jingling of like sleds right that was literally the only one where i'm like oh this is cool but yeah there is a there's something here there's something here from a certain somebody uh brady easter says, I couldn't haul my PS5 half across the country to play at my in-laws over Thanksgiving. As such, I currently have no idea how the game ends. Nobody tell Brady. Um, So instead, here's my favorite little detail. The haptic feedback when switching from snow to ice in the sled. It was so impressive, I made my non-gamer wife come and drive the sled around so she could feel it, and she was also very impressed. Um, I didn't even notice that, but I love that you did, Brady. That's a very cool idea. Um, Jordan Blaney says, I finished, I'm finishing hunting ravens with my pulse headset and the 3d audio makes it really easy to identify where the ravens are at. This has been the best example of the 3d audio that I've experienced so far. There you go. Cool. 3d That's audio good. is a thing. Mark Cerny was right. Everybody. We're glad we sent him pictures of our ears or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. Sent the prophet says looking at story mission, trophy completion percentages, 59% of players battled Nidhogg. 62% of people destroyed Gryla's Cauldron, and then there's a steep drop-off. 42% battled uh, Grom, 
and then Garm, uh, and then only drops to 38% that battle Heimdall. What do you think this is? Do you think it's a natural pace drop off or something happening here? That feels no, pretty it's, it's like pretty good comparatively. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's all right. That feels pretty natural for the slope down. It doesn't feel like there's one moment where everybody's kind of dropping off and stuff, but yeah. yeah I think the, I, I saw that I think it's like 30% get to well last last I checked got to Odin. Mm, really? Yeah, that's that's huge. That's unbelievable. Um, is it Nithog? Is that how we're supposed to say it? Oh, good yeah, question. Yeah, there's something yeah. about the D there. Nithog? It's, so it sounds you, like they say, like, Nithog. And they're like, oh, whoa. Interesting. You know, because of that, that, that game, Nidhog. We've been calling it that all the time. Yeah, Sorry, what? I'm going to go ahead and keep it calling it no. Nidhog. Yeah. But yeah, whenever you see that circle with a T over it, that's yeah, basically a TH sound. sound. Oh, okay. Oh, really? I'll be damned. Uh, Joseph Dowdy says, Hey, Hanson, what do you think about the Better Together trophy in the game? It gave me quite a chuckle. Um, it's... It's good. We have a show called Better Together, so that's good. Uh, Avo oh, so Kadeo. that's a nod to you? I could not wow. imagine, but uh, hey, we'll what, take what it. What do you think about the trophy Hello Ben Hansen? Yeah. Well, uh, he did get his his code straight from Tony. That's right. They said, you'll want to play this, wink, wink. We talk about getting better. Uh, Avo Kadeo says, this should be the official game of MinMax because the story is all about making friends and being better. <laughs> Hell yeah, it is. It is officially the official MinMax game, so congratulations. It's about a few more things than that, though. Mm, ultimately, okay. though. Uh, right. Julian writes in, it seems, says, it seems like a couple story threads are still open. In 2018, yeah. we hear someone blow the horn to summon Jormungandr. This is not addressed. Or maybe it isn't a side quest I didn't do yet, like the Frozen Lightning in Vanaheim. I just wanted to thank you all for the great deepest dive. It has been a gift to be able to listen to these things after playing. Thank you, Julian. Yeah, it was is, one of my greatest dreads is that at some point we got to go blow that horn and it'll be like, whoa, it was us the whole time. Oh, and so honestly, really? I'm glad to never address it. Yeah, I think it's all right. I think, um, you know, there's a thousand articles and YouTube videos popping up where it's like, we think it's Anger Boda that blew the horn. If you have to choose somebody, sure. But I do love I like that, that there better. is this yeah lingering mystery from who's blowing that horn in 2018. Um, hey, everybody, I don't want to alarm anybody here, but. I think. Oh, uh, not all the questions. Uh, uh, we had another comment from Nobby Buckles here on Patreon. They say, I have nothing to add to this conversation except someone needs to make a Patreon tier joke. Love y'all. Happy holidays. Mm. Happy holidays, Nobby. Yeah, if you enjoy this conversation, make sure to up your tier on Patreon, TYR. There's no good way to, to do I'm that. Make sure to re don't like fake us out with like some yeah. fake uh, tier upgrade. Yeah. Uh, Jump up to the twenty dollar Odin on Patreon. I mean, tier. I don't know. There's mm -hmm. there's something there. I don't, I don't think. Uh, my name is Dan. Says hey everybody. I'm really gonna miss poo poo pee pee time. Well, my name is Dan. The, the, good thing, the good thing about pee pee poo poo time is that it's always just around the corner. That's right, and it's in it's in your hands now. Yeah. Dan. But you do deepest dives all the time, right? <laughs> yeah, we basically never stop. Yeah, we'll be peeing and pooping for years. My name is Dan. I don't know what you're worried yeah. about, buddy. Bathroom breaks leave. Pee pee poo poo time remains. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. All right. I think that's it for the deepest dive. Is there anything that we've missed, everybody? <sighs> I'm sure there is. I'm sure there is. I mean, I just, I, to me, like this game is so impressive i mean like yes. comparing it to the to the first game comparing it to other games that we've played throughout our lives like i'm i'm deep left deeply impressed by the accomplishment of this game yeah i mean we had a twitter poll um from the minmax account just about you know what game did you like better ultimately for people that have finished both and ragnarok was winning by a pretty healthy margin i i was bouncing back and forth i love 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 this game i really really liked the final third i feel like it it didn't exactly blow me away with uh, the ending, but I think I'd probably hype things up too much for myself. I was waiting for some epiphany, and there's enough really cool stuff in there that I'm okay with it, ultimately. Um, and so I was bouncing back and forth, even like by the end, I'm like, oh, do I like 2018 better? But I think there's just so much in here. I gotta, I gotta tip the cap to this one. Yeah, I think narratively, I'm still kind of like feeling myself, like trying to figure out what, how I kind of how it lands with me overall yeah. but i think my overall kind of impression is that i kind of agree with you in that like the lead up to the ending feels a little bit like okay we have to put all these this is kind of what has to happen for for like all these threats to come together but i think the end end of like kratos basically finding a new lease on life i, I feel yeah. like that to me is the thing that's going to stick with me and i really like that because it just feels so 
rare in video games for for video games to say like we are going to have like the kind of conclusion that feels final and not and not just a setup for like well there will be x x number of games so nothing can end truly it it, it feels it's like this to me feels like the closest the game has gotten to like a metal gear solid 4 level ending of like mm. every it feels like a send off it's not as final as that i feel like metal gear solid 4 is probably still like the most a video game has ever ended uh but it it, it gave me it reminded me of that I yeah think this and like maybe dark souls 3 are maybe the only two games that feel like okay they are no they are like ending this in a, in a I, big way yeah I, i'm more in the kyle camp i think this is them shattering it to open new avenues and stuff but it does Definitely. it does feel like it, it certainly could be the end of kratos's it's, journey i i think I, i'm to the point where it's like i don't want the next god of war game to star kratos is yeah. where i'm is where i'm at mm-hmm. yeah i think there's yeah. a lot of people that are with you for sure yeah i think um 2018 it's hard to compare them because 2018 was a situation where i'd been a fan of the games forever i never expected them to reappear and then they reappeared in this very new kind of brought up to speed model where they're being smart about things they're caring about narrative they're exploring emotions and what's going on in a way that i never expected a god of war to do and that meant a lot to me at the time and now i think that ragnarok is better in that it it builds on all of that in a stronger way and they dive more into that and they are going deeper into that. And I'm really excited, not just for where God of War goes, but also what this and other games of this caliber are starting to do and starting to like lead the industry in a certain direction of being, you know, in our more mature video game age. Yeah. Instead of just like, oh, you're, you're pointed towards a monster, you kill the monster, you don't think about it too much. You know, we are leaving that stage of like early video game era and we are moving into making people think about things, exploring like dynamics and themes that are tough, families, like trauma, yeah. and family, and uh, like alcoholism and how a father and son navigate the world together. And like, that's a really great thing to see the overall kind of market going towards instead of staying in the like, okay, here's monster, kill monster, you know, sort of thing. So I'm yeah. really excited where that's going. You know yeah. what I was thinking of as you were saying that is how like the original God of Wars felt like they were like the mat- like bleeding edge maturity of the video game industry when they came out. Yeah, with like the idea of like ro- rotating an analog stick for a sex scene seemed like whoa, look at where video games are going, <laughs> and like now that that like obviously that's absurd today. Obviously mm-hmm. that's like what were they thinking? But like it is funny like, that it's this franchise that's like, hey, man, this is where we're going. It's like what a thirteen-year-old thinks is the mature thing. Right. It was so yes. Like, <laughs> so like video games are now not thirteen. Video games are now like in their adulthood yeah. it feels yeah. like it's just keeping a pace with like what what do what does our core demographic find most interesting and like that just kind of shows that like the people who those kids those 13 year old kids have grown up and now have families and so like this is a game that is like kind of aligning with like what are they most interested in right and so and that feels a little bit like you know we want richer characters we want people who have been through things and aren't just like one note right uh and like i think you know we as we've you know talked about here at length it it there are some places where the kind of like emotional maturity kind of like um, sometimes has friction with like the stakes of the conflict of like, we want to have this world ending narrative, but also it's about family and trauma. Right. Mm-hmm. Which is, like, uh, which is kind of a thing that you're just going to have to struggle with when you're uh, trying to do both of those things. But it feels like, yeah, it feels like this is, this is kind of like the ballpark for where triple games are at narratively. And it feels like it does feel like a step forward for, for like, that that scale of storytelling in AAA games. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not saying this from um, a hotel in Pervtown, USA, but I mean it sincerely. Like, I, hear me out, hear me out. I would love for this series to tackle sex again. Like, I feel like with the emotional maturity that yeah. these last two games have represented, the idea of like going back to like let's have Kratos have sex again, but like talk about sexuality in a mature way. Kyle, yeah, is there I, anything there? I, I'm visualizing it. I'm visual like it's too I would like, so- to see like it. he's it's too soft. It's too real. 
Right. You know what I mean? Well, like, like he's he's making eye contact with his lover. <laughs> yes, I, and I want well, them to talk about that. Well, okay, but like, so what you want this game to like? It's like you want a game that is about <laughs> intimacy and not necessarily just. No, 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 no. Just full frontal nudity. Did I misspeak? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. No, I thought I was very clear. <laughs> so the images you, you flash through my mind just now. I mean, yeah. so like, what do you like? Do you want like something more that's like a uh, like. A, a blue valentine or do I want, want I like, want him and Freya to have real discussions about how it feels to be in a friends with benefits situation and the emotional turbulence of that that is what I okay. want from the next God of War so, well right like that then you are talking about a game that is about intimacy with another person sure <laughs> however that, that may be involved all right who's the pervert now sir he'll cool it over there jeez put some what if ice Aphrodite and God of War 3 had a whole arc and wasn't just a mini game where two women watched you have sex with her right right uh, hey everybody! I think I'm that's just a note we can. <laughs> we gotta find more. Gotta end on a different note. You're right. We oh, gotta leave okay. time, curve town in the rearview mirror, dude. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so somebody, uh, somebody, wrote it, uh, somebody on Twitch mentioned that we didn't talk about. Um, yeah, you can go back and see Anger Boda um, in the post game, which is yeah. nice. You oh, can go to Jotunheim. Yeah, that is really nice just to have a little discussion with her and uh, and Mimir. And I think um, there's that nice moment where she says, "God, was she's talking?" I think about. Atreus, oh, and like his artistic abilities. And she's like, he's a good kid. He just needs some more discipline. And then Kratos says, I like her. And he actually like laughs, which is such a, a really sweet good delivery of that too. Yeah. Yeah. It's so um, good. I think Anger Boda's theme is probably my favorite musical piece. Mm, okay. I, I think, I think that theme kicks like that's it's so nice every time it, every time it comes back the uh i don't even know what instrument's being played. It sounds like a piano, just like the ding, ding, ding. Like it's so nice. Yeah. Yeah. I think. There's in the Odin boss fight. There's this section that's really good, and I love, I love the boss or the music that plays. It's a very specific thing. The music that plays during the Ragnarok sequence when you're the bear for the extended period fighting as Atreus. Like that music's so good, and I don't know how to find it. I'm trying to find mm -hmm. just that one clip, but I can't find it in the official soundtrack. But yeah, I mean, we didn't probably focus enough about the music, but it's incredible. But yeah, hey, right. you can tune in to the next episode of the Min Max Show podcast, our main podcast, where we're going to have uh, music expert Emily Reese on. We're going to be talking about the best game music of 2022, and I for sure am going to be bringing up certain clips from God of War Ragnarok, so you can expect more music discussion there if for some reason you want to hear us talk more about god of war ragnarok but all right i think that's it everybody uh deep deep thank you to everybody who played along with us um thank you for uh making this the best most thorough discussion about god of war ragnarok on the internet i i truly believe this is the best way to experience a game is to have hundreds and hundreds of people all sending in comments and we all share our collective thoughts surreal you smirk do you not feel like it enhances your enjoyment I, of a game it, there it, it, it is a lot to block out five hours to talk about a single game, <laughs> but it, it is it, it is cathartic to have all of this on the table. Yeah. And I, yeah, I think it's fun to go back. Like, I love looking at these things in the rearview mirror, too. I love that, you know, when we did the deepest dive on Last of Us Part 2, that some of the best stuff in that game was like when you're halfway through it trying to speculate about where it could possibly go in the future. And I love like for this game that we have that middle chunk of us trying to speculate where it's going to go. And that's a, that's a fun thing to record for all history or until uh, YouTube implodes. So again, uh, thank you to everybody who has watched this, listened to this, shared this, especially online. Every time it pops up in a discord somewhere or people share it on Reddit is like, Hey, Min Max does these cool things called the deepest dives. We uh, exist because of that. So we deeply appreciate it. So thanks everybody for submitting great comments and playing along and unlocking the podcast version of this, all that great stuff. Jill, excellent work. Thank you. I apologize for shutting you down in the first episode saying, don't talk about mythology, you goon. And then I did it anyway, but every time no. I was like, uh, I'm just going to do it. It was perfect. About it. Yeah, it was yeah. perfect. Um, but the internet wants me to tell you that um, you can't change the amount of puzzle hints that you get in this game, no matter how much you say that you can. No, I, I absolutely listen for it this time. I'm like, oh, yeah, they're definitely doing it. I, I guess I like in the sec <laughs> in the middle section, I was just so good. I yep. just didn't. Was, I you were too so good. Fast. Classic mistake. I was so fast. You were you were telling them this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Indian Former is her site, everybody. There's a link below. Check it out. Uh, it's a great place if you're interested in indie games to get caught up on previews, what's coming up, uh, reviews, all that fun stuff. So hats off to you, Jill, for striking out on your own and doing that whole endeavor. Yeah. Uh, I've uh, got, got a lot of stuff going on. Just got back from Thanksgiving break, so I'm wading through everything and jumping in, so hopefully there's a lot of fun things for everybody to check out. That's awesome. Love it. Uh, Serial Vasquez, thank you for being here, sir. 
Thanks for having me. This was a lot of podcasting. It was a lot of fun. Hell yeah. It's nice to talk to you again. The community likes hearing your voice Thanks once more. Um, and links below for uh, your essays. Do you know what your next essay is going to be about? I know you just pumped that one out about immortality. Uh, I, I have a couple. I think I'm going to take uh, the rest of the year off in terms of hobby stuff. But I'll be back next year with a couple. I have a couple ideas still kind of percolating. But yeah, you can, you can watch my latest essay on immortality, which again, I recommend you play the game first. But um, yeah, and if you want to support me on Patreon, I have one as well. So there we go. Sweet, awesome, Kyle Bossman. I want to say I I agree with you. I think I huh. week to week look forward to this discussion, and I think it made me enjoy the game more as I was playing it too. Yeah. Oh, thank you. It made you. everything more special. I truly appreciate this. This uh, was fun. Yeah. Sincerely, um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of yours. I know you're not supposed to say that when you're on a podcast with somebody, um, mm. but I really love delayed input, uh, all your time, easy allies, um, all that fun stuff. Um, so. I got a real geeky thrill out of you not only doing this, but apparently being excited to do it. That is the thrill of my lifetime to have you be excited to come talk to us about games for an extended period. So thank you, sir. Yeah. And I think honestly, like I think the audience integration thing, like this is like future stuff. This is good, good stuff. This is really fun. It's thank very you. special is what I would say. Oh, that's very sweet. Uh, again, thanks everybody for playing along, submitting comments. We couldn't do it without you. All that support over there on Patreon is deeply appreciated. And Hey, I don't know where, what our next deepest dive is going to be. I think I want to do Resident Evil 4 Remake, but we got some time before that. So in the new year, we'll start thinking. You send us some feedback. Let us know what you want us to cover, and we'll be here listening politely, waiting for the next game to really sink our teeth into. All right, everybody. Officially, that was the deepest dive on God of War Ragnarok. Thank you so much, folks. See you next time. Goodbye! You've seen the headlines, you know that the media landscape is consolidating. Having truly independent games media is more important than ever. MinMax can exist independently as a place about games, friends are getting better, but we need your help. The good news is that it's easy. Just click on that subscribe button or unlock a mountain of benefits by going to patreon.com slash minmax with two N's. Thanks so much, everybody.